Part 3. Breaking Chains. Chapter 21. As someone who traveled from one side of the galaxy to another and been to so many different star systems she'd long lost count, Tamara Skarada could say with some authority that in Imperial space everything, even the supposedly rough and tumble trading outposts, on the edge of the territory, was comparatively buttoned down. Fida was one of those planets that had a reputation amongst Imperials as a place for scum and villains, but for Tamara it felt safer than most places she'd been to. There was still a visible police presence, and the city centers were kept clean and safe. It was only in the poorer neighborhoods, where the building went to shambles and the police disappeared, that one might feel unsafe, though even here Tamar wasn't worried. It could have easily been different. Women were generally considered easier marks for thieves, kidnappers, and worse, and though Tamar was a little taller than most and knew how to carry a tough air someone still might have tried something. Once she donned her black and blue Biscargon armor, everyone in the street kept a respectful and wary distance. For Tamara, it felt good to back inside her shell. It wasn't the kind of outfit you brought out of the closet on Bastion, but it was exactly appropriate for the meeting she'd been called to. It had been six months since she'd last gotten a message from her cousin Dorn, and over a year since she'd met any of her family face to face. That Mandalor Jevern Alchus had branded her a traitor and set her to be handed over to the Sith was no secret among the Mandalorians. That she'd escaped, been rescued by a Jedi, and eventually had a kid with him was no secret either, and the thought never left her that, if she ever did something to anger Arches again, he knew exactly where to find her daughter. Every man no knew that attacking someone was an attack on their whole family, Arches wasn't stupid, and there was no visible reason he'd want to bring all of Clan Skarada against him, but that possibility was always there, and it always left her a little on edge. That was just one of the reasons she'd kept a low profile since leaving Arlen all those years ago. As long as she didn't try to move back to Mandalore and kept only sporadic, secret communication with her clan, there was no cause for Alchus to act against any of them. The Mandalores really knew the Skaradas kept some contact with her, but as long as it didn't get in his way, he'd be content to ignore it. Polite fictions, as Dorn had once told her, were the backbone of all politics. She wondered if he'd have any more bits of jaded wisdom to dispense as she walked through the market she'd been told to find him at. Unlike most Imperial worlds, Fida had a human minority population. The stalls and customers around her contained dozens of different species, and the only thing they had in common was that they gave an armored Mandalorian wary looks and a wide berth. As she scanned the row, she found someone who didn't flinch from the mirror black surface of her helmet's visor a hulking herglick whose broad gray-skinned body took up the entire span of the fruit stall in man. Tamar wound her way through the crowd to the shell. The herglick she'd never been able to tell genders for that species held out a round orange fruit and said, Something for the road, miss. She picked it up with her gloved hands. Is it sour? Oh no. Very sweet. Got anything sour? As she'd been told to expect, and scooped up a few of some red fruit with a webbed hand. Only for the brave, miss. You're welcome to try one. You'll understand if I don't take you up on that, she said through her helmet. Do you know any place where somebody like me could find some privacy? A toothy smile spread on his face. I do, actually. Do you see that alley behind me? There's a very nice, very private establishment. Second door on the right. Good to know? She took out a few credit chips and dropped them into his fruit pile. Might be back for the fruit later. She did as the herglick had instructed, shouldering her way past a beggar and slipping down an alley so narrow she could barely fit her armored shoulder pads through. She found the appropriate door, knocked, and waited. When it slid open, she was staring at the face of a Rodian. Finally, he said, and waved her toward a second door. They've been waiting on you for a while. Tamar went through the next door, into a small square chamber, with a low table in the middle and a colored glass roof that led in dimmed rainbow light from the cloudy sky. Seated at the table, cross-legged on the floor, were two figures in Mandalorian armor with their helmets removed. Her cousin Dorn had a face like hers, a sharp nose, narrow mouth, and black hair, though his was going in early gray. 
He sometimes said the color change was thanks to the Kaminoan clone genes from three generations back. But more likely, she thought, it was because of the teenage girl seated across from him. Doran's daughter Nanette was six months older than Moran, edged into her 15 year. She looked older and, to Tamar's view, acted older too. That was to be expected. Children grew up fast among the Jedi but, they grew even faster among Mandalorians. And at 14 she was considered a newly minted adult. Nanette about the same size as the cousin she'd never met and had the same black hair and dark eyes. The same still soft roundness in the face that said she wasn't quite a grown up, even if she was good at acting like one. How long did I really keep you waiting? Tamar asked as she removed her helmet. A while, Dorn said, but that's okay. Have some tea? As he poured a still steaming cup for her, Tamar sat down at the table with her helmet beside her. Tell me, is that fruit out there any good? Not really. Doran passed her the cup. But he knows when to keep secrets and when not to. Been to fight her before then. Enough to make a few friends, said Doran. He picked up his small white cup, as did Nanette, and the three drank together. Not that I'm not glad to see you, Tamar said but I'm wondering why you called me here. I ended up having to skip out from Bastion at a very inconvenient time. Sounds like the imps finally have their invader problem under control, Dorn said. Isn't that a good thing? It is. I was talking about the riots on Bastion that happened hours after I left. Family caught up in it. Yes, Tamar grunted. Nothing too serious, though. Which was true enough, Vitar had been the one to break his arm while Marin had gotten only minor scrapes. The psychological spook of being caught in a murderous riot and stampede was something else. The Jedi kept their kids locked up in the academy meditating and mock dueling so they had little appreciation for how mad and savage their fellow sentients could get. She only hoped Marin learned something from all this. Well, what we're here about is actually kind of the first thing, Dorn said. The Raider thing. Maybe. She frowned and set down the cup. You're not usually cryptic. What's going on? We don't exactly know, said Nanette. We do know that Jevern Alchus and his most trusted lieutenants went totally missing in action for about two weeks. A couple still haven't come back. Alchus rounding up his top people for a special mission wasn't rare. That he'd try to keep the thing a secret wasn't either, nor was the fact that someone would talk and let secrets slip, Mandas were boastful hard-drinking mercenaries, not intel agents. What else do you know? Tamar asked. Just scraps, said Dorn. Rumors, really, but they do point to something interesting. One, I heard from sources I'll keep unnamed that this mission took him into the unknown regions. Two, Ox and most of his lieutenants came back to Mandalore just a day ago, after I called you. If you look at the timing and travel distance, they would have done this hypothetical job in uncharted space about four days ago. The same as the Bastion riots, she said. Are you saying it's not a coincidence? That part, probably. What have you heard about the Chiss getting involved? Only that they were? Which isn't typical Chiss behavior. Not unless the raiders attacked them first. From what I've heard, those aliens, whatever their goal was, fought like next with rabies. It's a wonder none of them attacked Chiss space before this. I'm throwing that out there, to think about. You think Hawks attacked the Chiss? I don't think anything. What I've heard is that we lost a couple dozen Mandas out there, whoever we were fighting. Hmm. <clears throat> Sounds like they were strong enemies then. Right? But the real kicker, the reason I called you four days back, is this. Dorn hunched forward and got a little grin on his face. I know a guy who says he saw Galaset making a rendezvous just a day before Alchis and Galaset and the rest of his inner circle went missing. That was intriguing if true. The alien hunter was one of those trusted lieutenants that had been close to Alchis since his ascension to Mandalor 20 years ago. Are you sure your friend didn't mistake another Kerestian? He wouldn't make a mistake. And the real kicker is where he saw Galaset in this human meat. Tamar rolled her eyes. If you're going to play games all day. Broken moon, Dorn said, grinning wide. Tamar sighed. She looked down at her drink and sighed again. Her first trip to that smuggler's nest had been 17 years ago. She hadn't expected the way it would change her life, 
and even now she kind of didn't believe it, even though she had a daughter as irreversible proof. So what are you suggesting? That I go there and ask Sheriff if she did any eavesdropping on their conversation. It is something she'd do. And for you she might even do a favor. Not me. The first time I met her I punched her in the face. Is Arlen she's? Grateful toward. Well, Dorn shrugged. Maybe she should be your next stop. Having closed dealings with Sheriff, the Twilix slave turned crime boss, was something Tamar generally tried to avoid. She also tried to avoid doing too much with Arlen, for totally different reasons. Unfortunately, this was potentially too big to walk away from. If there was a chance she could uncover another truth about whatever was going on in the unknown region, she felt compelled to look into it, for Marin's safety if nothing else. And frankly, if she could use whatever she learned as a weapon against Jevern Arches, that would make things worthwhile too. I'll swing by Bastion and see what I can do, she said. What about you two? Nanette said, we were thinking of swinging by Broken Moon ourselves. Really? Broken Moon was on the opposite side of the Outer Rim from Fida. It wasn't a place you just swung by. If you or any other relations go in that direction, said Dorn, we'll be there to back you up. So you'll hang around here in the meantime. Fida has its charms. You just have to look really hard. I'll keep that in mind for the next time I come here. But it sounds like I'd better get back to Bastion. Yes, sure does. She swallowed the last of her tea still hot and got to her feet. Before she put her helmet on, she said, Thanks for the tip. I'll see you both around. Retursi, MHI, Nervod, Dorn said. It had been a long time since she'd had Mando thrown at her regularly. She fumbled for a second before saying, Retursi, MHI, Dornica, Nenica. Then she put on her buick, and for a second it felt like old times before she first gone to Broken Moon and met the damned Jedi who changed her life. But only for a second. After a thorough review of the damages sustained at Sevic 358, the chief operations director of the Bilbringi shipyards gave Davik a six-week estimate until all the ships of the 4th Fleet were fully repaired. Six weeks was a long time. Six weeks ago his father had still been alive, and the alien raiders merely a severe, irritant instead of an existential threat to the Empire. Vice Admiral Jaeger was a void walker, once the chief helm officer on Davak's frigate, and he trusted the man's estimate implicitly, but he knew it would take even longer for the fourth to be what it once was. Too many ships had been outright destroyed in these battles and far, far too many lives have been lost. Making things worse was the fact that his official duties prevented even a short trip to Bastion. His older son had been injured in the Ravelin riots. He'd heal fine, but not being near Vitor at a time like this made him feel like he was being forced to surrender his duties as a father. Arlen and his mother were on Bastion now, and they made sure he was being taken care of, but that didn't matter. Davik knew that a father should be there for his children, just as Jagged Fell had been there for him. He was at least able to place calls to Bastion and speak with his family at the Jedi Academy. Vitor looked hale except for the sling around his arm, and Davek enjoyed those talks a lot more than the other ones he was having with the capital. Neither Derek nor Avarice had come out to Bilbringa yet to see the battle damage and repair process themselves. They were both sticking at Bastion and getting ready to welcome the newest symbol of Imperial Resurgence, the Super Star Destroyer Invincible Fresh from Kuwait, Drive Yard's main facilities. That the thing was set to arrive exactly one week after the Battle of Sevec 358 felt like some kind of bitter universal irony. As much as he hated the very existence of that overexpensive military vanity project, pushed by nominally civilian moths like Veers and Thane more than anyone, he hoped his regal and veiling would act as a deterrent if any of those raiders decided to launch another attack, Imperial Territory. According to the vessels from the Third Fleet patrolling the border sectors there hadn't been a sign of them which was something to be thankful for. He tried to keep that in mind as he finished giving the head of state the latest update on the repair process. Neela Avers's blue holo image hovered in front of him the whole time, nodding and asking occasional questions, and when he wrapped up his talk, he had a feeling that would be the end of it. Then Avers took it in a direction he hadn't expected and frankly didn't want it to go in. She said, 
with the familiar warmth the politician could turn on and off at will. Thank you, Admiral Fell. I'm glad to see the repair process is going as scheduled. By the way, I just wanted to ask if your son is recovering well. He knew she meant it as a polite inquiry, a show of personal concern with the trusted subordinate. Instead, it triggered a low anger that had been with him since the riots, buried beneath all his other problems but still there. Vider's doing much better now, thank you. That's good to hear. Like a politician, she briskly moved on. One last thing. Since you've been in contact with your family, I was also wondering if you'd made any progress in learning how the Jedi search teams located Sevic 358. I've asked, but I'm afraid I haven't gotten an answer. Davik was no politician, but he'd learned how to lie. Doing it over blurry hollow transmission made it all the easier. The Jedi who found it were not our Jedi. They set out from Asis. As you can image, they want to protect their intel sources as much as we did. Of course, Aver said, if you don't mind making some more discreet inquiries, I'd very much appreciate it. I know the Supreme Commander would as well. We're all very concerned about operational security and the validity of our intel sources. She clearly didn't believe him. Davak hated having to lie for his brother. A part of him hated Arlen for putting him in this position in the first place, but there was simply no other option that wouldn't disgrace him, his family, and the Jedi Order on Bastion all at once. He hated being pushed too. He knew Avarice would keep going on this and suddenly decided to push back. I promise I'll do everything I can. I'd hate for there to be any confusion. I don't want the government to allow goodwill toward the Jedi to be tarnished. Her brows drew together. I'm sorry. Admiral Fell, I'm not sure what you're talking about. My administration has been nothing but supportive of the Jedi. You've supported my efforts to incorporate them into the military. I'm thankful for that, believe me. Then what are you talking about? Admiral. She wasn't going to let it go either, at least he'd gotten her off the topic of the intel leak. May I speak plainly? Please, she said coolly. In the midst of everything else, I've been following the aftermath of the latest Bastion riots. As you can understand, I've a personal interest. I know the legal system will take time to process accused defenders, but the way your office has been handling the issue is, frankly, unsatisfactory. Go on. An order, not a request. Those riots started because some hardline old-style Imperials wanted to use Grand Moff Kane's birthday as an excuse to hold a rally. Citizens have a right to free assembly, Admiral. And they should. But they and others came to that assembly spoiling for a fight. They got it and people were killed. Are you suggesting I lay down draconian security measures in the capital? I'm saying we can't have extremists throwing bombs in the streets. I'm the organizations that took part in those riots should be investigated, their members should be placed under surveillance, and their leaders arrested. To keep the peace, she said sourly. Yes. Exactly. Especially the hardline O-style high human culture types who've been working very hard to alienate the non-humans who are just as much citizens of the Empire as they are. When it all came out he couldn't believe he'd spoken so brazenly. Aver seemed to glare at him across light years. I am not blind to the threat of extremism, and I do not sympathize with high human culture types. I am trying to preserve the peace and preserve the system of government we have now, open, plural, and democratic. One that can accommodate all our citizens. In doing so, she was coddling the exact type she should have been opposing and giving free reign to men like Corinne Veers, but Davek knew he shouldn't say anything except. I understand. You should, because that's the kind of government your father lived and died to protect. I'm trying to protect Jagged Fell's legacy. So am I believe that. I do. Her expression softened just a little. Is there anything else that you wish to speak of, Admiral Fell? No, head of state. Good. I'll speak with you later, Admiral. Tomorrow I will be busy at this time, so please prepare your report for Supreme Commander Derrickin. Good day. The holo winked out. Davik stood in front of the lightless holo projector and stared at it. Finally, he lifted a hand and smacked himself in the face. Oh, that was so stupid, he said as pain stung his cheek. The piled up stress and anger and grief was finally getting to him. Worst of all, 
she'd been right. Ever's weaknesses as a leader, her equivocation, her tolerance for sympathy toward extremists, her subtly pandering to men like Moff Veers were less the result of flaws in her character as they were inevitable byproducts of the democracy his father had helped create. In peacetime, a government could get by on those qualities. In time of crisis, when extremes naturally rose to become threats, something stronger was needed to keep order. It was a dangerous thought. He was his father's son, and he knew where turning from democracy could lead. But when he looked at it hard, what he just considered wasn't wrong. It was an honest appraisal of a bad situation. All the more reason to hope this crisis was over, that the empire without an emperor could go back to muddling along in an ambivalent and democratic fashion. For a few weeks they'd come close to the edge. Now it seemed like they were stepping away. He only hoped nothing came along to give them another push. In the end, only a half dozen Jedi Knights stayed with Miragia at Bilbringi. The rest retreated to Bastion along with Arlen. That had included injured knights, knights who had family at the academy they wanted to get back, and knights who were simply sick of fighting and needed a break. The part of Miragia that was still a soldier couldn't help but look down on that last group a little. That same part respected the ones who stayed all the more. There was work enough to do on Bilbringi. In addition to overseeing repairs on their TIE fighters, Maragia and the other Jedi helped Davex tactical staff analyze recordings of the battle at Sevec 358 and compile thorough action reports for fleet command. There was also enough spare time for them to be Jedi, to practice, meditate, and enjoy small pleasures. Meditation had always come hard for Miragia. She spent her whole life wanting to do things that doing nothing, intentionally, was hard. Her mother-in-law had confided similar difficulties, which made her feel a little better. After a long day reviewing post-battle analyses, she retreated to the temporary cabin she and Davek had been assigned while the Makati underwent heavy repairs. Davek was out working still and she settled herself on the floor, cross-legged, eyes closed, and tried to push back all the stress, the list of duties to perform, haunting stories of Abeleth, all her personal concerns for Davek's peace of mind, for her son's safety, for Arlen to get his act in together and realize he should be helping his brother, not fighting him. Empty in her mind was hard, too hard, and she was starting to get frustrated when her comlink started to buzz. Eager for the escape, she scooped it up. There was an incoming hail. She got off the floor and stalked to the cabin's communications note. With the tap of a button, she summoned a familiar but unexpected face. Is this a bad time? Korashval asked. Your timing is good, actually. What's going on? I wasn't expecting to hear from you. Well, I thought I'd offer congratulations first. The news nets aren't exactly clear what happened in the big fight, but they are saying the Jedi came out well. You in particular? I did my part, but the real heroes are Arlen and Alana Joe. They did the hard part. The former chief of state. Vol's brows raised. She's back to being a Jedi now. Whom Vol said, like he was still trying to wrap his mind around it. She noticed that he, along with most Imperial citizens, had a mental barricade in his head separating the Jedi Knights from Bastion with the other Jedi like Alana or Lobaka, the ones based on Asus or Bestin or Ilum. That always frustrated Arlen, who viewed the Jedi Order as a big sprawling entity that superseded mundane political loyalties, but to Maragia it had never seemed so difficult. She saw no inherent clash between serving the light side of the Force and serving the Empire, not the Empire as it was now anyway. Are you at Bastion now? She asked Vol. That's right. Calling from Sentinel actually. Have you been down to the planet? To Ravlin? What's the mood like? You want a summary of public opinion? She nodded, he sighed. It's complicated. When news came down we won the battle everyone was ecstatic civilians, soldiers everyone. And they're still relieved, if uncertain, because people aren't sure exactly what was the deal with the raiders. He paused, like he was hoping she'd elaborate. She wasn't sure she understood Abelith herself, and doubted she could explain it to a man who she gathered had never much believed in the Force and still wouldn't if his friend and fellow Voidwalker hadn't turned Jedi. Thankfully, she had an easy out. It's all still classified by Fleet Command, sorry. Well, 
I guess I'll keep on being confused, Vol said, half humor, half exasperation. Anyway, the good news for you is that people are giving the Jedi credit for the victory, even if they're not sure exactly what you did. But over the past few days people have been getting unsettled again. Why? Because nobody knows if it's really over. Do you? Grimly, she shook her head. I thought so. And so everyone's starting to get edgy again, even if they're not quite as edgy as before. People can feel as edgy as they want. I just don't want to see any more riots in the streets. No one does. But everyone wants to get their points across too. Not every point deserves to get across, she muttered. It was something Davik had griped recently. Perhaps, Vol said, then brightened his tone. That should chance soon, though. It took her a second to remember. Invincible. That should give people confidence. I'm sure it will. Avarice and Derek can plan to give it a very formal, very publicized commissioning ceremony when it arrives at Bastion. She recalled her father-in-law's funeral and admitted Avarice could do good theater. Does the first have everything planned yet? Personnel assignments, material distribution. It took some last-minute shuffles, but it's all been decided. Vol smiled. You're looking at Invincible's new commander of the air group. You. He laughed. Don't sound so horrified. I'm not. Of course not. Congratulations. That's a huge honor. Thank you. I'm a little surprised myself. Admiral Hallis must have taken a shine to you. I like to think so, but he plays his sepic cards closed. Still, there's a lot of prep work to do. When the commissioning happens, we'll still only have a third of the ship's tie wing stocked, mostly pulled from other ships. We're still waiting on a shipment of factory fresh units from Cena to fill out the hangar. I'm sure Invincible will have the best fighter corps in the Empire when you're done with it. Congratulations. I'm happy for you. Happy for everyone you're protecting. All right, that's enough flattery. I just wanted to check in and brag a little. But there's still plenty of work to do, like I said. Good luck with that, Korosh. Thank you. I'd say the same, but I think Jedi have a different way of putting it. Slightly, but the gist is the same. All right, then good luck. Next time you wing over to Bastion, I'll probably be busy, but drop me a line anyway. I just might have some time. She promised to do that, killed the holo, and looked around the cabin. Vol's news had made her feel better. Knowing a friend would be there over Bastion, protecting the planet, protecting her sons, granted her an intercom she hadn't felt since Davik's father died. She even found herself with a new appreciation for the oversized, ultra-expensive war machine the Kudas would be delivering in a few days. With a new warmth inside, she sat down on the floor where she failed at meditation and decided to try again. Whenever Marin saw both her parents together, she was reminded why they spent all their time apart. No matter how often she'd insisted that what had happened during the Ravelin riots was no one's fault and that she was completely fine, she knew that her father was looking at Tamar with barely restrained blame for being off-planet when it all went down. Tamar was doing her best to ignore it. she just finished explaining what she'd learned on her trip to Fida. Marin didn't understand all of it. She only vaguely knew of Broken Moon as some kind of crime den mentioned by both her parents on rare occasions, and she didn't know who this sheriff of person was, or this Galicet. She did know Jevern Alches was the Mandalore who tried to have her mother killed, and she'd heard about Dorne and Nanette and always wondered what her other cousins would be like in person. When Tamar said they'd be heading to Broken Moon to it piqued her interest further. It certainly sounds like it's worth investigating, Marin's grandmother said. They were gathered in Jaina's apartment, Arlen, Tamar, Marin, Vitor with his arm in a sling, the old master herself. Only Roan was absent. It's vague, but intriguing, Arlen said reluctantly. Broken Moon is on the other side of the galaxy, and I'm not sure we can stand to be away so long. Do you really think Sheriff can tell us anything? She'll tell you. Tamar said with an eye roll that made Arlen's upper lip twitch. Things seem like they're settling down, finally, Jaina said. They'll be bringing in that brand new superstar destroyer in a few days. If that doesn't keep Bastion safe, nothing will. Well, hopefully the raiders are broken for good, 
Arlen said grimly. We lost enough taking the Belleth out. What's the word from Isis? Asked Vitor. Like Marin, he'd been filled in on the strange and frightening truth behind the raiders' attacks. Are the Jedi sending out another search party? They'll do everything they can to find a Belleth, Jaina said. And Jodrum Tainer. But that's nothing for you to be concerned about, young man. You need to rest and heal that arm of yours. The doctors say I'll be good to get this thing off in a couple days. He wrapped a fist against the metal cast. That's good to know, but your grandmother's still right. You're staying put, Arlen said, and looked to Tamar. And you're right too? This does need looking into. And I guess I'm the one who has to do it. Then it looks like I'm going with you. Marin's mother crossed her arms over her chest. I'll pass word to Dorn and Nanette. They'll meet us there. Okay. Her father exhaled deeply, like he was calculating the length of the trip. We'll take Starlight Champion for a whirl. It hasn't gotten enough use lately. And leave my ship on Bastion. You know it's perfectly safe in the Jedi Academy. If we need to split up for any reason you will have your cousin's ship. How reassuring. What? There's nothing wrong with Champ. Or my flying skills? That's not what I was worried about. Good. We'll take Champ then. Okay. We will. That seemed to settle things. So Marin finally let out the words she'd been holding in for five minutes. I want to come too. Despite being out of sync so often, her parents managed to say absolutely not. At exactly the same time, she looked back and forth between them. A Jedi is supposed to do something, isn't she, Dad? And Mom, didn't you say that Mandalorians are considered adults at my age? They both opened their mouths, but she pressed on. I'm serious. After all that's happened, I can't just sit around in the academy doing nothing and being safe. Why do you think we sneaked out to Ravelin? She's right, Vitor said. We're not kids. We can't be after what happened to Grandpa. We can't just sit around either. Tamar met her daughter's eyes and Marin felt a jolt of understanding between them. Arlen, strangely embarrassed, looked at his mother. Something passed between them too, and Arlen said, Another mission? Maybe, but not this. Why? I'll have both of you to teach me, and look out for me if there's trouble. When else is that going to happen? Tamar nodded slightly. Arlen sighed. Jaina said, She has a point. Frankly, it might be best for all three of you. I know, I know. Arlen shook his head. You're right, Mom. And Marin. I know you are. It's just... What? Pressed Marin. Neither of you have met Sheriff before. Tamar actually laughed. You nearly got killed fighting a timeless force abomination, and you're scared of one little twilight Dalika. Not scared for me? I'm just, you know... Tamar looked at her daughter. Your father's afraid you'll never see him in the same light again? Marin had absolutely no idea what they were talking about. You're saying I can go, right? I think you will, Jaina said. And as always, the old woman had the final word on the subject. Then she told Vitor, You, young man, are going to stay here with Rome and me and finish your recuperation. Next time there's a chance to go gallivanting around the galaxy, it'll be your turn but not yet. Understood. Like the rest of them, Vitor knew not to argue. Yes, absolutely. Very good. Jaina looked at her son and flashed a slim, triumphant smile. I'm glad that's all settled. Aren't you? You know, you're normally complaining you don't get to spend enough time with your kid, Chance reminded him. Arlen sighed and slumped back in the co-pilot seat. He'd been running checks in Starlight Champion's cockpit, felt restless, and decided to try hailing his friend on Karuskin. As luck would have it, Chance had been available. It's not Marin herself that's the problem. Her mom, then? No. Well, yes. But no. You're getting less comprehensible with age. It's where we're going for this mission. When he didn't go on, Chance raised a brow. Are you trying to make me guess? Why not? It'll be a trip down memory lane for me and Tamar. If you want to come, we'd have the whole set. His eyes widened. Ah, Sheriffeth. Broken Moon. Exactly. You're wrong, though. 
How? If we get the whole set together, we need that Sith too? Arlen grunted. Chance didn't know it, but according to a Jedi who survived Sevic 358, they'd encountered a bearable Sith that sounded strikingly similar to the one who tried to kill him at Broken Moon all those years ago, and who Arlen thought they later killed at the cost of his apprentice Warren's life. The three of us, Arlen said, is enough. Did you ever tell Marin exactly how her mom and dad met? No. I'm pretty sure Tamar hasn't either. Well, you're going to have to explain it on the way, unless you want Sheravit to do it for you. He sighed again. Thankfully it's a long ride out there, so we'll have time. Good to hear? Speaking of reunion and coincidence, I'll be swinging out to Kuwait in a few days. Is Vogma coming with? He is, actually. We're trying to negotiate a contract as a distributor for KDY. And you just happen to be old buddies with the chairman of the board. Like I said, coincidence. Still, we'll be putting on a good pitch for him and his pals. It'll all be totally above board. Glad to hear it. Wine and dine afterward. Naturally. I haven't actually seen Rator face to face in three years. Well, he's on Kua full time since he took over the board. Exactly. You're a responsible family man, Chance. No more late nights and endless parties. I'm aware, but the same goes for you too. Trust me, I won't go all wild at Broken Moon. You sure? I've heard Sheriff knows how to throw a party. Yeah, but they're not my type. And I'm too old. A couple weeks ago I went to this club in Ravlin, and I, never mind, it was weird. Take care of Marin, Chan said pointedly. I will. We're not doing this lightly. At least things in Imperial space are settled down now. Right? Or can you tell me? I-H-O-T-H-O-E-S. Arlen spread his hands. All I know, all I can tell. Fair enough. Chance tilted his head to hear something. Family calls. Take care of yourself at Broken Moon. Take care of yourself and Kuit. Yeah, that'll be hard. Talk to you later. Later, Arlen said, and shut the holo off. That little twinge of melancholy came back. He heaved one more sigh and went back to work. Chapter 22 Despite his chirping voice and diminutive frame, Kier Ash was able to convey a sense of authority even when reduced to a quarter-size holographic transmission. It was, Alana thought, one of the reasons he made an effective chief of state. I will pass your report directly to the Defense Committee and the Supreme Commander, he told Alana as she sat in her chamber in the Jedi Temple on Asus. It was a visitor's room, designated as hers for as long as it took to recover from the injuries she'd sustained fighting a Belith. She told Kier Esh about a Belith and everything else related to her mission in the Unknown Regions. On her last appearance fifty years ago, the nearer mortal being had nearly brought down the Alliance. Mere mention of her name had caused Esh's tone to deepen in dread. Tell me, Demosi said. What will you do now, Alana? I'm set to recuperate. She smiled weakly and held up her broken arm, now stiffly bent in his cast. Bacta had healed the effects of her brief vacuum exposure, but bones would take longer to heal. And the Jedi. We'll be sending more search teams to try and find Abella. You're certain she's still alive? See. We can gather she had at least two Erath bodies, one male, one female. We only destroyed the first one. Do you think she'll be able to muster another invasion fleet? I can't say. Losing a body injures a Belleth, and we killed two. After that she couldn't control the raiders at Sevic 358. My guess is that she might be able to muster more but she'll need to heal first. Then the time to strike is soon. Can I make a bold proposition, Kier? See, I'd be disappointed if you didn't. She smiled softly. My proposition is this. Send some armed ships to Karnareth. The Jedi will provide you with the location. You said the Erath homeworld is a wasteland. Exactly. They've been struck hard by a plague. I promised them I'd help. If the Alliance sends its best medical personnel to research a cure. Esh raised a down-covered hand. I understand. A mercy mission with armed backup, just in case. Exactly. 
I believe I would be able to send a small relief force using my executive authority. I knew I could count on you. Tell whoever you send to expect Jedi. We'll be sending people there too. Your first step is searching for a Beleth. Pretty much. I understand. I'll instruct our team to give the Jedi any help they ask for. Great. Alana glanced at the chrono on her bedstand. I'm sorry to cut this short, but I have another meeting to go to. Busy even when recovering, see. You Jedi are durable beings. She couldn't feel warm at the compliment. The memory of the battle at 7358 and the brutal deaths of over a dozen knights was all too fresh. She did her best to smile anyway. Thanks, Care. I'll speak with you again. She shut off the transmitter and rose from her chair. Her whole body ached as she moved. As she threw on her brown Jedi robe, she watched her stiff movements in the mirror, washed her face. It looked heavy and lined, and sunlight through the window caught the gray in her hair. The last time she'd been badly injured was when that Vong Shaper had stabbed her at the climax of the Synex Juvex crisis. Recovery from that poison blade had taken a while, but eventually she'd felt healed, young. Recovery was slower now. She was in her fifties, and youth was a long time gone. There was a knock on the door. She shuffled over and opened it to see Tiny Zell and Jay Skywalker right behind her. Jade had arrived from Fingerin just a few hours ago. Alana immediately spotted the impatience in her eyes and her grim determination in the Force. Without smiling, Jay said, It's good to see you're all right. I've been better, but thanks. Tiny stepped aside so Alana could wrap the younger woman in a tight hug. Jade was no longer the restless teenager she'd helped train in the Force. She was a woman with a husband and two sons, losses and accomplishments in her name. Despite that a part of Alana would always think of her as the girl she'd been, vulnerable, hesitant, needy for guidance. They left Alana's room and began walking through the temple's halls. Jade said, The others are waiting for us. I've talked with Lobaka and Master Savitu already. And Jedi Kemmer. Then you know everything we know about Jadra. Pretty much. I know he's still alive. I'd feel otherwise. But as to what the Sith are doing to him. Try not to think about that, Lana said. Tanith, anything from Hapes. Nothing new? Queen Demia held a ceremony to honor her granddaughter. Our spies say she was very shaken up by it. We still don't know how Sarissa died, though. Nothing about the Sith? Jade asked. No. But there's never been before. We're not even certain the Sith are on hapes. Of course they are. After what they did, they're already. Tani nodded grimly. They both lost parents when the Sith assisted who expelled the Jedi from hapes. Elena said, The Sith might have Jodrum, but there's no guarantee they'd take him back to hapes or any other base. They took him aboard an Erath ship. That says to me they're trying to find Abloth's base of operations. The implication was that searching for Abeleth meant searching for Jodra. It also meant searching for Sith. Fifty the Jedi had fought both those enemies at once. Alana had been forced to take a life for the first time during that desperate struggle, when she was only seven years old. She'd watched another dear friend sacrifice his own. She wanted to tell Jay to have hope and trust the Jedi would rescue Jodra and defeat both those foes. But the younger woman wouldn't believe it either. The Jedi gathered in a meeting room on an upper level of the temple's pyramid. Even when she lived on Asus, Jade had come here only rarely. It was the chamber her father had used to convene with the Jedi Council and other masters. They sat down on the cushioned floor now. Jade next to Alana, Grandmaster Lobaka still emanating grief for the loss of his daughter, the old Bothan you kill Savitu, and the similarly gray-furred little Chandra Fan Tekli. A life-sized holo image projected the form of Tahiri Vila, currently on Zanima II, and another show Jade's Aunt Jaina on Bastion. The last night was one Jade was unfamiliar with, a blue-skinned female Duros. She sat cross-legged in front of a closed rectangular case about a third of a meter long. It seemed to be made of a very old, chipped wood with metal hinges and frame. Instead of explaining what the case was for, they began recounting experiences of facing a Beleth. Alana summarized her battle aboard the Erath flagship. Jaina spoke of the time she, Luke Skywalker, 
and Corin Horn had fought one of her bodies on Coruscant 50 years ago. Tahiri had the most interesting story, she'd fought a Belleth twice. Once when she'd possessed the fast decaying body of an Imperial officer, and again when her life force had seeped into the circuits of a computer core. I had a lot of help both times, Tahiri said, and Master Sebatine was the one who really took out the computer core. But the other time what really destroyed Abelith's body was the thermal detonator I used. A thermal detonator wasn't a mere grenade. It vaporized absolutely everything within its blast radius. What really saved me was that the body Abelith used was so weak it was already falling apart. The other bodies were different. Force users' bodies are more durable for her, Techly said. They can withstand Abelith's great raw power. So you're saying the more powerful the Force user, the longer the body will last, said Jade. That means the Erath she took over must have been very strong. I've noticed something else too after listening to your descriptions. Tahiri's blue hollow image looked to Janus. When you fought her Coruscant, wasn't she using a Sith's body? Yes, and no matter how much damage we did we couldn't take her down. Ben had to do that in the mall. If you'll remember, when Dorvin killed another of her bodies with a few close-range shots from a holdout blaster, Tahiri said. That one belonged to another non-Jedi. Then a stronger force user is also more difficult to kill, said Techly. It does make sense. From what we've heard it was very hard to kill. The Chandra fan trailed off awkwardly. Master Savitu said, Sathes was a very powerful Jedi. And Abelith touched him when he was a child just like she touched me, and a lot of other Jedi. Elena asked softly, can you describe a little of what that was like? The old Bothan hunched in on herself. It felt like, a dream, in retrospect. A nightmare. We suddenly became absolutely certain that the Jedi around us, our friends, and family were imposters. We knew deep as we'd known anything that what was around us was a delusion, and the only way to get to the truth was to get back to her. Lobaka gave a low, mournful growl. So she could take our bodies? Savitu admitted. We're lucky most of us were far away from her when she tried to take hold of us. A grim silence settled over the group. Elena said, to reel things back a moment, we agree the first body we faced was so hard to kill because it was Master Sars. The other body we fought was just as powerful. Isn't Abella supposed to be weaker after you kill one of her bodies? That's the way it seemed before, Jaina said. Lobaka growled that, given what happened to the raider fleet, Abelith has still been weakened significantly. I agree, said Tahiri. As for how hard that second body was to kill, my guess is that Abelith just possessed an extraordinarily powerful force user. Two, Lobaka reminded them. A king and a queen. Okay, Jay sighed. She knew this was an important discussion to have, but she was restless to go after Jodra. she barely slept since he'd gone missing. Every part of her was waiting for the pain of his death to tear at her through the Force. So we have an idea of how incredibly powerful Abelith is. When we do find her, what are we supposed to do? I remember what my grandfather said he did the last time. He left his body and went to the mall and entered some shadow realm where he fought Abloth's true form. With the help of a Sith, Jaina added grimly. Darth Crate. I don't want to sound pessimistic, but if the two most powerful Force users in our lifetimes couldn't kill Abelith for good, what are we going to do? Lobaka gave a low roar and extended a furry hand to the Duro who'd been sitting quietly this whole time. I think, said Tekli, we should let Master Ahali Sarak explain. Masters Lobaka and Tekli are the ones who made it possible. The Duro said. They helped Rainer Thul communicate with the Kilix and learn the story of how Abelith came to be. Wasn't she from a planet in the mall? Asked Jade. That was where she'd been in prison millennia ago. But she began as a mortal being who served three powerful Force entities called the Ones. Your great-grandfather encountered them during the Clone Wars? Jaina said. They were on a free-floating monolith called Mortis. There was a brother who exemplified the dark side and a sister who exemplified the light. And there was a father who kept balance between them. Abelith wanted to become the mother, Tekli continued. She became immortal like them but was locked away by the ancient celestials. 
When the ones encountered Anakin, the father tried to get him to be the new balance keeper. In the end, all three of the ones were killed, leaving Abelith alone. I remember now, Jay said. That's why she kidnapped my father. She wanted to use him to create the family she never had. She reached out to your grandfather too, Jaina added. Whenever she reaches out to you, it's like a cold tentacle of need, Savitu added darkly. She's desperate and lonely. That's the worst part. It's what fuels her power. Jane asked Sorak, what does all this mean? How does it help us get rid of her? According to the story about Anakin Skywalker, the ones were killed using a special force imbued dagger. After he defeated Abelith, your grandfather assigned ten knights to search the galaxy until they found Mortis and recovered the dagger. Sorak carefully pulled back the lid of the case in front of her. Jade leaned forward to see, as did the other Jedi. They might have known Sorak's story, but all of them bristled with anticipation to see what they'd never seen before. The dagger of Mortis was an old metal blade, two-sided and as long as Jay's forearm, with what looked to be a wood-wrought handle. It was such a simple thing, visible worn at the edges and primitive compared to lightsabers or vibra blades, but looking at it Jade felt a strange certainty that this was more than just an old weapon. The object had been imbued with some force power she could never understand. Where did you get this? She asked. It's a very long story, Sorak said. Almost 25 years, in fact. But we found it. We found Mortis and we retrieved the blade. The pride was obvious in Sorak's voice and force aura. The long search for this object and its eventual retrieval was more than just her greatest accomplishment. It had become her purpose as a Jedi. Jade looked at Lobaka. Do weck now, this will kill Abelith. The Wookiee moaned that her grandfather had believed. That wasn't certainty, but Jade knew it was as close as they'd get. So we take the dagger with us to Carnarath, Jay said. You all know I'm going. Who else? I think we can agree that it's dangerous for me to go, Savitu said. I would go, Alana said, but Lobaka insists I stay here and recuperate. Tahiri added sourly, he also insisted Jaina, and I aren't in the condition to brawl with the Belleth again. Lobaka trilled that none of them were as young as they used to be. Jaina scowled and said, Not all of us age with the grace of a Wookiee, sorry. That got a brief huffing chuckle from Lobaka. It warmed Jay to see the Grandmaster hadn't lost all his humor, even in grief. What came next surprised her. He roared loudly, announcing that he would go with them to Karnareth. Sorak added, I'll be going too to watch over the dagger and help in any other way I can. I'm glad, Jade said, and turned to Alana. I have a request, since you'll be here. Look after Cole and Nat, please. Of course, it would be my honor. And please, it was hard to think, hard to say. If something happens to me or Jodrum, or both of us, I don't know how it will affect the boys. She only knew how losing her mother had affected her. Alana knew it too and nodded gravely. I promise, they'll be my first priority. Trust Alana to take care of them, Jade. Then focus on Iorfer's priority, Jaina said. Do what can be done. Let the Force guide you, and don't get distracted by what's behind you or what could have been. Long ago she'd given advice like an old sage lecturing a child. Now she spoke as an adult to an adult. A woman waited with the fresh pain of her husband's loss, speaking to another who might face the same. Jade felt something well in her throat and swallowed it down. Thank you. And I know. When the time comes, I'll do whatever has to be done. She held her and stern holo replicated gaze. They didn't need proximity and the force to pass full meaning between them. For the rest of the Jedi on the team, the first priority was to find Abella and use the Mortis dagger to kill her. The second priority was to deal with whatever Sith they found hunting the same prey. For Jade, those were both secondary goals. Her greatest purpose was to rescue Jodrum and save her children from the agony of their father's death. No matter how ancient and powerful Abelith was, no matter the danger she represented, she'd never be more important to Jade than Jodrum, her husband, her best and oldest friend. He could remember how it had happened a long time ago. For the two of them, at least, it had been a lull in the middle of the Synex-Juvex crisis. 
they'd returned from their mission to Veridan with more mental scars than physical ones. Jade had gone off to Zanima Second with her father to figure out a way to defeat Darth Zorn and her superweapon, leaving Jadrum and Warren behind. Not having Jade around was hard. It had been during those weeks that Jodrum had finally forced himself to admit that he thought of her as more than a longtime friend and fellow apprentice. Her absence had been a constant ache, and he tried without success to put her out of his mind. Jodrum had been able to tell that Warren missed Jade as well, but it was a different kind of longing. For the young Chiss, she had been his best link to the larger Jedi order he'd so hoped to be a part of. Her mere presence had been a sign of comfort, of solidity, now that she was gone he was left to face all the questions and doubt he'd been able to hide away. Jodrum had understood that without Warren ever having to tell him. At first the Chiss boy had gotten on his nerves, because he was stiff and stuck up, because he refused to be impressed by Jodrum's Jedi skills, because he pressed himself too hard and took it out on others when he failed, because he too wanted to be close to Jade. Yet he was also racked by doubt, and the guilt he felt over Master Jalu's death of Veridan had bowed his spirits like lodestone. It was during those weeks on Asus that Jodrum came to another realization, that he considered Warren a friend. For all their differences, they were in the same boat. He remembered one time specifically, they'd been practicing sparring under the watchful eyes of Master Lobaka, and had allowed all their pent-up frustration to boil over. They battered each other nearly off the practice mat a dozen times over and worked themselves into a panting sweat before Lobaka raised a furry arm and called the match a draw. By then day had turned to evening. Jodrum and Warren had wandered away from the temple into the rocky barren hills. They tried very hard to meditate and touch the great cosmic flow of the forest beneath all those stars, as they'd used to do with Jade. After a long time of silence, a cool wind had passed between them and Warren had said, It will never happen again. I won't let it. What? Jodrum had asked. What happened to Master Mjallu? The way she died, because I failed. It was the first time he'd admitted the guilt he clearly felt aloud, at least to Jodrum. She died because she was fighting a Sith Lord. It's not your fault. I got captured. She died saving me. I can't forget that. It's not your fault, Jodrum had repeated, knowing it wouldn't do any good. Next time I'll be better. Stronger. When we face the Sith again I won't fail. As he said it he seemed so much older than his teenage years implied. Not in the stiff, mildly pompous, very chis manner he usually had. He sounded beaten, tired bit, but above all that, determined. And then the next time had come, and Warren had plunged into a black pit and died with the bearable Sith Lord who sheared off Jodrum's arm. That was what Jodrum had thought for many years. Then, suddenly, he'd found himself staring into a familiar blue face and red eyes and he'd realized he'd gotten it all wrong. After his first conversation with the one who called himself Darth Terret, Jodrum had another realization. He'd been right the first time. The Warren who'd been his friend was dead. There were still hints. That was the disconcerting part. The way he tilted his head sometimes, the downward inflection on his voice. The angry scowl that settled over his face as he leaned close to the Jedi captive he'd shackled arms and wrist to a bulkhead in the small storage room of the Erath shuttle they commandeered. You know the identity of the creature we were fighting in the mess hall, the Chiss said. He stood two meters apart from Jodra. Hands were clasped at the small of his stiff back. His eyes were narrowed in concentration, but Jodrum couldn't feel anyone prying into his mind with the Force. I have a guess, Jodrum said. And you why the Erath all abandoned ship at once. Another guess? The creature. Is it dead? He didn't know how far this half-familiar chis would push. He knew he didn't want to find out. Probably not, he said. Defeated. But not gone. Does it have a name? He felt it then, tendrils of thought touching his mind, feeling for the truth in his thoughts. Faint stabs of pain jutted into his mind, he winced and said, You don't need to kirk and do that. Do I? The chist tilted his head in curiosity, so worn like. Isabella, you've heard of her, right? He saw Darth Terra's eyes widen, his small force attacks immediately disappeared, like he'd actually been taken by surprise. 
You remember, don't you? Jodrum couldn't keep himself from asking. They told us about her at the Jedi Academy. Ben Skywalker fought her. So did Master Solo fell. You do remember? The narrow eyes came back, the scowl. It was the first either of them had intimated aloud what they both clearly understood. That was another life, Terry said, but I do remember. And now we are on this Erath shuttle. What are you hoping? They'll lead you back to her. Well, they're probably not going home. Jedi have already been to their planet. It's a plague-stricken wasteland. Abella did it. She ruined the whole planet when they wouldn't worship her. We will find Abella, and we will destroy her. Sounds like a plan. Think you can count me in. Is that a serious request? There was only one alternative and they both knew it. I'd rather die fighting her than die here. I'll keep that in mind. Darth Terra turned for the door. Hey, wait. Jodrum called. What are you going to do now? Go talk to your boss, your Sith boss. I thought your kind was supposed to be masters of your own fates. Terra glanced back without turning. You know nothing of the Sith? I know the Sith killed my first master and I had a friend who blamed himself over it, really bad, and swore he'd do everything he could to hurt the Sith after that. He was just a boy. He didn't understand. What didn't he understand? What could make him join sides with the people he hated more than anything? Terry kept staring like he was coming up with some answer for that question. Then he walked straight out the door without a word, leaving Jodrum to hang captive on the wall. It was disappointing, he genuinely wanted to know. All he could do now was guess, and ponder, and wait for when his former friend decided to kill him. It really might have been the will of the Force. When Darth Tarrant had pinned the captive Jedi to the deck of the ascending escape shuttle he looked into that familiar face narrowed by time but still with the same blue eyes, and bright hair it had felt like the most impossible of coincidences. But perhaps it was more. The Jedi were the ones who talked about the Force moving events of its own will. To the Sith, the individual's will was all that mattered. The Force was the thing from which they wrenched their power. But for him to encounter Jodrum Tainer here, in this way, after so many years, made him wonder if it was the Force's will that he meet Jade again too. The prospect frightened him. That was the only word for it. His return to his part of the galaxy, his encounters with other Chiss, Hadn't moved Darth Terran at all, but this was different. Jodrum Tainer threatened to bring back shades of Ranwaring Sapla he thought long murdered. Terran knew he should kill the Jedi right now, while he was defenseless. It would be the simplest, easiest thing. But not yet. There was still more to learn, and Jodrum had been surprisingly forthcoming so far. Abeleth. He remembered the stories from his Jedi apprentice days, he'd frankly thought them legends or at least exaggerations, no matter how much old Jaina Solo fell, had insisted otherwise. The Sith did not speak of that Force abomination often, but he knew Lord Crate had once battled it, and that it had used and mostly wiped out Darth Avank's lost tribe of the Sith. Avank had clearly been stunned and appalled to see it return. The Jedi seemed to know more. He'd have to pry that information out of Jodrum. It bought the Jedi a little more time alive. He had no desire to go back in the storage room with the Jedi for any reason. He marched down the shuttle short corridor to the cockpit, where Sarissa Lore was waiting. Three Erath remained in their seats, operating the pilot and consoles. When Tarrant had stormed the shuttle, killing all who tried to fight back and disarming those who didn't, he'd managed to corner a few crewmen who'd understood snippets of Chun. His instructions had been simple, keep flying to wherever you are going. Do not contact any of the other shuttles. They were too frightened to do anything else, especially with Sarissa constantly looking over their shoulders. The rest of the captive Erath were bound and locked in the main cargo hold. Those who died fighting had been expelled through an airlock. Once the living outlived their usefulness, the captives would join the dead. Sarissa's face was full of questions, but Tarrant asked his first, Have you found how to work their communications device? I think so. Are you ready to try calling intruder? Of course. The Erath pilots were watching with the edges of their multifaceted eyes, but Terrett didn't care. None of them understood basic. As he moved toward what Sarissa marked as the comm console, the young woman asked, 
Did you kill the Jedi? Not yet. He needs to be questioned further. Does he know what the thing we saw on the ship was? He does. I don't suppose we've seen the last of it. How do you know what? She crossed her arms over her chest. Otherwise we wouldn't be on this ship, chasing who knows what. I'll explain in a minute, or perhaps Darth Evank will be gracious enough to do it first. Did you input intruders com code? I entered what you told me to. Are we ready? We are, he said, and tapped the button. Whatever technology the Erath used was at least partially compatible with intruders. No holo image appeared in the cockpit, but Darth Avang's deep familiar voice said, Speak, Lord Terran. We've commandeered a ship. We're en route to our destination, wherever that is. Excellent. I don't suppose you've learned any more about the place. No, I did not. He should have mentioned the Jedi, but hesitated. He said instead, I need to know what to expect. What enemy we're facing. Avang's deep breath crackled over the comm. You've been told of a Beleth. I have. Then you already know the nature of the enemy. I don't, Sarissa interjected. What is this, a Beleth? I think you'd best explain, he told Avonk. A Beleth is a very ancient, very powerful entity. Her spirit can infest multiple bodies, and she craves power and praise above all things. She feeds on fear. I can only imagine that she was the heart of this raider group. When the Jedi killed her bodies aboard the flagship, the raider fleet broke apart. Sarissa scowled. Then why are we on this ship? Because this race, the Erath, lie at the heart of it, said Tarrant. The rest of the raiders might scatter back to where they came from, but if anyone can lead us back to Abelith, it's them. And why are we chasing Abelith if she's an ancient unkillable monstrosity? Sith do not run from threats, said Tarrant. We face them and defeat them? Are Sith also suicidal? You saw that monster on the flagship as well as I did. Avang's dry chuckle sounded on the comm. I have been in contact with Shidu Mod. More Sith are on the way to help track and kill Abelith. You, Darth Tarrant, are to follow where clues lead you, but you will not engage Abelith by yourself. Sarissa snorted. I should hope not. When you reach your destination, relay it to us on Intruder and we will join you, Avang continued. I understand, said Tarrant. There's one more thing, Darth Avank, Sarissa interjected. You should know, when we escaped the flagship we captured a Jedi on the way out. Tarrant felt a spike of anger toward her but restrained it. He should have told Avang that from the start. The Keshari asked, what have you done with it? I've begun interrogations, said Tarrant. The Jedi, too, are hunting a Belif. Is it still alive? I'll interrogate him further and learn all the Jedi know. Good. Break him fully, but do not kill him. You want me to keep him alive? Yes. That will not be difficult, will it? Of course not, said Tarrant, wondering the reasons. Perhaps Avank didn't trust him to learn the full truth or to tell everything. He hadn't wanted to kill the Jedi, but should have. This reprieve was no relief. Is that all? For now. Until later, Lord Tarrant. The line clicked off. Tarrant looked away from the console to see Sarissa regarding him thoughtfully. He tried to sense her mind in the Force, but found it hard to read. She'd been learning how to guard herself. You were going to tell Avank about the Jedi, weren't you? She asked. Of course. Did you think I wasn't? I'm not sure. Her brows drew together. Darth Avank said you used to be a Jedi yourself. Another life. It was what he just told Jadram. I don't suppose you know this Jedi. A lucky guess or a good perception. He suspected the latter and decided not to lie. I remember him. And he remembers you. Yes. I see. Do you want me to interrogate him? She was full of surprises. I will do it myself. I can do it. I'm offering. Honesty bled through in the force. She meant what she said. She wanted to do it. To prove to her new masters that she could. I will break the Jedi. You will watch the prisoners and make sure they do nothing untoward. Disappointment softened her expression. If that's the way you wish it. I'm your master. You are my apprentice. 
You will do as you're told, apprentice. Of course, she nodded stiffly. Then stay here and leave the rest to me. Chapter 23 Damien Court had done a wide variety of jobs in the Empire service. The most recent had spanned the spectrum from courier to orchestrator of two bloody battles. Playing bodyguard seemed more like the former, and once again Moff Veers had refrained from explaining exactly what this innocuous, apparently simple task was meant to accomplish. He'd been secreted onto the security team of Admiral Hallis, commanding officer of the Imperial First Fleet, just four days before. He slept in the barracks aboard the Admiral Star Destroyer Sentinel, eaten in the mess with the other guards, and swapped stories about previous assignments which were, in his case, entirely fictional. That he had seven years on the next oldest bodyguard went uncommented upon, but it was, to him, the one potentially jarring aspect of what was otherwise a smooth and simple insertion. Four days after joining the team he accompanied the Admiral onto his shuttle and flew out from Sentinel to meet the new arrival from Kuwait. Veers had simply told him to protect Hallis at all costs and nothing more. Whatever was possibly going to happen to him, Damien had a feeling it would occur soon, when the Admiral boarded the new Superstar Destroyer Invincible. Damien had seen schematics of the ship but never appreciated its size until he saw it in person. At 14 kilometers long, it was more than seven times the length of the twin Predator-class destroyers that hung off its flanks. The ship was long and narrow, more sword than dagger, with superstructure slanting wide of the engine sections like a hilt guard. He knew he shouldn't gulp, but the other guards were staring out the shuttle's porthole windows too, as entranced by this massive ship as he was. The Empire had made larger warships in his glory days. Darth Vader's Executor and Palpatine's Black Hold Eclipse came to mind, but it had been almost a century since it had commissioned a warship this mighty. During his decades as the galaxy's foremost power, the Alliance had constructed a few giant warships, mostly from the Mon Calamari shipyards, but during the long peace they quietly retired their great weapons and focused on smaller ships and smaller fleets. Invincible was a statement of imperial supremacy and imperial pride, the kind not seen for generations. To be one of the first to see it was an honor that made the rest of the strange mission worthwhile. Admiral Hallis seemed to the only unimpressed one, that or he hit it well. The most senior of the Empire's four fleet admirals, a thick-set and cracky-faced man with the head of white hair under the cap of his formal dress uniform. Damien knew him only by reputation, more administrator than soldier, more concerned with efficiency than inspiring his troops. He frankly didn't seem like the kind of officer Veers would have courted as an alley, but as always, Damien's job was to follow orders, not ask questions. Invincible had been orbiting Bastion for two hours when Hallis arrived to take his position as flag officer for the Empire's greatest warship. Damien understood the ship was still only operating on a skeleton crew. The bulk of his staff would be imported from other ships, mostly the First Fleet, in the days to come. The goal today was to show the thing off, which was why Damien wasn't surprised to find a squawking flock of journalists in the landing bay when their shuttle sent down. They were barely held back by a stormtrooper guarded cordon and they put Damien on edge, though he was careful not to show it. He made slow and steady movements, watched everything, and kept a hand near his hip-mounted pistol but not on it. As they escorted an equally stern-faced Hallis toward the hangar exit, the admiral made the signal to halt and turn to face the journalists. They immediately barraged him with questions and shoved audio receivers at him, though Damien and the other security staff made sure they were all at least two meters from the admiral. He scanned the crowd for anything that could be used as a ranged weapon but saw only equipment brandished with a variety of Newsnet logos, from INN to the smaller independent Imperial networks, and even a few alliance based ones. Invincible was a big deal indeed. A question, Admiral. One woman shouted louder than the others. Will this ship be put into use against the Raiders right away? Are the Raiders defeated, Admiral? Asked another reporter. A third threw in, Admiral, is it true the leader of the Raiders was killed by a Jedi? Hallis' face creased a little more as he gave them a small, polite smile. After the engagement at Savic 358, we can say with confidence we've dealt the Raiders a crippling blow. Invincible will be taken out to the border regions to secure our systems there. Is their leader dead? 
The third reporter from an Alliance network pressed. Did a Jedi kill him? The flock quieted a little. They all wanted to hear it. Hallis allowed a tiny nod. He is dead. Our Imperial Knights were responsible for the kill. That brought up another swarm of questions. The loudest one shouted, Admiral, if the threat is over, how do you justify Invincible? Couldn't the money and material for the ship have been better spent? That one was from an Imperial network. Damien saw, one of the little independent ones. Hallis' smile flattened, and he said, I am fully in agreement with Head of State Avaris and Supreme Commander Derrickan that this warship is essential for the future security of the Empire. The recent attacks prove we need to be strong and vigilant at all times. If you'll excuse me, I have to review operations on my ship. The Head of State and Supreme Commander will arrive in a few hours and will answer all your remaining questions at the press conference. Thank you. With that he turned and walked fast for the exit. Damien and the other guards had to hurry to keep up. Once he was past all the journalists into the quiet security of the hallways, the stiff old admiral allowed a small sigh. You did well in there, sir, Damien offered. Hallis glanced sideways, like he was noticing Damien for the first time. Damien thought he was in for a reprimand the admiral was a reputed martinet, but he said, I threw them a bone to gnaw on. Avarice will handle all the hard questions. Yes, sir, Damien said, and decided not to risk further conversation. Hallis wasn't in the mood for it. He walked briskly on, and Damien followed, wondering again just what the hell was doing here. Darth Crow never forgot a face, even a vermin's, so when he watched the newscast from Bastion in the comfort of his landside estate on Kuwait, he recognized one of Admiral Hallis security officers as the agent Moff Veers had sent to pick up Invincible's command. What that meant he wasn't sure, most likely Veers was just being cautious. He didn't know exactly how or when Chrome would strike at head of state Avarice but he'd apparently decided Admiral Hallis needed to be protected. A smart precaution, but unnecessary. The plan Crone had put in motion wasn't anything that threatened Hallis or anyone else on Invincible. An extra bodyguard wouldn't provide protection anyway. Avarice and Derrickan were still on Bastion, no doubt running through their own rigorous security checks before getting on the shuttle that would take them up to the Superstar Destroyer, checks that would be just as useless. They wouldn't arrive for a few hours more so Crone went to work in the meantime. The one Sith were seeking out Force sensitives in positions of power because that was what the old Sith had done when undermining the Republic from within. Darth Sidious had been of a noble family, albeit from a backwater planet. Plaguus had been even richer than Crone. At the same time, Darth Wirelock and the others hid in the Hapes Cluster, raising a born Sith army that would rival the Jedi Orders once they brought it out of the shadows. It was a two-pronged attack, combing the methods of Darth Bane's followers and the Sith-led armies like Naga Sadows and Valkorians. It was, he thought, a merging of both sides' strengths, and the best way to bring down the Jedi and the Alliance. Still, it meant that for converts like Crone, he was forced to spend more time living his false life than acting as a true Sith. Managing the galaxy's greatest shipbuilding conglomerate was enough to devour every hour of every day, even with the help of droids, aides, and competent sub-managers. Tomorrow he was due to meet with the rest of the board and review a contract proposal with the new distribution company, Hardly the kind of entry commonly associated with the Sith. The one potentially useful thing about the proposal was its source, Chance Calrissian, along with the old hut he's partnered corporate interests with. Back when Crone had been KDY's newest board member, he'd spent most of his time on Coruscant, winning favors from senators and business beings with a combination of charisma and careful bribes. Consorting nonstop with vermin grew tiresome. But Calrissian had been more entertaining than most, and had a close friendship with an important Jedi that Crone had hoped might prove useful. But that had been a long time ago. He barely spoke with Calrissian anymore. Still, tomorrow he'd ply the man with drinks and compliments, talk nostalgia, and ask with well-feigned casualness what Calrissian's Jedi friend was doing nowadays. It just might get him something useful. He'd reviewed the advanced copy of Calrissian and Volgma's proposal and made notes for the other board members when he checked the INN broadcast. 
His timing was good. The pretty young female reporter was saying that the head of state and supreme commander were leaving Ravelin in their shuttle and would reach Invincible in minutes. Crone sat on the sofa in front of the holo and leaned forward to watch intently. This was the crux of it. He was confident the plan he'd put in motion would succeed, but there was still the chance something could go wrong, especially when most of it was in the hands of Vermin. As the reporter kept talking, an insert image over her shoulder showed a long-range shot of a single white Imperial shuttle clearing Bastion's atmosphere flanked on either side by two red-painted tight X fighters that normally flew on a guard for the head of state. Suddenly the view jerked wildly, the camera zoomed out just as two of the tight X's burst into flame and the other two broke formation and began firing. The reporter, caught as off guard as her viewers, watching with them in stunned silence as the camera caught a long-bodied Kali's frigate falling out of space toward the head of state's shuttle. It was exactly as planned. Locating the Grievous had been difficult after it had fled Kaylee. Darth Wirelock had sent a dozen of the one Sith's best trackers to find the fugitive warship, and once they had it had been no easy task convincing the frightened and angry Kali's leaders to take the bait, but in the end the chance to strike back against the leaders of the Empire that had subjugated their world twice over was too strong. Crone smiled to himself as the Grievous blasted the remaining tie X's away and grabbed the shuttle with his tractor beam. The Kalish were consistently defiant against outsider rule, but their bellicose pride was what made the aliens easy to manipulate. Over a century ago, Darth Sidious had made their best general into his most useful pawn. The fact that Crone's tool today was named after Sidious was one delicious irony. That the Jedi had enabled it was another. The space around the Grievous immediately swarmed with other ships from Bastion's orbital security, gunships, patrolling ties, and attack frigate. None of them dared fire when the Kali ship had reeled Avarice and Derrickon's shuttle inside a shield envelope and clasped it tight to the hull. The ANN reported was, finally, fumbling to respond to the situation. As you can see, the Cali ship had just seized the head of state shuttle. This is an incredible development. The ship, hold on. She pressed a finger to her earpiece, carefully obscured by a curtain of long hair. Yes, our sources are confirming this is the same ship that escaped the security operation at Cali two weeks ago. The ship is, ah, the Grievous, and when last spotted and contained the leaders of the anti-imperial uprising on Kaylee, the leaders who'd aligned with the alien invaders. One moment, please, we're getting a broadcast on all frequencies from the Grievous. We are? Are we receiving? Can we put it on? Yes, we can put it on. One moment. Then there was a short static burst and the woman disappeared. She was replaced with the full-screen headshot of a Kalish warrior, face obscured by the white tribal mask his race wore. The angry eyes, vertical slit eyes like a predator's, glared through the mask at an audience of billions. You can see we have captured your leaders, the alien said with a voice as fierce as his eyes. We have now done to you what you have done to us. We will hold your leaders. They are ours for as long as your troops occupy Kaylee. We invoke our dead. We invoke the great Grievous who died in a holy war against your Palpatine. We will honor our martyrs and win independence for our race. We will not release your leaders until every Imperial soldier has been removed from our world. Until then we will. The transmission burst to static. The reporter reappeared, and over her shoulder the inset image showed the Grievous explode in burst of light and heat so powerful the nearby ties and gunships pulled back to escape the blast. The one Sith saboteurs had done their job well. The explosion of the frigate's power core had wiped out every last warrior aboard the Grievous and everyone aboard the head of state's shuttle. The Kalish had been reticent to trust the mysterious strangers who'd offered them help. They'd been right to suspect the Sith and wrong to take the bait that was too good to refuse. It was how the Sith operated time and again, and it rarely failed. The reporter's pretty face had gone blank with shock. After 10 or 15 seconds, she finally remembered she was on air, looked at the camera, and said, Ladies and gentlemen, we have just witnessed the murder of Head of State Avarist. And, yes, my sources say the Supreme Commander Derrickon was on the shuttle with her. I repeat, Avarist and Derrickon are dead. 
That means the Moth Council will have to elect an emergency head of state until a general election can be held. We've no word yet from the military how. Crow shut off the transmission. Everything had worked perfectly, and everything would flow from here. Humming pleasantly to himself, he got up from the sofa, poured a cup of aged Sardinanian brandy given to him by Moth Veers as seemed appropriate, and went back to Calrician's proposal. Davek had excused himself from watching Invincible's commissioning ceremony. A lot of officers were eager to see the Superstar Destroyer officially put into action but he claimed he had too much to do overseeing repairs to the 4th, which was true enough, but he was also trying hard not to think about that waste of credit's vanity project that hadn't been ready when they most needed it. Vice Admiral Devlin Yeager Chief of Operations at the Bilbringi Shipyards and Davex's former helm chief on Voidwalker was of the same mind, so the two of them ensconced themselves in Jaeger's office and started going over reports before Evers was due to start her press conference. They were, therefore, caught completely off guard when Jaeger's aide buzzed his way into the office and asked edgily, Admirals, do you have any response to what's happened on Bastion? People are expecting a statement. Davik and Jaeger both fixed the young Zabrik with confused stares. The A stared back. Haven't you heard? I and then, the other news nets, the Alliance ones, is everywhere. Jaeger slapped the controls to the holo projector mounted in the wall of his office. As he winked on the A started speaking over the female ANN reporter, saying, it happened so fast. We still don't know how that Cali ship got so deep into our security lanes without being caught. What ship? Is it Davik stopped? His eyes locked on the text scrawling beneath the reporter. Moff Council meeting to elect emergency Haas. Alliance Cos Esh expresses formal condolences. Reports of Third Fleet action at Kaylee unconfirmed. It was the grievous, the aide said. It came out of nowhere. Avarice and Derek had never had a chance. They're dead. Yes, sir. The aide waved weakly at the holo. The Moff Council, like they said, is having an emergency vote right now. Davek's head swam with too many possibilities, none of them good. He remembered that a new Moff had just been voted to replace Moff Moran from Valk 7, a hardliner and old-style Imperial. That might be enough to tip the scales. He tried to run through all the Moffs on the Council and their political leanings but there was so much else to consider too, who would lead the military now that Derekin was dead. What would happen to the Kalish? What would happen to other non-humans in the Empire? More anti-alien riots were a certainty. The only question was how bad they'd be. Another thought reared up. If Arlen had fired on the Grievous back at Kaylee, like Davik had ordered him to, this disaster never would have happened. Admiral, Jaeger said, lightly slapping his shoulder. Listen. Davik refocused his attention on the INN reporter. She said, our sources have just confirmed that the Moth Council has completed its vote. We, uh, don't have confirmation of the winner yet, but we understand there will be an official statement in minutes. Not good, Davik breathed. What I want to know is, who's going to be Supreme Commander? Asked Jaeger. It has to be one of the fleet admirals, and you're, uh, too young. So's grave. Hallis, then? Probably. Davek wished he knew the first commander better. He had a reputation as being more boring old bureaucrat than soldier, and they said he kept his political leanings to himself. The aide, standing behind them, coughed to get attention. Sirs, the whole yards are in an uproar. I really think they need a statement of some kind, probably from the both of you. They'll get it in a minute, Lieutenant, Jaeger snapped. You're excused. Davek barely noticed the Zabrik salute and scamper off. He and Jaeger watched the holo, grimly captivated, as the reporter repeated what she'd probably been saying for the past hour. They had no idea where the Grievous had come from or how it had slipped so deep into the Capital World security net. She mentioned something about the wreckage being so gnarled it might take days or weeks to identify bodies, but flight control on Ravel could confirm that yes, Avarice and Derekin had been aboard the shuttle. Heaviness settled in Davek's stomach. He's respected Derrickin, one soldier to another. As for Avarice, he never liked her, personally or politically, but now that she was dead he felt the sudden conviction that he'd misjudged her all this time, 
or at least failed to give her credit when it was due. What would follow her was likely to be much worse. Then the reporter said, We'll be cutting away in a moment. We'll be giving you an official transmission from the Moth Council, which I'm told is casting out from Yaga Minor. There it was, then. The reporter was replaced by a big INN logo, and the logo was replaced by a shot of an empty podium with a round imperial crest on the wall behind it. Even before he stepped into view, Davek knew it would be Corrine Veers who took the stage. Dressed in his martial olive green moth's uniform, Veers gripped both sides of the podium and looked right at his audience. Gone was the chatty, personable, rumor spreader who'd been giving all those INN interview lately. Veers looked grim and grieving, shoulders slightly hunched as though he was weighted down by the responsibility that had been thrust upon him. It's with great grief that I come before you today, Veers told his billions. The emergency session of the Moth Council has elected me as head of state of the Empire. I did not want this position. I did not seek it. But I will honor it with every breath I take. Before I go further, I want to say a few words for the dead. Supreme Commander Derrickin was as honorable a soldier as I've ever known. He devoted his life to serving the citizens of the Empire, and he was respected by every man and woman who served under him. Replacing his is impossible, but I know the most valiant efforts will be made by Brayton Hellas, former commander of the First Fleet and our most senior admiral, now Supreme Commander of the Imperial Armed Forces. Davik immediately wondered who'd replace Hallis as commander of the first. He didn't know any of Hallis' vice admirals well. Then he wondered what Veers had planned for Admiral Grave, his protege. Now let me speak to head of state Avarice, Veers went on. Just like Derrickin, she gave everything she had for the Empire, including her life. I knew her since her days on the Moth Council together, and though we didn't always disagree I never doubted her integrity, and her devotion to safeguarding the lives of the Empire citizens. Her ruthless murder is a tragedy for us all, and I promise all loyal citizens of the Empire that her death will be avenged. Someday soon, we will hold a general election so that all Imperial citizens can decide the head of state. Until that day comes I promise I will use every effort to root out traitors to the Empire. Any being still alive who contributed to the murder of Nila Avarice will be found and punished. Anyone working to undermine the Empire from within regardless of species, priorities, or professed loyalties will be found and punished. I swear this on my life and the lives of all the fine Imperials who died this day. Once the enemies of the Empire have been rooted out, once I have determined along with Admiral Hallis, the Moth Council, and all our other intelligence and military leaders that we have conquered the threat to our way of life, I will stand down and call elections. But until that day I will shoulder the burden put upon me. I will fight every hour of every day to rid the Empire of its enemies outside and within. And I have faith that you, my fellow Imperial citizens, will fight alongside me until we've made a better, safer Empire for us all. Good day, and thank you for listening. As the broadcast switched back to the INN reported, Jaeger turned it off. He and Davex slumped in their seats for a long moment, stunned. Jaeger asked, when do you think he'll announce a general election? Months? Years? Ever? Davik rasped. Jaeger scowled, shook his head, and said nothing. Davik thought on his father, all Jagged had done over the course of his life to remake this empire without an emperor into a just society for all. Davik tried to tell himself that the institutions his father had made were strong that they could endure whatever Veers and his allies would do to wreck it in the name of security. He wanted to believe Jagged Fell hadn't lived and died in vain. He wanted it more than anything, even to see his father alive again. But sitting there in Jaeger's office, Veers' stern words and serious eyes echoing in his mind, he knew that he could not. The grievous incident, alternately described as an assassination or attack, had occurred at noon Imperial Standard Time, which meant that the 4th Fleet crew and shipyard staff at Bilbringi had the rest of the day to let the ramifications wash over them in waves. First had been shock, then indignation, then anger. Something strange had happened when Corrine Veers gave his first speech as emergency head of state. Something had settled over everyone. Not relief or calm or satisfaction, but something, 
a certain steadiness that comes with at least knowing somebody is in charge and working to set things right. Trust might have been the closest word for it. Through it all, Lucas Briggs felt strangely detached, and it wasn't until evening when the other shipyard staff started retreating to the habitat section that he began to understand why. After the battle at Sebek 358, everyone had shared collective relief that the raiders seemed defeated and the hope that the Empire might feel safe and secure again. The attack at Bobrangi had shattered it all, and most people, Lucas included, were reeling from the whiplash of it all. The one exception, the one person he knew who hadn't tacked it relieved after Sebek 358, was his old sergeant. Lucas only realized it late in the evening. He hadn't talked to Malkin all day, he spent the whole afternoon trying to push through assigned work while listening to his subordinates in the quartermaster's office swap gossip and opinions. He didn't know where the colonel was now and decided not to call him. Instead, for reasons he still couldn't quite explain, he went down to the storage chambers to have a look. It was a maze of industrial-sized cargo crates down there, but eventually, with the help of a small floating archivist droid, he found the location of the supplies he'd helped Malkin and Marsh slip aboard the station last month. As deputy chief quartermaster, he had the authority to manually open and inspect it just about anything. He was surprised, then, when the computerized latch on the crates refused to open for his identicard. Who has authority to open these crates? Lucas asked the droid hovering over his shoulder. Colonel Holmes Malkin, Infantry Division, 221st Regiment. Anyone else? No, sir. What about the Chief Quartermaster? No, sir. What about Vice Admiral Yeager? No, sir. He sighed. What about Emperor Palpatine? The droid's one eyes winked off and on. Not applicable. Please restate your query. Lucas scowled and ran his hand over the locking mechanism. It was a heavy-duty thing, but he could break it open if he had the right tools, an industrial laser saw or a Jedi's lightsaber. There'd be no way to hide that damage, and he had no obvious cause to break into the crate. The weird security protocol might have been a glitch. These things had been transferred all the way from Yaga Minor after all, and thanks to Lucas' own efforts they hadn't gone through the proper accession process. It was thoroughly possible that these things contained exactly what Malkin claimed they had. But the nagging feeling wouldn't go away. He retreated to his office. The quartermaster's section had mostly cleared of staff, and he sat down at his computer and brought up personnel records. His rank and division gave him only limited access to information from infantry division. He could get a roster of names of the soldiers who come to Bilbringi from Yaga Minor along with those crates, but he couldn't get into their service records. He knew people in infantry division who ranked high enough they should have access to those files. It would take a little thought, but he could probably come up with a very rational sounding explanation as to why he'd need a peek at the personnel records for the 221st Regiment. He didn't know what he'd find, but he felt the need to check. He didn't do anything that night. Most everyone had gone back to their quarters, which was where Lucas needed to be. When he got back to the habitat section, Marion was still up. She embraced him and commented, Late working. Usually she said it with a sarcastic edge. She could smell the ale on his breath. There was none of it this time, and her voice was all concern. He squeezed her shoulders and said, Yeah, it's been a hell of a day. I've noticed. How are the kids? Asleep. That's good. I bet they had questions. Lena did? Polar's worried, but he's too afraid to ask. I'm sorry. I should have been here tonight. You had work. She squeezed his arm. It's been a hell of a day, like you said. Yeah, and I need to be out early tomorrow. I thought so. He kissed her forehead. I'm tired. Let's get some rest. He washed, changed clothes, joined his wife in the bedroom. There were too many thoughts in his head. When he lay down beside Marion and tried to sleep, he knew it wouldn't happen tonight. Chapter 24 The ride outbound to Broken Moon was a succession of small revelations. Marin Fell knew that her mother and father had met sometime during the Sinex Juvex crisis. In the course of those events, Tamar had made an enemy of Mandalor Jevan Alchus and been forced to seek refuge with the Jedi. 
Marin got a lot of clarifications on the way to Broken Moon. She found out that her mother had been part of a team of Mandalorians sent by Alchus and Darth Zorn, though they hadn't known it at the time to interdict and possibly killed her father and Chance Calrissian. Things had gone crazy. Another Sith had attacked and tried to kill them both. Tamar found out the same Sith might have killed her sister Nile. It was a lot to take in. As they exited hyperspace into the Taloman system, an apparently lifeless collection of planetoids and one big gas giant, orbited by dozens of small moons, her father dropped the last bits of key information. When we were first here we had some help, Arlen said as he gently guided Starlight Champion toward around a silver swirl giant. We got close to the crime boss, Mordren Crux, with the help of one of his servants, a twillet girl named Sheriff. Marin might have grown up sheltered in the Jedi Academy, but she knew the cliché about crime bosses and Twi'lek slave girls. Okay. What happened? She killed the Shabur, Tamar said from the co-pilot seat. Language, Arlen said. But yes, Sheriff killed Crux. And then we lost track of her because things got pretty chaotic. I didn't hear anything about her until I guess, six years back? Seven years ago she showed up again on Broken Moon, Tamar said. Only this time, she was running the place. She's been in charge ever since. Broken Moon keeps a lower profile now than it did under Crux. It's mostly a shadow port, a place for beings to trade all kinds of illicit goods and hold meetings. Shevereth has her fingers in a lot of things, though she's bigger on selling information than Spice. And you think she'll help us because you helped her all those years ago? She's thrown a few favors my way since, Arlen said. Mostly little crumbs of information is hard to get through Jedi networks. She's quite fond of your father, Tamar drawled. Last time I checked. Let's hope she still is. Are we getting hailed yet? Tamar checked the comm console. Looks like we've been given a green light. Main hangar complex. All right. Let's take her in. Arlen steered champion toward a dark, rocky moon. As Marin peered over her parents' shoulders, she saw that the moon trailed a long chain of slow-moving space rock as it orbited the gas giant. Maybe a quarter of the sphere's mass seemed to have been ripped away, probably by a comet or asteroid, and it must have been crumbling slowly in the century since. It was, indeed, a broken moon, and it felt strange to name your secret base in so obvious a way, but she remembered that the galaxy was gigantic and there were probably thousands of similarly damaged satellites drifting around forgotten planets. Champion carefully threaded the many tumbling rocks and slipped into the ripped open section of the moon. She felt her father tense with concentration as he guided them through a series of rocky, twisting tunnels. Champion's forward light beams sometimes flashed on mechanical things, Marin spotted what looked like sensor packages and a few defensive gun turrets. When they finally reached the landing zone, they sat down on a broad pad a kilometer across and occupied by over a dozen ships of all designs, most similar in size to Champion. These were smuggler ships, Marin thought, the vessels of outlaws and spice runners the likes of which rarely ventured into Imperial Space's law and order and never to bastion itself. This was a very different world than what she'd known and her heart pounded fast as she followed her parents out of the ship. She felt exhilarated and ultra-paranoid at once as she scanned a flight deck that was mostly empty of people. All three of them wore loose civilian clothes. Her mother had brought her full Baskargam suit along just in case but kept it aboard champion for now. Tamar kept a blaster pistol clearly visible at her hip while her father had his lightsaber in a secure spot on his jacket. Marin had brought her saber along as well, but her parents had both insisted she leave it aboard the ship. It had felt a little demeaning at the time, but now she was glad she didn't have to worry about whether she'd have to use the half-familiar weapon in a situation of real danger. As they walked across the deck, Tamar casually flicked a finger at one ship. There it is. Harm's way. Marin had heard it. It belonged to her mother's cousin Dorn. It was an unusual ship. Not as strange-looking as Starlight Champion, but still different from the usual disc-shaped Corellian freighters, or boxy imperial haulers. Mandalorian ship. Marin asked in a low voice. More or less. Variation on the old Quiddy Fire Spray type patrol ship. Dorns made plenty of customizations. Can you call him now? Asked Arlen. 
One way to find out. Tamar pulled a personal comlink out of her jacket and flicked it on. She said something fast and soft Marin couldn't catch, but it sounded like Mandoa. A tinny voice responded, even harder to hear. Tamar pocketed the link and said, they're in the main audience room. She's there too. Then let's get this over with, Arlen said. Marin followed her parents out of the hangar through a long series of winding corridors carved through rock. A group of Yuzum, each three times bigger than Marin and encased in thick armor, shoved past them, roaring and barking things she couldn't understand. They passed an open door and Marin got a glimpse of a smoky room, broad-bodied aliens she couldn't place were reclining on lounges and what looked like a couple of Togruta girls were writhing in front of them, bare skin gleaming under red lights. Eyes ahead, Arlen said with a nudge in the force. Right, Marin swallowed. She could feel more from her father in the force, unspoken but clear. He was telling her, you don't belong in a place like this. She definitely wasn't going to disagree. She kept a little closer behind her parents as they kept moving through the halls. They wound around a couple of armored, rough-looking Nikto arguing in the middle of an intersection, then stepped into a large chamber with a broad, high dome carved from the rock. Blue and green lights cast across the dome and reflected down on the circular stage in the middle of the room where a couple of muscular, pink-skinned Zeltran men were doing acrobatics Marin was used to seeing from Jeddah and nobody else. Not that their display was Jedi-like. The poses were definitely not Jedi-typical, and those Zeltrans had as much on as those Togruta girls she glimpsed, which was to say pretty close to nothing. Her parents lingered on the edge of the chamber, and Marin stayed with them. Tamar nudged her arm and did another small pointing gesture. Marin followed her finger and spotted the table with two unapologetically Mandalorian figures in full armor, helmets, and all. The bigger one had dark blue plates. The smaller, thinner one had red Beskar over and off-white body suit. Dorn and Nanette Skarata, clearly. The red-faced helmet tilted in Marin's direction, a tiny nod. It was a weird place to meet your family for the first time. Well, Marin whispered, do we say hello? Not here, Arlen said. He was looking at the dance floor, past it to the raised dais where a blue-skinned Twi'lek woman sat on a gold-plated throne, one bare leg crossed over the other, watching the show with an expression of faint amusement. What do we do now? Marin asked. Just go up to her. She'll take us when she wants to, Tamar said. Where Ash wants to, which won't be in the open like this. Marin looked around. There were four different serving stations where humans and aliens of all types clustered plus other small side tables, some full and other empty. Do we take a seat? She never felt more out of place in her life. Don't worry, Arlen muttered. Won't be long. She gave the room one more anxious look around and suddenly they had company. A and X were tall aliens, hard to miss for their long crested skulls, but somehow this one had sneaked up on them. He sidled beside her father, hands clasped in front of him, and said, "Well." I never thought I'd see the two of you together again. And you've brought a guest. Good to see you too. Arlen smiled, plenty of teeth. How's business? Stable, the way she likes it. I assume you want an audience for the three of you. If it can be arranged. I'm sure it can. The ANX gesture to the Zeltran dancers. Their stamina is impressive, but they'll wear themselves down soon. I'll take you to someplace private. Marin reached out to both parents in the force and tried to ask if they could really trust this guy. The best she got was a nudge from a father that meant stay with me, which might have been an answer. They followed the ANX down a new side hall, through a security lock set of blast doors, and into a surprisingly luxurious chamber with plush sofas, woven carpets, ivory furniture, and violet and red shimmer silk curtain hung over the walls and ceiling that nearly obscured the rock from which the chamber was carved. Make yourselves at home, the ANX said dryly. She'll be with you shortly. And then he was gone, leaving the three of them alone. Marin looked over the chamber once more and wondered how much all this was worth. Jedi often claimed to be monastic, and indeed they weren't supposed to have much in physical possessions, but their communal property at the academies, 
mostly paid for by donations from private citizens in the empire and alliance, was generally clean and well-functioning. This kind of brash display of wealth was another big leap from all she'd known. What happens now? Marin asked. Do you have a way to signal? Her mother tapped two fingers on her forearm, a common mando signal for silence. Marin shut her mouth. This place was sure to be bugged, and her mother didn't want to advertise her connection to Dorn and the net out in the main chamber. They only had to wait a minute more. When the door slid open, Sheriff walked into the chamber. Seeing her this close, Marin was caught by surprise. She looked young, closer to Marin's age than her parents, and she was closer to Marin's height too, a full head and shoulders shorter than Arlen. Nonetheless, she walked right up to Marin's father, diaphanous rainbow-colored robes trailing behind her. She smirked, reached up, and fondly stroked Arlen's bearded chin. It's been a while, Master Jedi, the Twi'lek smiled. Arlen didn't return it. Are you surprised to see me? No. I knew you'd be back one day. What I am surprised by she looked at her Tamar, expression darkened. Is you? I thought you were no longer attached. We're not, said Tamar. Her gaze swung on Marin. Then maybe she's the reason you're here together. This is your daughter. Your Jedi daughter? Sheriff walked a slow half-circle around Marin. She felt like she was being sized up by a hungry manka cat. She swallowed hard and said, Pleased to meet you, but I'm not a Jedi yet. The Twi'lek tilted her head and twirled one blue leku tip around her finger. I suppose you've wanted to be one since you were a child. That's right. Pity. I'm sure with your bloodline you have all kinds of natural talents, which means you could be anything you want to be. I want to be a Jedi. Sheriff gave her a look, like she didn't really believe that and didn't think Marin did either. But before she could press the point, Arlen said, We're here for some specific information. We think you can help us. She looked at Marin's parents. Mandalorian business or Jedi business? Maybe both, said Tamar. If I had to guess, I'd say you were here about Galaset. Correct. Arlen did a little bit better at hiding his surprise than Tamar. With a level voice, he asked, Who's Galaset? Sheriff rolled her eyes. Ox's man was here two weeks and five days ago. He didn't stay long. Do you keep tight tabs on all your visitors? Tamar asked. Naturally. Sheriff sat down at the edge of a sofa, pushed back a hidden panel on the white table beside it, and tapped something into the keypad beneath. A holo image sprung up in the middle of the room from some projector Marin couldn't spot. She and her parents circled a life-sized image of a bald, jowl-faced alien and a human male around her parents' age sitting at a small table, maybe one of the ones in the main audience chamber. Sheriff leaned back on the sofa, arms spread lazily across his back. Galaset's been running cargo through Broken Moon for years now. He does it under a different name, McKempit. A lot of what he roots is actual cargo, but he likes to use this place for secret meetings, information gathering and the rest. Why does he use a fake identity? Asked Marin. Because he doesn't want me to know he's Javernach's man, she scowled. Coming in as McKempit is his way of keeping an eye on me and using the services I provide without revealing his connections. You don't like Mandos then? My predecessor was close with Arches. That's reason enough for me not to be. Her pretty blue face resumed a smile when she looked at Arlen. Thankfully, I had a brave young Jedi Knight to help liberate me, and I won't have it said I don't repay honest debts. Marin's father shifted uncomfortably. What else can you tell us about Galaset? Who was he meaning here? That's a good question, and believe me, I've tried to find out. Why? Because I like to know things, Sheriff shrugged, and I had a feeling you'd show up. Did you really? Tamar asked. Sheriff smiled a hard smile. It wouldn't be the first time you came crawling to me, begging for dirt you could use against the Mandalore. Marin felt faint surprise from her father, but Tamar said coolly, You weren't much help those times. Can you be helpful now? To an extent. She trapped the control switch on the table, and the holo image flickered into motion. The alien leaned in close to the human and started talking. 
The audio was crackled and the voices a little faint, like ambient noise had been scrubbed away. So, the human said, do you have a name? Call me Galaset. What should I call you? I think you know already. Starts with Halcyon. Ends with Blackmore. Fake, Tamar whispered as the human said, you've been in contact with my employer. My employer has, replied Galaset. I'm just his messenger. And how does your employer have an arrangement with this, ah? Uh? Her name is Sheriffeth, and to her I'm just a being who gets goods from place to place with no problems and no questions. That explains something. Frankly, I was expecting someone in different attire. I'm still Mandalorian. Even when I'm not fully dressed. I was told I'd meet with someone who'd speak with the authority of the Mandalore. Is that you? It is. I need to hire your services. I'm very willing to pay the price. What kind of services? The figures leaned a little closer. I need a team to hijack several ships, then use them in a combat situation. What kind of ships? Medium-sized capital ships. I have all the technical specifications on my person. I'll share them fully with your people. What? Vaggery. Marin gasped. The alien said, the target. The human said, the Chiss Ascendancy. Not a major assault, but enough to leave a mark. I'll give you all the information I have, and I will let your people run the mission your way. However, my employer wants me to remain with your people and observe. Sheriff tapped the controls and the holo froze. She said, I'll give you a copy of the recording if you want, but the rest is haggling over payment. Very tedious. No further clues. Arlen put his hands on his hips. Do you bugle the conversations in this place? She shrugged. Whenever possible. But frankly, I barely bother with most of it. The vast majority of what people have to say isn't worth listening to. But you listen to Galaset. Tamar said. Sheriff shot her another hard smile. You mandas are more interesting than most. I'll assume those bucket heads outside are part of your clan. Then we'll get very far away from here before having a conversation. The Twilik laughed and popped off the couch. She stalked over to Arlen and placed a small data card in his hand. Her fingers lingered on the lines of his palm as she looked up and told him, A favor to you. If you can pass anything back my way you know I'd appreciate it. Arlen drew his hand away and pocketed the card. I'll see what I can. But thank you. This is, this could change everything. But you don't have any clue who the human was? Asked Marin. Not at all. Sheriff shook her head. Nothing for certain. Tell me Marin, isn't it who do you think he was working for? Marin hadn't given the Twilik her name, and his mention threw her off balance, but she concentrated on the mental image of that man. Despite his worn spacer's outfit, he'd had a stiff posture, square shoulders, and a square jaw, short cropped blonde hair like a soldier would wear. Every time she left the Jedi Academy and wandered around Ravelin, she saw men like that. I'm not sure either, Marin said, but my gut tells me Imperial. Sheriff smiled and looked at Arlen. I like your daughter. I assume you did most of the rearing. He ignored her comment. You've given us a lot to think about. Is there anything else? Not for now. But you know when to find me when you need me again? That we do. Arlen looked to Tamar and Marin. I think we're done here. When they slipped out, leaving Sheriff behind, the ANX Major Domo was there to guide them through the secure halls back to the main audience chamber. As they walked, Marin whispered to her mother, she doesn't seem to like you very much. Like I think I said, I did punch her in the face when we first met. From what you told me on the way here, you punched Dad a couple times too. Well, to Mar's side, you have to admit I'm good at setting the tone. On their way back to the hangar, Arlen saw that Tamar's cousin and his daughter had deserted their spot in the audience chamber. He half expected to see they sneaked aboard Starlight Champion but found only a blinking red light on the comm system denoting a message left for him. Tamar stayed in the vestibule corridor and got on the comm with her cousin, probably nestled in his own ship. Arlen and Marin went into the cockpit and played the recording. He'd been expecting something from his mother or one of the other Jedi perhaps someone from Asus, but instead it was a head and shoulder shot of his brother. 
I don't know how much you've heard, Davik said, so I'll say it quickly. Head of State Avarice and Supreme Commander Derrickin are dead. They were killed in a surprise attack over Bastion by the Kali ship Grievous. His voice darkened at the name. Arlen's chest tightened. It had been an act of Jedi mercy to let that ship run. His brother had scolded him for it at the time, but he never imagined it could lead to this. Davik went on. The Grievous and Avar shuttle were both destroyed. Admiral Hallis from the First Fleet has been appointed Supreme Commander. The Moff Council elected Corian Veers as the new head of state. He's called on emergency powers and promised to root out all enemy agents inside the Empire before calling a general election. Fearfeck, Tamar Rask from the cockpit threshold. Arlen, we need to be ready for anything, Davek said very seriously. I don't think you'll move against the Jedi. The order's generally popular now after what you did at Savic 358. But you know Veer's politics. I'd feel much better if you were in Imperial space. There's no telling when Mom and the children might need you. Please respond when you get this message. The holo disappeared. Arlen fell back in the pilot's chair as thought pinned down by the weight of it all. In a trembling voice, Marin asked, What now? Do we go back home? She'd held her own against Sheriffith, but she looked overwhelmed again. She was worried about her grandmother, about Vitor, and Rome. Davik's right, Tamar said. You should have back. Take a copy of the recording with you. I'm sure your brother will be interested. I'll go over to Dorn's ship. We can't keep chasing leads. He looked up at her. You do that? Why? She shrugged and glanced at the bulkhead. He wanted to think it was because she felt an obligation to uncover the truth and bring justice to the thousands of Chiss killed in a false flag attack. Maybe she just wanted a weapon to use against Archis. Probably it was a mix of both. After all they'd been through, he knew Tamar better than just about anyone, even if he didn't always understand her weird mix of earnest morals and Mandalorian clan pride. I'll do it, Jedi, Tamar told him. So keep a link open. I might have more information for you. What about me? Asked Marin, voice still weak. Where do I go? Arlen opened his mouth to tell her to come. Then he wasn't sure. There was no telling how things would be when he got back to Bastion. Imperial space was on the exact opposite side of the galaxy from Broken Moon. It would take over a week to get there. Anything could happen in a week, and if Veers decided to crack down on the Jedi like Palpatine a century ago, Arlen didn't know if he'd be able to safeguard his daughter, let alone his mother and nephews. There was also no telling what would happen if she went with Tamar. If they tried to investigate Galaset that could set them in Jevernog's sights, and the Mandalore might decide to put a terminal end to Skarada meddling in his affair. That was possible but having Marin around would make Tamar act with restraint. He knew that about her too, even above clan pride she valued her daughter. She'd keep her from safety even if it meant surrendering a shot at Alchus. He needed both of them to get out of this alive and putting them together would keep them both safer. He held Marin's eyes and said, Go with your mother. But I? Vitor and Roan have your grandmother to keep them safe until I get there. They'll be fine. He projected certainty in the Force and hoped she bought his lie. We need to figure out who hired the Mandalorians to strike the Chiss. That might be more important than anything. Go with the Skiratas. They're family too. They'll keep you safe. The girl shook, just a little, at the word family. A family she'd never known. A family that was in so many ways antithetical to what the Jedi stood for. Arlen wondered if he hadn't just made a great mistake, but Tamar put a hand on Marin's shoulder and said, Don't worry. You'll be fine with us, and your father can't take care of things back home. She looked at Arlen as she said it. We don't have time to waste. Get everything you need. Everything. Then we'll head over to harm's way. Marin nodded and stood. She slipped out of the cockpit without looking back, as though pursued by her own anxieties. Arlen sighed and slumped back into his chair. You take care of her, Tamar said, standing over him. She may be a fell, but she's also a Skarata, even if she doesn't know it. I know. And thank you. The situation on Bastion. It'll probably be okay, but I can't be sure of anything anymore. After a pause, Tamar said, 
I need to get ready too. Collect my Biscargam and everything else. Make me a copy of that recording. Right? Sure. He added, thank you. You already said that. Don't go crazy on the long ride back to Bastion. The whole empire's not going to fall apart just because you're away for a week or two. And you think I'm worried about that? She gave him a look that said, I know you, Arlen fell, turned, and left the cockpit. She did know, better than almost anyone in the damn galaxy, but she didn't know it all. Worrying about his family on the long trip home would be bad enough. Much worse would be the endless second guessing over his actions at Kaylee wondering if he should have shot down that ship, if he should have ignored his instincts and the Force, if acting as a Jedi would cost more lives than is saved. He didn't want to talk about that with Tamar. He didn't want to discuss it with Davik either but he had a feeling that conversation was coming one way or another. He could talk about it with his mother, maybe, if everything was okay when he got back to Bastion. Too many questions, some which might never have answers. He took out the data card he'd gotten from Sheriff, plugged it into Champ's computer, and began to copy the data. That file asked a question that surely had an answer. Somewhere, one Tamar and Marin might even be able to find. If they did then it might solve a lot more problems too. It was a hope he'd have to cling to on the solo flight ahead. Most visitors to Kuwait were only allowed access to the great orbital construction yards that ringed the planet. The select and honored few were allowed onto the surface, where miles and miles of lushly manicured landscape had been maintained for centuries as leisure zones for ancient aristocratic houses. The Qvolt estate was neither more or less opulent than most, but it was enough to elicit some nicely astonished expressions from both Chance Calrissian and his business partner, Volgma the Hutt. Calrissian was from a family two generations rich but still no stranger to luxury. Volgma had been around for four centuries and seen many shameless displays of wealth. That he was able to impress them both gave Crone some amusement, dull but there, it was the most he got from vermin nowadays. After Calrissian and Volgma gave their contract pitch to the board, one crone would make sure it was approved before the annual conference for defense contractors at Bumora in a week. They spent the rest of the day touring the Qvolt estate. After a visit to a private gallery stocked with priceless art from Alderaan and Comus, they strolled the mile-long arcade where giant marble pillars carved with the faces of centuries dead Qvolt nobles rose 20 meters high on every side. They ended the day with a ride over an artificial ocean where a family of imported Mon Calamari Waladin swam freely beneath the transparent steel deck of their water skimmer. As the sun set, turning water the same red as the wine they drank, Volgma asked, Tell me, Chairman Retor, what wings to this estate have you added personally? None, actually, Crone said. He and Chance leaned over the rail of the skimmer to watch the sun set while the great hut reclined on the repulsor bed he'd brought with him from Karuskin. Volgma huffed. But what of your accomplishments? You should build tributes to them. You're the first Qvolt to chair the board in nearly a century. Crone smirked at him. I didn't know you've read into my history. Less reading, more living. I met Cadiel of Qvolt once. Your grandmother? Great-grandmother, Crone said evenly. She'd been the last head of KDY before the rebellion ousted her and nationalized its manufacturing machine. It had cast the Qvo clan into disfavor for generations but had also proven useful in convincing Moff Veers of his pro-empire credentials. Ah, of course, moaned Vogma. I sometimes forget how fleeting human lives are. Calrissian chuckled and shook his head. The hut went on, I knew your great-grandmother as a cootie noble, but I... She refused to do business with my corporation. A bias against my race, most unfortunate and all too common, though understandable in her case. Did you know she was once memory wiped and sold as a slave to the infamous Jabba? A terrible affair, though I heard she made quite the dancer. Crone let the hut ramble on. He knew Volgma's history. The hut had grown of age on Nal Hutta before breaking off from his Angeliac clan a little over a century ago when Darth Sidious had been reigning in the hut's power with his new empire. Since then Volgma been a shockingly ethical corporate executive, to the continual surprise of his clients and shame of the Angeliac. He was still a hut, though, and displayed a constantly via keen business acumen, 
gluttonous appetite, and propensity for self-absorption. Eventually, the hut directed his repulsor sled to the lower deck to get some food. The sun had just dipped beneath the horizon line, and the sky was turning from violet to black. Calrissian tilted his head back, let the wind tussle his curly hair, and sighed. So, Crone said conversationally, what is it like running your business with the hut? A trying partnership? Sometimes, Calrissian said seriously. But profitable. Good to hear? Crone tapped his wine glass lightly against Calrissian's. So I can trust you to approve our pitch, right? Oh, I think you'll win enough votes through the merit of your proposal. Good to know, Chance chuckled. So if I'm working with KDY now, does this mean I get an invite to that big conference on Bamora next week? Why? Do you want to hobnob with more defense contractors? That's the hope. Always looking for a good connection. That's the chance I remember. But it can't all be business. How is the family? Your daughter is? How old? Brenna is 16. Crone had met her once, a long time ago. A whiny, self-centered little child. Time does fly. You know, I have to ask, Calrissian said, why did I own of her marry? I still have time. An equivocal smile. True, true. It's just, you must have had opportunities. You've got the money. And if I'm being honest, the charisma and the looks. No need to flatter me, Chance. You've got my vote, Crone said flatly. But seriously, is there an answer? Crone took a gulp of wine. Married to my work, I suppose. Huh. I guess yours must keep you even busier than mine. You have no idea. He sipped a little more wine and decided to start angling. But like I said, time gets away from you. We don't see each other often enough, my friend. You can say that again? But it happens to everyone, doesn't it? How often do you see that Jedi friend of yours anymore? You two used to be close as brothers. You mean Arlen. I talk to him sometimes. But see him in person. You're right, it has been a while. Any idea what he's doing now? Just a touch of force suggestion. Calrissian normally had a strong mind, but alcohol and beckoning nostalgia softened it. Calrissian's face went blank for a moment, then brightened with a smile. You're not going to believe it, actually. Believe what? Calrissian hesitated, like he was wondering how much to say. Crone pressed further, reaching into his mind with invisible hands, searching for memories and sensations. Calrissian said, Do you remember? All those years ago, when Arlen and I hitched a ride on your yacht back to Coruscan. Vividly, he'd known about their trip to Broken Moon and reported it to Darth Zorn. Kikit and those Mandalorian vermin had failed to kill them there. It had been the beginning of the end of the one set's plans for Synax Juvex. He's going back there is all. Funny thing, got an old friend with him too. Which old friend? Calrissian hesitated, crone prodded. The vermin muttered, old girlfriend. The Mandalorian defector, Tamar Skarata. The mother of Arlen Fell's child. The Sith had figured she'd been the one to kill Mordren Crux and wreck their spice-selling scheme. Pieces fell into place. When did they leave for Broken Moon? He pressed. Calrissian blinked like he'd gone groggy. A stupid mistake, he hadn't named the location aloud. Retor of Qvolt shouldn't have known it. He'd need to rub that memory free. Crone reached out to lay a hand on the top of Calrissian's back. The man didn't shift, Crone snaked his hand up further to the back of his skull, muddling the vermin's thoughts all the while, then reached deeper into his mind. A conversation on Holo. Days ago, before Fel had left Bastion, before Calrissian had left Coruscant, the Jedi might have been to Broken Moon already. He must have gotten information from that Twi'lek winch. It was a mistake to use that shadow port as a meeting place. He'd warned Arches against it over and over, but the damned Mandalor never took advice. He heard the sounds of Vogma returning from below the deck. He smudged the last minute of conversation from the top of Calrissian's memory and removed his hand. When the HUD rolled out onto the deck, now dark under a black sky, he found Calrissian hunched forward over the railing like he was going to tip into the water. Crone? Smiling, took the wine glass from Calrissian's hand and said for both to hear, looks like you've had too much to drink. 
I guess so, the man winced and rubbed the back of his head. Sorry about that. Not a problem. Maybe we should turn in. I think so. Kaurishan turned around and told the hut, you can stay out here if you want. No, it's quite all right, Volgma waved a plump hand. Nothing follows up a good meal like a good night's sleep. Mental suggestion on huts was difficult, even for a Sith Lord, but gluttony did what the Force could not. They retreated to the Qvolt family's palatial estate. The 20 minutes it took to get us to guests settled felt like forever. When they were finally in their chambers, Crone retreated to his and activated his most secure communications device. He hesitated. He needed to talk to Veers and Ox both and decided to try to the Imperial first. The newly minted head of state was a busy man, and for security reasons he only communicated with Crone over this line very rarely. Being held on it would be enough to extricate Veers from whatever he was doing now. When the man's hollow image appeared, he was all polite smiles. Ah, Chairman Retor. What a pleasant surprise. In his hurry, Crone had forgotten the aggravating small talk and cloak language they always used in these transmissions. The communications tech they used were some of the most secure in the galaxy, but for the stakes, they were playing for they had to be careful even now. Thank you. Congratulations on being elected head of state. And my condolences too, of course, for all the empires lost today. Thank you, Chairman. We all appreciate your good wishes, Veer said, so earnest. On the positive side, I'm happy to report that Invincible is operating exactly as promised. I hope you can use it to keep the Empire safe from any threat. Believe me, I hope so too. While I appreciate the good words, is there a reason for this call? A few things, actually. They won't take long. I was wondering about that emissary you sent last month. Emissary? Ah, yes. What of him? He made a good impression, and I wanted to check in on him. Now, my eyes may have deceived me, but I believe I saw him yesterday morning accompanying Admiral Hallis aboard Invincible. Was I mistaken? He blinked in surprise. No. You were not. I see. Then I have to ask, was your emissary also present at those delicate negotiations I directed you toward? Veers knew exactly what he was saying. His eyes narrowed. Yes. Is this important? I'm learned recently that those negotiations may have had a compromised security element. Panic flashed on the Imperial's face. Crone assured him, I'm doing everything I can to investigate the matter. Rest assured I'll take care of any problems and let you know if there's anything further to worry about. I do, however, insist you ensure your agent cannot compromise things further. Veer scowled. He's one of my best men. The damn vermin was letting sentimentality cloud his judgment. He was a poor emulation of Darth Sidious, but he was the best they had to work with. The agent needed to die, that was obvious. He could press Veer's but the man might hold it against him so he decided to try a subtler approach. I appreciate your loyalty. Can you vouch for his? Absolutely. He'd never break, not even under torture. Torture by Jedi. Veers couldn't speak to that one definitely. When he hesitated, Crone pressed. Since you seem fond of the man, let me make another suggestion. Send him to me. They may be looking for him in Imperial space, but they'll never think to search for him on Kuwait. Veers thought for a moment. I see. Well, I think that can be arranged. I'm so glad. Where and when should he meet your people? Hmm. I'm due for a conference on Bamora in eight days. Have him meet me then. He'd kill the man, of course, but it would be interesting to lock him up and pick through his brain in the force to see what secrets Veers had been keeping from him. I'll arrange that, Veers said. Is there anything else? Just one thing. A curious inquiry. I was wondering if you plan to make any personnel changes among your senior fleet officers. Or has that not been decided yet? Veers understand that meaning too. Their ice and fleet admiral I may have to remove from his post. Ah, do you think he's not up to performing his duty? I think there's some uncertainty about his loyalties. In fact, I have evidence implicating his family in some very questionable activities. Do you plan to go after his entire family? all his allies. To keep the Empire safe, I don't think I have a choice. There it was. 
Veers would arrest Davik Fell and go after the Jedi. They'd lost a dozen knights battling a Beleth and would be weakened, but Crone had his doubts Veers' best soldiers would be able to take them. Vermin were still vermin, and never a true match for Force users. Still, he'd alert Darth Wirelock. She'd set Sith agents on Bastion in preparation for the attack. Veers had no idea who he was truly in bed with and Krohn planned to keep it that way. Attacking the Jedi on Bastion, killing them or just driving them out of the Empire, would put the whole order on alert. But as agents said more Jedi, including their Grandmaster, had currently gone off searching for a Beleth. When Veers struck, they'd be weak and off balance, slow to respond especially given the political complications. They wouldn't break the Jedi order yet, but they could deal some crippling damage. And Krohn thought, there was on particular Jedi still on Bastion whose death would hurt the Order a great deal. She'd been the sword of the Jedi in her prime. She'd slain Darth Kedis and nearly killed Darth Krayt himself. Jaina Solo was an old woman now, no master duelist, but still a symbol of great importance. Killing her would be the world blow to the Order unlike anything since Darth Zorin killed Ben Skywalker. It took effort to keep the smile off his face. Good luck, head of state Veers. I have no doubt you'll do right by the Empire. Thank you, Chairman Rator. I look forward to speaking to you again. He turned off the transmission. Veers' consolidation of Imperial space was going according to plan, but if the Jedi could trace his connection to the false flag attack it would ruin him. Worse, they might trace his connections further, back to Krohn himself. Jevron Arches would have to take care of the rest. Unlike Veers, the Mandalore knew exactly who was employing him. He'd known since Darth Zorn revealed her true purpose all those years ago, during the Synex Juvex Rising. He'd been a useful tool, but Crone knew the Mandalorians were using the Sith as much as the Sith used the Mandalorians. In his work for Zorn and Crone, Arches had made his mercenaries more wealthy and feared than any time since the Old Republic. All of that, too, might be on verge of falling down. Chrome patched in the Mandalore's calm frequency and started the call. They were all so close to victory, and he wouldn't let Arlen fail, and his rogue Mandalorian woman ruin everything. Not a second time, anyway? Chapter 25 When they arrived at Karnareth, the Jedi found that, true to his word, Kira Esh had acted quickly and decisively. The Alliance had sent not just a medical team but an entire task force. Two corvettes, two frigates, and one medical ship hung over the planet, all of them overshadowed by a three-kilometer long Mon Calamari battle cruiser. Like most of its kind, its smooth hull was dotted with organic-looking weapons blisters, but it also sported a pair of spherical gravity well projectors artfully swelled from either wing. Clearly, they hadn't come to take risks. We're being hailed. Jade reported and glanced at the tech street out on the comm console. They identify themselves as Mon Malor. They say they've been expecting us. Good to hear, muttered Ayn Kemmer from the pilot seat. They'd taken the Jade's shadow out into the unknown regions, and Jade had agreed to let Kemmer fly her grandparents' vessel without much prodding. The Nautilin woman had been the one to see Jodrum's capture by the Sith, and had agreed to undertake a second mission to hunt a Beleth. Jade admired her bravery, but as they drew close to their destination her unease had started to show. Jade glanced at the comm readout again. They say they've lit a beacon on the surface for us to follow. Supposed to be directly beneath Mon Malor. Do you have it? Kemmer looked at her own sensors. I see it. Taking us down. As Shadow began to dive toward the planet Jade looked at the console one last time. They also say we've got a personal welcome extended from Colonel Stefan Horn. That got a roar of approval from the back of the cabin. Jade looked over her shoulder to see Lobaka blocking the door with two and a half meters of brown robes and shaggy ginger fur. Also in the cockpit, strapped into their seats, were Master Techley and the young human woman Vallis. Ahali Sarak waited with the Mortis dagger and the rest of the Jedi team as Shadow's main hold. I'm glad to see we're welcome. Jay said as he turned her attention back out the viewport. The planet swelled to fill their vision, and it looked to her like a normal enough world, with forests and mountains and plains and oceans. As they got closer she made out the gray of cities, and Shadow dove toward the heart of one such sprawl. 
Is this the city you came to before? Techly asked Vallis. The blonde woman shook her head and said, This one's different, but it looks the same. Abandoned, Jade observed as she watched the empty streets and lightless towers. Vallis nodded and said nothing. She, like Kimmer, emanated stronger anxiety than the rest. With Elena back on Asis, Rara and Master Kel dead, Vallis was the only member of the team who'd been to the Erath homeworld before. Getting close to the beacon, Kimmer announced as she circled Shadow low over the city. Looks like they've set up in the clearing. A public park. Jane asked as she spotted a rectangular patch of dried grass, maybe three square kilometers, surrounded by rusting cityscape. Lobaka trilled that it looked exactly so. As they swooped close, Jay could see a dozen boxy Alliance model shuttles had set down on the fields. Living bodies dotted the park, as well, and must have numbered in the hundreds. Surely, Jay, though, they couldn't all be Alliance medics. The com console lit up with another hail, this one a live audio link. Jay tapped the connection on and said, This is the Jedi team aboard Jade's Shadow. Welcome, Master's Jedi. A male voice said, Is the Grand Master aboard? Lobaka roared a greeting that carried from the back of the cabin. The man chuckled. I'm glad to hear it. We've got a place for you to set down. I see it, Kimmer announced, and turned on Shadow's repulsors. Setting down now. As they dropped onto the field, Jade saw, to her mild surprise, that none of the figures were wearing airproof suits. There were dozens of beings in the White Alliance medical tunics. They didn't seem to be wearing even breather masks. I'm not seeing anyone in biohazard gear, Jay said. Can we get confirmation that it's okay to step out without it? That's correct. I'll explain once you come out. Despite the assurances, Jay felt a little on edge after they lowered Jade Shadow's landing ramp and began descending to the field. Some Jedi, including Sorak, remained aboard the ship, but others went out to meet the Alliance medics including Jade, Lobaka, Kimmer, and Vallis. Techly led a team of five Jedi healers, and the Chandra fan, aged and diminutive, moved at the fore of the group in a small personal repulsor scooter. Most of the Alliance staff were medics in white, but the man who came to greet them wore military blue. It was clearly no accident that Kira Esh had sent Colonel Stefan Horn as part of this mission. While Hat hadn't been born with Force sensitivity, his father, and grandfather had both been knights, and according to Elena, he'd been a reliable friend of the Order. After shaking hands with Jade, Techly, and Lobaka, Colonel Horn said, As you can see, we've been hard at work. Horn led them across the open field. Elias' medics were outnumbered by hundreds of Erath, most of whom waited with surprising patience on spread out tarpaulins as they were ministered to. As they started walking amongst the crowds, Lobaka asked how long ago they'd arrived. Almost two days before you did, Horn said. It seems like your people are making fast work, Vallis observed. How do you know we can't be harmed? Because the disease is genetically tailored to infect Erath, Horn said. It was the first thing our medics figured out. We're on the lookout for mutations, obviously, but the virus only seems to activate when it encounters a genetic block that's unique to that species. Totally unique, asked Kemmer. That's what the medics say. The Erath are from a corner of the galaxy we've had almost no contact with and their genome is radically different from any humanoid species in the Alliance. Lobaka suggested that the virus had been specifically tailored to infect Erath and only Erath. That's definitely possible, Horn said. We have medicine that can deflate the symptoms. It's what we've been giving them here, and we've deployed similar medical setups at the other population centers, but there are sure to be many more across the planet, in the villages and wilderness. Right now we're just trying to ease suffering. Because of the strange virus and ERAT genetics is going to take our scientists time to cook up an actual cure. It's a fatal disease though, isn't it? Asked Vallis. It is. Based on the number of survivors we found in the cities, compared to estimates of original population, it's safe to say the plague already killed around 90% of this planet's inhabitants. The statistic was staggering enough. Hesitantly, aware of how bad the blow already sounded, Horn added, the disease works very slowly. Most linger on for months, even years before dying. 
is hideous, Techly said. Lobaka growled that it was punishment of the most malicious kind. Punishment that she was clearly feeding off of. Horn stopped and faced them. I'm sorry. My Sharia Wook was never perfect, but do Yao now who did this to these people? The Wookiee gave a noncommittal growl. Elena had told Esh about Abelith, but clearly Esh hadn't told anyone else, which was surely intentionally and probably for the best. Still, Colonel Horn was a Jedi son. He deserved to know the danger, and his knowing might even help them. We believe the disease was inflicted on the Erath by the leader of the raiders who'd been attacking Imperial space, Techly said. Have they once you've spoken with mentioned their former leaders? Yes. A king and queen. Horn's eyes narrowed with suspicion. He knew Jedi obfuscation when he saw it. Those are the same being in two bodies, Jay told him. You know her as a Belith. Horn's face went slack with shock. He even turned away from them, breathed out deep, and spat a curse, before composing himself. What Dreddy asked, do Yanausha's back? We know, Kimmer said knowingly. We need to find her. Horn planted his hands on his hips, breathed out again, and looked like he wanted to swear some more. Instead he said, I wish they told me this before they sent me out here. They should have told me the danger. I'm sure they're trying to keep panic from spreading, Jay said. The last time that thing was around she drove my father mad. She had him and my aunt thinking their loved ones my grandparents were imposters and tried to kill them. Lobaka roared mournfully that he remembered it well. I know. I'm sorry, master. I just wish I could have been more prepared. We killed two of her bodies at Savic 358, Jay told him. The raiders seemed to break and scatter after that. Have you seen any sign they've reformed? No. No, I haven't. Have you seen anything that might hint where she's gone? Asked Vallis. Have you encountered any Erath besides the ones on the planet? Jay said with an added nudge of urgency in the force. On the way here she and Lobaka had discussed the thing that weighed on her even more than Abelith. Jodrum was still alive in the clutches of the Sith. If they'd taken him back to their hiding place in Hapes or elsewhere he'd be impossible to find, but according to Kimmer he'd been taken aboard one of the Erath ships fleeing Savic 358. Finding where those loyal Erath had gone was her best chance of finding her husband. Horn didn't need the nudge. Actually, yes. I was going to tell you. About six hours after we arrived in system a shuttle of unknown design appeared and tried to land. When we attempted contact it tried to flee. We sent the flight of Tri-Wings to intercept and capture it. Were there Erath aboard? Yes. We have them in custody aboard Mon Malora. These ones are extremely uncooperative but aren't displaying any symptoms of the disease. That sounds like the ones from the flagship, Kimmer said. I wonder why they came back here. Must have been homesick, Vallis grunted. Or maybe their nav comps got fried. But they'd risk infection with the disease. Would they? Techly asked. Perhaps they've been provided with an antidote as of E44 the virus. Our medics thoughts of that, Horn supplied. They took samples and are analyzing them now, but there's no initial sign of it. Lobaka roared that the disease wasn't just punishment. It was to ensure that the ones who remained loyal to Abelith would stay loyal, for they had no place else to go. Colonel, Jay said, I think it's imperative we speak to these prisoners right away. Yes, I imagine you would. Horn looked around the park. As you can see, we've got our teams fully deployed here, and in the other cities. However, I will stay here with most of my healers, Techly said. We'll work with your medics and see if we can't find a cure for this disease together. Until then, we'll use the force to relieve as much suffering as we can. I'm truly grateful, Master, Horn said. I'd like to get up there and talk to those prisoners as soon as possible, Colonel, Jade said. We understand if you have other responsibilities. No, I think our medics have the situation well in hand here. They're the technical experts, I'm just a soldier. He looked at Jade Shadow, then at her. Your father's ship, isn't it? My grandmother's, if you go back far enough. The colonel smiled a little. In that case, I'm going to respectfully request you loan me a ride. 
Initial attempts to probe the mind of his prisoner confirmed what Darth Terran already suspected. Jodrum Tainer had grown greatly in the Force since they last met. But then, so had he. The application of Force Lightning did some good. Jodrum could do nothing but struggle against his bonds. He tried to push back with the Force but Terran overwhelmed him, drawing on his own deep well of anger as he'd been taught. The sizzling energy hadn't done permanent damage to the Jedi, and had weakened his defenses, allowing the Sith to sense the truth to the questions he asked. He learned quickly that there was little to know. The Jedi had realized Abeleth as their quarry only as Sevic 358. As the monstrosity herself, Jodrum only knew the stories he'd been told as an apprentice, just like Terran. As a prisoner he was next to worthless. Why Darth Avang had insisted on keeping him alive, Terran couldn't fathom. As he stood in front of his prisoner, still bound upright by the wrists and ankles the bulkhead, now slumped from exhaustion and pain, Terrett found himself wishing Avank had never given that order. During his first talk with Jodrum he'd allowed himself to be made weak by the memory of old friendship. Now, with Jodrum wounded and at his mercy, he felt a surge of disgust for the human and for the empathy he'd allowed himself to feel just hours ago. It would be so easy to kill him a thrust of the lightsaber, a twist of the neck. Jodrum was bound and exhausted, unable to resist. If Terry killed him then all that nagging memory would be gone forever. It would be like stepping through a door and closing it behind him, more firmly than any other door he'd shut since entering the path of the Sith. Avank would be displeased, but, he thought, Avank would get over it. He looked down at Jodrum at the vulnerable back of his head and neck and let one hand rest on the hilt of his lightsaber. No, he thought, something like this, something so personal, cried out to be done by hand. Then, head still bent, Jodron rasped, why haven't you killed me yet? Surprised Jar Tarrant. He steadied himself with a palm against his weapon's cold hard comfort. Do you think I mean to kill you? I think you don't. Otherwise you'd have done it already. And why would I want you alive? You don't. I can't feel that. With a groan, Jodrum raised his head so he could look into his captor's red eyes. So why don't you kill me? Are you asking to die? I'm not afraid. He said it firmly, and when Terrid reached out with the force he found it was true. The Jedi really had steeled himself for death. A respectable choice. Given his circumstances Jodrum would have been a fool to hold to hope. There was no fear in him, but there was something beneath grim resolve. The emotion resonated with the tiny twinge Terrid had been feeling within himself and trying to smother. It was regret, but not like Terrid's, not a longing for a different fate for himself. Jodrum's inner pain focused on others. Quietly, almost softly, Terrid said, I know you're married to Jade. That you have two sons and live on Fangren. That roused fear in Jodrum, but again it wasn't fear for himself, only those he loved. How did you know? It's not secret knowledge, and the Sith have ears in many places. He put on a cruel smile. We've never moved against your family, though you've left yourselves so vulnerable. But that can always change. Do you expect me to thank you for that? It wasn't my decision. The Sith hadn't moved against Jade and Jodrum like they hadn't moved against Alana D.J.O. or a dozen other prominent Jedi, and all for the same reason. All their actions were directed by Darth Krait, that sleeping Dark Lord, whose dreams and demands flowed through Darth Wirelock. She always insisted they wait and build their strength in secret before revealing their full power to the Jedi. Lords like Avang and Kika followed her guidance resolutely, but Terry knew he wasn't the only lord who was impatient with her conservatism. Restraint was not the way of the dark side. The force was for breaking chains. Somebody ordered is greater than you to keep me alive, Jodrum grunted. He didn't deny it. As he looked down at this man Terry yearned to kill him, just so he wouldn't have to see all the buried years in his familiar eyes. Then Jodrum asked, do you want to hear about Jade? Terry jerked back a full step. Jodrum smiled tiredly at the reward, just as he could read the Jedi, so the Jedi could read him. Indignant rage came easily. Terrace summoned a ball of force lightning from his hand and flung it at Jodrum's chest. 
The Jedi wrenched in his binds as the energy danced across his body, but he didn't go tear at the scream of pain he'd been hoping for. The Jedi was using the Force to reduce the pain. He was stronger than Terrett had thought. When the Jedi lifted his head next there wasn't the smugness or defiance Terrett had expected. Instead his eyes had gone tired and sad, and even as his limbs twitched with residual pain he breathed, Oh, Warren, I'm sorry. That is not my name. And save your sorries for Jade and the sons who'll never see their father again. I'm sorry for them. I'm sorry for you too. I wish, I wish I could have been just a little faster, a little better back then. I could have saved you from what they've done to you. Shared memory well between them, the last time they'd been together, the fight on the world ship over Malador. Darth Keekit had overcome Jodrum's defenses and swung a killing blow. Terrid the boy he'd been had thrown himself against his friend, risking his life to push them both out of the way. They survived, but Jodrum's arm had been cut clear off. That had left only the Chiss boy and Arlen fell to battle Kikik. But for the flail of a limb or an extra step, it could have all been different. I've become what I've become, Terra said firmly. There's no point in regret. Jodrum looked him in the eyes, studied his face, fell for him in the force. He didn't believe it. Terra wanted to kill him more than ever and sent another burst of force lightning into Jodrum's chest. The Jedi tried to defend against the pain but Terrid attacked him with another burst, and this time Jodrum's mouth creaked open and released a cry of agony. It was good. Terrid blasted him a third time, savoring the pain as the Jedi's defenses wore down. A few more shocks, stronger than before, would start to savage his internal organs, fry his brain, stop his heart. And with Jodrum dead the buried memories would be dead too, and everything of him and Jade would be gone from Terra's life forever, and he'd truly become what he'd irrevocably been forced to be, a Lord of the Sith. An invisible shove knocked him off balance. He staggered to one side, steadied his footing, and turned with rage and sizzling hands to see Sarissa Lore standing at the chamber's open door. I told you not to interrupt, he shouted. Darth Avank has arrived. The happen woman snapped. He wants the Jedi alive. It was like another slap, but this time Sarissa hadn't needed to use the Force. He'd allow spite and envy for the child he'd once been to consume him, derail him from the problem of Abella. He wanted to lash out Sarissa and Jodrum both, the girl for embarrassing him, and the Jedi for witnessing his shame. Instead he gathered his dignity and asked, Have we docked with Intruder? It's just entered orbit. They're moving to couple airlocks now. I figured I should tell you before you killed the prisoner. Terra stifled his anger and looked back at Chadrum. The Jedi was limp in his binds, eyes closed, and seemed to be calling on the Force for some healing trance. At this point it did no harm to let him. So Sarissa, he said, thank you for the reminder. Come, let us meet Darth Avonk. She stared at him like she was evaluating him anew. Then she said, yes. We don't want to keep him waiting. She turned and walked out the exit without looking back. Terrett, with greater effort, did the same. When they took off in Jay's shadow, they left Techly and all her healers behind save one, an advice named Ellen Ranto. On the ride up to Mon Malora, Colonel Horn prodded them with more questions about Abelith, including who fought and beaten her bodies at 7358. Kimmer and Vallis fielded those questions. And when Horn saw how unpleasant the memories were for them, he thankfully stopped pressing for details. Mon Malora was what Jade expected it to be, a giant slab of clean new war waging technology, the best the Alliance had to offer. Its crew, as she could sense through the Force, didn't seem especially agitated or worried by their mission. She envied them their ignorance. Colonel Horn summoned a security team that led them to the detention block. The Erath prisoners pinned behind force fields, four to a cell, had rainbow sheen skin undamaged by the scars and swelling that marked the plague. When Jade, Lobaka, and Vallis walked into the chamber they instantly stood to attention. It was hard to tell with their insectoid multifaceted eyes, but it seemed like their focus was drawn to the lightsabers dangling from the three Jedi's belts. As if to confirm it, Colonel Horn said, that's more than they've ever shown our people. If you wait a minute, 
the interpreter droid will be here. That's okay. I can handle Cybisti, Vala said, and Jade heard the unspoken mostly. Horn and his guards stood to the side, but alert as the three Jedi approached the nearest cell. Vallas began speaking to them in the traitor's tongue, and Jay tried to read these beings' force auras, but they were as difficult and alien as those insectoid eyes. A voice snapped from the adjacent cell. Vallas walked over to the Erath standing close to the force field, watching the Jedi carefully. A few words were exchanged and Vallas said in basic, he wanted to know if we were Jedi. I told him yes. Lobeka asked how they knew about Jedi. Valis relayed the question, then translated the answer. They said their Queen of Night told them. Abeleth, asked Horn from the door. Abeleth, Jay confirmed. Do they know where their queen is now? When Valis translated the question, Irath from other cells started snapping angrily in a language that sounded different from Cybisti. Valis, confused, repeated the question. The lead Irath said something angrily, and Valis shook her head. They don't want to give an answer. That means they the answer, Horn said. Lobaka told Vallis to ask why the Irath had come back to their homeworld if they knew it was infected with the plague. When she relayed that one the prisoners went sullen and most looked away. Jay thought she sensed some kind of collective regret. An Irath from a third cell called out something. Vallis translated, he says they were weak. They felt the queen calling them, but they wanted to see home again. Lobaka rumbled that it was not their home anymore. They betrayed their own race to genocide in favor of their monstrous queen. Vallis didn't translate it but somehow the meaning seemed to get through to the Erath. A few lowered their heads as if in shame. Jay stepped over to the one who spoke in last. He slumped against the wall of his cell, barely upright and close to the force field. Jay looked straight at him, held those alien multifaceted eyes and tried to touch him more deeply in the force. She fell into that place that required surrender, and through surrender gained strength, and falling she fell a little closer to the mind of this creature, this pawn, this victim who killed so many in ruthless devotion to an abomination who demanded worship. She felt the shame and weariness and regret, and she felt the lingering hold Abeleth had in his mind and the minds of all the other Irath who betrayed their race for her monstrous glory. You're free of her. Jade whispered, and let the meaning of her words flow through the force. You're free of the things she made you do? Reject them, and you can choose your freedom. It wasn't really true. Nothing could erase the sins these prisoners had done, and nothing could ever rebuild the Erath civilization that Abeleth had shattered. But she wanted them to believe it for their sake and for the sake of the mission. For the sake of her husband, who was very possibly now on Abeleth's world. The prisoner in front of her had nothing else to believe, and through their empathic bond he understood the meaning behind her foreign words. In creaking Cybisti he spoke. It didn't seem long, only a few sentences. Whatever his words were they made the other prisoner stir as though in recognition, but none tried to stop him, and none shouted him down. When he was done, Jade and Lobaka turned to Vallis. The young woman said, is a single world orbit in a star located above the galactic ecliptic, straight toward the rim from here. They say we can't miss it. I'll get our nav people looking right away, Horn offered. Thank you, Jay said, and looked at the Erath still wilting shamefully against the wall. Thank you. Without even the force, the prisoner knew what she'd said. He nodded, just a little. By the time the Jedi followed Horn, and the guards into the hall, the colonel was already on the comp to the bridge, telling Mon Melora's crew to begin looking for this rogue star. As soon as he flicked off the comlink, he spun on them and asked, Any idea what you will find when you get the planet? Lobaka shook his shaggy head. Jade added the silent hope that her husband would be there. You just brought one ship full of Jedi. I'm sure they're fine knights, but you'll probably need more than that if you're hunting a Belif. Are you offering something? Asked Jade. Horn spread his arms, encompassing his little hallway, and the whole huge ship. I was given broad latitude to accomplish my mission. I don't expect a major threat to this planet, but I'll keep the frigates and corvettes here to watch over the medical teams. Lobaka trilled that this wasn't necessary, but Horn shook his head. Respectfully, Grandmaster, 
you're going to need all the help you can get. He was right, of course, and the Wookiee reluctantly nodded his assent, then his thanks. Mon Malora was a mighty ship, and his presence should have made Jade feel confident. Instead, for some reason she couldn't name, it only increased her sense of foreboding. Intruder and the Erath shuttle coupled airlocks and moved together in orbit over a world of swirling greens, whites, and blues. It was, according to sensors, the only planet around this lonely star, lifted high above the galactic plane so that the surrounding space seemed to be a great, starless night. They met in the Erath shuttle for the space it provided. Once they'd reached their destination, it had been no effort to flush all of the captive crew out the airlock. The other Erath ships that had fled Sevic 358 had paid that no notice. They dived eagerly down to the planet below, and while Terrid had occupied himself with the prisoner, Sarissa had examined the surface with the shuttle sensors. It's a warm planet, lush, she told the three Sith who stood around her. We're detecting ruins of some kind on the surface, but there's no sign of active technology. Where are all the Erath landing? Asked Avomp. They all seem to be vectoring toward one location. A large cluster of ruins on the south shore of the northern continent. Then she is there, his Darth Kikid, quiet until now. That seems likely. Avank looked at Tarek. How is the prisoner? He resisted interrogation, but was not badly damaged. He was afraid Sarissa might interject and tell Avank the rest, but she did not. Perhaps she was saving it for when he wasn't present. He asked the Keshari. What purpose does he serve alive? He knows next to nothing. All he's heard of Abeleth are rumors, legends. I'm sure you know more. And I will tell y'all all I know in time, Lord Tarrant, Avank said warningly. There's only four of us, and we don't know what she's doing down there, Sarissa said. You can't be planning to face her. Not alone. Darth Melth and Darth Anexer are leading another group of Sith here, but they have a long way to travel. So we wait. Terran asked. We wait and we scout. He asked Sarissa, are there any signs of sentient life outside that cluster of ruins on the coast? There's no sign of high technology. It looks like this planet has been abandoned for a very long time. Thousands of years. Perhaps it was a wreck of the world, Kika suggested. They were active in this space, but so were the Kwa, the Gri, and other races we have no names for, Avang said. It may be this is an old Erath world. Something must have drawn a Abeleth all the way here, said Tarrant. It's remote. Hard to get to, Sarissa said. Perhaps she just wanted a place to hide. No. I think there is more than that. Avang's brows drew together and thought. The only way we will know for sure is to get close to the surface and begin scouting. We have two ships, said Tarrant. We can bring this shuttle to land like the others while Intruder follows in our shadow. You would be bait, perhaps, Kikit said. Sith do not shirk from danger, Terry glared. Avank opened his mouth to say something but an alarm pinged in the cockpit. Sarissa went in first and the others followed. The Happen Princess had proven surprisingly adept at learning the insides of this alien ship, and when she looked at the sensor console her face immediately fell. What is it? Asked Tarrant. She breathed deep. One Mon Calamari cruiser had just dropped into orbit. It's massive. The Alliance? Asked Kikit. The Jedi. Avank sounded only mildly surprised. I didn't expect them to find this world so quickly. You knew they would get here. Tarrant stared. I knew they were coming and I knew they might reach here before our backup arrived, the Keshari said. You understand why I wanted you to keep that prisoner alive, Darth Terrett. What do you plan on doing with the Jedi? What do you think? Abeleth waits for us both below. I don't suppose the Jedi will kindly hold until more Sith arrive. They have the advantage which means we have to negotiate. He turned to Sarissa and said, Send a message. Tell the Jedi we wish to meet them on the surface of the planet for a parlay. Tell them we have a prisoner we are happy to release as a sign of good faith. The surface of this nameless, lonely planet seemed to jade an endless sprawl of flat green, tall grass, and clusters of gnarled trees that rose from swampland that stretched back miles from the ocean. 
When she stepped out of Jay's shadow, the first thing she noticed was the salt in the air, then the clamminess, then the heat. Then she turned and looked at the giant ruins rearing out of the landscape, kilometers away and half-faded in the thick air but still staggering. Some looked like the elegant mile-high towers of Coruscant had half sunk into the swamp and slanted almost to toppling. Others looked like curved scraps of wreckage that had fallen from the sky on a gigantic scale. It was like nothing she'd ever seen before, and she couldn't imagine what ancient race had created them. She couldn't bring herself to care about the mysterious makers. As the Erath shuttle set down 30 meters away from Shadow and the Alliance Troop Transport Colonel Horn had brought down with them, she couldn't even bring herself to care about the Sith that were apparently aboard. She could feel, just barely, their presence aboard the ship but their life force felt dim compared to the bright, familiar clarion that was Jadra. She reached to him, and he reached back. She tried to tell him everything would be all right now that they were together, even if she couldn't actually believe it. He wasn't comforted. He was trying to warn her of something. She couldn't tell what. The others were taking no chances. She lingered beside Grandmaster Lobaka and Ahali Sarak beneath Jade Shadow's nose, while a dozen other Jedi placed themselves between Jade's ship and the Sith's. Two dozen Galactic Alliance Marines had disgorged from the troop carrier and spread a circle around the Sith shuttle. Several of them, Jade saw, carried shoulder-mounted grenade launchers and dropped to one knee so as to better aim shots out of the meter-tall grass. Colonel Horn himself remained at the carrier, where two dozen more soldiers stood at order. Everyone watched the Sith ship. As they waited for the landing ramp to open low back a growled, very quietly, that he only sensed a handful of Sith aboard. And Jodrum, Jade whispered, I know he's these. Warm, heavy wind blew across the plain. Grass danced around Jade's waist. Finally, with a clank and a hiss, the shuttle's landing ramp extended. The Jedi ignited their sabers and the Alliance troops hefted their weapons. The ramp's end dropped into the soft dirt and for a long moment nothing moved. The first set of feet came into view, black boots, with the rim of a black cloak flowing around them. Even as that figure came into full view another followed, much larger, with bare-clawed reptilian feet. They stepped out into the sunlight and their faces became visible beneath the hoods of their cloaks. One was a violet-skinned humanoid. The other was a bearable with savage red and black tattoos across his face. With a shudder, Jade remembered hearing of the Sith who fought Arlen, cut of Jodrum's arm, and killed Warren all those years ago. This Sith and Warren should have died together. The shock almost distracted her as the last two figures stepped down the ramp. Her eyes immediately fell on Jodrum. His hands were bound in front of him and his steps were long and haggard but he held his head eye and his eyes met Jade's across the distance. She stepped out from under Jade's shadow and made her way through the grass to the front of the formation of Jedi. Ann Kemmer and the advice healer, Ellen Rando, stopped her from reaching him, but she was close enough to make out the sweat that pasted messy blonde hair to a face darkened by faint bruises. She saw his eyes, too, and the sadness in them. She didn't understand and tried to funnel relief to him in the Force, but the sadness didn't go away. Jodrum shuffled a few steps to the side, giving Jade a clear view of the final Sith. Two red eyes glowed beneath his hood and daylight showed the blue skin of his gaunt, stern, half-familiar face. Her eyes darted back to her husband who nodded once, I sadder than before. Understanding staggered her. She tried to reach out with the Force and touch this Sith who was worn, but he ignored or avoided her entreaty. She barely noticed the lavender-skinned Sith step forward until he was just a meter outside striking range of three Jedi blades. He had no weapons in his hands. Instead, he pulled back his hood to fully reveal his face. In full sunlight, Jade could see the black tattoos lines on his cheeks and chin, which added a savage flavor to his appearance but did nothing to take away from his attractiveness. She recalled what she'd heard about the race called Keshari, handsome and violet skin, who'd been part of the lost tribe of the Sith. My name is Darth Avonk, the Sith said. His voice was deep, smooth, dignified. May I say it is an honor to meet the Jedi Grand Master in the flesh. Lobaka roared from beneath Jade Saber. Valis began, the Grand Master says. I know what the Grand Master said. 
Thank you. Avang's smile showed small white teeth. He may be interested to know that his race does not have adepts solely among the Jedi. That sent a ripple of disquiet through the assembled knights. Lobaka stepped forward, leaving only Ahili in the rear. The case containing the Marath dagger was strapped conspicuously to her back, and though Jay doubted the Sith knew the case's meaning, they must have been curious. As Lobaka stepped between Jay and Kemmer, he roared a request. Avonk, still smiling, replied, Of course. With me are Darth Kikit and Darth Tarrant. Tarrant. She couldn't help looking back at the Sith who had been worn. In his harsh glare there was some echo of the driven, self-punishing chess boy she'd known. Lobaka's next roar was a demand. Avank nodded and gave a little wave. A handless push shoved Jodrum forward, past the Sith line. Jade, the only Jedi besides Lobaka without her saber drawn, rushed forward and caught Jodrum in both arms. He let himself fall, let his bigger body press against hers. Oh, Jade, he whispered, facing her hair. You shouldn't have come. She helped him stagger back away from the Sith. The healer Ranto was immediately beside them, and the Advos began running his hands over Jodrum's body, sensing for damage. Not so bad, Jodrum said, though his face was a wince. No broken bones or anything. Just a lot of force lightning. Was it worn? Jade whispered. Tear it. Call him Tear it. She glanced back at the Sith. Worn, Tear it, whatever he was, he remained where he'd been. So did the bearable. Kick it. Avank and Lobaka had stepped within a meter of each other, both his hands open and visible. Avank was saying, you know why we're here. It's the same reason you are. Abeleth is here, and she must be destroyed before she can wreak more havoc. Why should we believe you? Kimmer snapped. Your kind partnered with her before. They did, and they paid the price. Avank scowled. Abeleth ravished my parents' homeworld. I know more than anyone that she must be stopped. Jay stepped away from Jodrum for a moment. She had to say her piece. Your kind also made an alliance with Grandmaster Skywalker back then. You betrayed him repeatedly. I was told a slightly different version of the story, but I won't deny there were betrayals. The Keshari said, You should also remember that 50 years ago she was defeated by two working as one, the Dark Lord of the Sith, and your grandfather. Jade Flinch. She'd been living in peace for a full decade, leading her own life with her husband and sons, and still these Sith knew who she was. Well, of course they would. There was no escape from being a Skywalker. Lobaka gave a suggestion. Before Avant could respond, Kemmer grabbed the Wookiee's shaggy arm. Grandmaster, are you sure that's a good idea? I'm willing to take him up, even with conditions, Avant said. A lightsaber fell from his cloak sleeves into either hand. The Jedi tense but neither ignited. He held both weapons out. The saber in his right hand Jade didn't recognize, but the left weapon was Jodrum's. Lobaka called the right saber to his hand, then hooked it beside his own. Jade picked up Jodrum's and called it to her. That done, Lobaka waved an arm. The two remaining Sith stepped back toward their ship. The Jedi shifted carefully away from the Grand Master, never taking their eyes off him. Colonel Horn's troops stayed exactly where they were, rifles and grenade launch trained and ready to fire on signal. When they had enough space, Lobaka and Darth Avang stepped closer to speak in low voices. Wind rustled grass and erased even the murmurs. Jay turned back to her husband, who was still on his feet as Ranto finished examining him. The damage is not severe the healer said, but he needs rest. Jade sidled close to Jodrum and let him lean on her. His weight and warmth and firmness felt good. She'd been afraid she'd never feel them again. She passed his lightsaber back to him, and he hooked it onto his belt. As they watched Lobaka and Avank inaudibly confirmed, she asked, was he the one who captured you? Did you talk to him? Did he? Jade, please, he whispered and squeezed her around the waist so hard it hurt. She tore her eyes back to the chiss. She could barely see his blue face over the rim of his hood now. Like everyone else, his attention was on the Wookiee and the Keshari. He wanted to know about Abeleth, Jodrum breathed. I told him all I knew, since it wasn't much. But Warren, 
Tarid, did he ask you about you? About us? He didn't ask. But I think he wanted to. That bearable, he was the one who cut off your arm, wasn't he? That's right. And I guess he captured Warren all those years ago. She couldn't image what kind of horrors the Sith had inflicted on the boy they'd known to break him into being one of them. Looking back, Warren had always had a streak that was independent, willful, and proud, traits not always best in a Jedi, but it staggered her to think that those qualities had been warped enough to turn him into a Sith. She remembered his despondency and guilt after Darth Zorin had killed Master Jalu, and his gnawing need to punish the Sith for what they'd done. Jade, he whispered, you came all this way to fight Abella. Don't you have more? We've got a Mon Cal cruiser in orbit too. But Jade, it's Abella. Your grandfather? Almost died fighting her, and that was with the Dark Lord's help. I know. But we've got a secret weapon this time. See that Duro over by Shadow? She's got something special. Do the Sith know? I don't think so. I doubt Lobaka is telling them. Jade, we can't team up with them. We can't trust them. She recalled what her grandfather had done 50 years ago. This isn't about trusting them. This is about using them. Like they use us. That's what it looks like. Jade, this is a bad idea. I can't. You're not doing anything. You're going back to Jay's shadow so Ranto can put you in a healing trance. He squeezed her tighter. I'm not letting you go out there alone. Not when you've got Sith on one side and Abeleth on the other. You're in no shape to fight. I feel better already. It's not like. A loud Wookiee roar sounded across the plain. Lobaka stepped back among his people, Avang to his. The Keshari, Jade noticed, had his lightsaber again. It is decided, Avang announced for the everyone to hear. Jedi, Sith, Alliance, will all work Tajathur to destroy Abeleth. Lobaka held his mournful agreement. Jade felt the discord ripple through the Jedi, but kept her eyes on Darth Tarek. His head titled just a bit so he could look at Jade and Jodrum across the grass. When their eyes met, he turned away, hiding his face again, but just a second of those blood red eyes glowing in the shadowed hood made her shudder. Oh, you shouldn't have come, Jodrum repeated. I'm so sorry. It's all right, she lied, then told truth. We'll do this together. This is the only choice we have. Chapter 26 Marin Fell had been told Mandalorians valued nothing more than family, but she'd heard it from a woman who left her own daughter to be raised as a Jedi, so she'd never known what to make of that idea. She'd never known what to make of her mother either. Being on harm's way with Tamar and Dorne, and Nene was making things a little bit clearer, but she still felt far from everything she'd ever known. They were apparently on their way to the Korak system. Marin hadn't heard of it and according to her mother there wasn't much to hear, other than that it was lightly settled and a popular hideout for Frenchers. Dorn had gotten a message from one of the contacts who tipped him to Auchis and Galisette's activities in the first place, and he said he wanted to meet in person to give them new information. It was a long way to Korax, so Marin had plenty of time for the awkward task of getting to know the family she'd never met. For her mother, nothing was awkward at all. Tamar interacted easily with her cousin Dorn. Marin watched the two of them slip into conversations in almost all Mandoa when they thought she wasn't paying attention. Her mother smiled easier. It was a kind of sharp, wry smile, but it was there was there was a light in her eyes Marin had never seen when her mother visited the Jedi Academy on Bastion. She didn't know what to make of Dorn, who was technically some kind of second or third cousin but effectively her uncle. He gave off the air of being tough and taciturn, grizzled and gray even though he wasn't super old. He spent a lot of time taking apart, cleaning, and putting back together the impressive collection of weapons he kept in harm's way storage locker. Marin didn't know how to talk to him. Nanette was a little easier. She was only a little older than Marin, less than a year. The family resemblance was plain, even though Nanette was a little leaner with a darker complexion. She had that obsessive, punctilious need to keep care of her armor and weapons as her father, which Marin supposed was universal to soldiers and mercenaries everywhere, not just Mandas. 
The second day after leaving Broken Moon, Nanette found Marin in her small guest cabin and said, Can I borrow your lightsaber for a minute? Marin didn't know what to say. She kept her saber with her jacket and pulled it out carefully. What do you want with it? I just want to try something. Like what? Bring it. You can do it yourself. She waved for Marin to follow, then ducked out of the doorway down the hall. Marin followed the other girl to her own, larger cabin. She had her armor draped out on a stretcher and standing over as she told Marin, use your lightsaber on it. I want to see what happens. Marin gripped her weapon uneasily. Isn't Beskara supposed to be impervious to lightsabers? Nanette planted fists on her hips. I've never fought a jet above. I want to see if this material is as good as I was promised. And if it's not, then I beat Theosic out of the huge one that sold it to me, Nanette said, matter of fact. Marin didn't know all the words, but she got the gist. She ignited her lightsaber. Nanette watched the gold white blade extend without expression. Marin held it over the armor but didn't bring it down. The other girl heard hesitation and said, it's fine. It won't shab with your saber like Cortosis. I know that, Marin said. Cortosis was a very rare, very expensive material, even more than Besker. Good for the Jedi on both counts. She held her saber over the breastplate of Nina's armor and flicked the blade down. It hissed against the metal. The metal kicked back in the way she wasn't used to getting from anything except another saber. Normally her weapon sheared through anything with an ease that was frankly scary. Nanette crouched down and ran bare finger dips over the armor. Marin crouched too. She saw a straight, shallow mark where her lightsaber had hit the Besker, but the material was impressively resistant to her weapon's energy and heat, just like her mother always claimed. Nanette nodded, satisfied. Glad to see I got my money's worth. Your armor looks nice. Marin touched the smooth material. Nice. Nanette arched a brow. Probably not a Mando word, then. Um, tough. She nodded, a little better. I've always wanted to test it. Your boor doesn't like to break out her saber, for some reason. Marin had a decent idea why. Her mother was descended from a Jedi, and she trained as a Jedi, but she never felt comfortable acting like one, and that included using a Jedi weapon. Marin knew her mother was good with one. She'd seen her spar with pretty able duelists and hold her own, but she still preferred a blaster. You don't have anyone else in your family who can touch the Force. Marin asked. Not a one. Nanette stood up, so did Marin. It's not something we look out for or try to cultivate. I know. Marin's hand flexed on the shuttle saber. Her palm was sweat slick against his hilt. I just thought that if it showed up for my mom and her sister, it would have shown up for more. I know the Force doesn't always pass down by blood. My uncle can't touch it at all, but still. I thought there'd be more. Nanette regarded her. How much do you know about our family? Our family, not your? It stunk strangely. A little. I know our great-grandfather could use the Force, and I know he was a pretty important figure on Mandalore. Kataka, they called him. Little Sword. The Sword of the Mandas, like they used to call your Babur Sword of the Jedi. He said we should stay on Mandalore and rebuild and stop fighting outsiders' wars. He got a lot of people to listen to him, too. Marin knew that. It was why the Mandas and Jedi had stayed out of each other's hair for a generation or so until all just took over and put them back on the warpath. I know his mother was a Jedi in the Old Republic. His father was a clone. That's right, Nanette said, except I'm not descended from either of them. You and your booer? Yes, but not me and mine. Oh. Her mother had told her once that you could see the old clone genes if you knew what to look for. The sharp nose, the black hair, the slightly dark complexion. Marin and Tamar had those things. Nanette had the Mareso. Nanette sighed. You booer didn't tell you anything else. We haven't talked about it much. I don't see her that often. Marin passed her saber to the other hand and wiped the damp palm on her trouser. Nanette walked over to a stool, sat down, and crossed her arms over her chest like a disappointed teacher. My great-great-grandfather was a clone too, but he didn't marry a Jedi. 
His name was Ordo, and he married an accountant. Marin blinked. An accountant. Right? Toughest Shabla number cruncher in the Old Republic's tax department. After the Empire took over, they fled to Mandalore, along with a bunch of other clones who were deserting. Most of them got trained by a Mando drill sergeant named Cal Scurata. It's where the name comes from. Cal Babur and his deserters had to stay on the run for a long time. A lot of good people died. I'm sorry. Marin didn't know what else to say. This was all ancient history, over a century old, but Nanette spoke like it was personal. That tone wasn't totally unfamiliar. Many Jedi talked the same way when thinking of Palpatine's Great Purge a century ago, even though only a few old alien masters like Kekruk had been there personally. The Empire tried to squash us. A lot of Mando factions did too. But we're still here. What about Alchus? Ninnit Scowl made her look so much older. We've had better Mandalore and worse ones. He's basically teared down everything Katika worked for so he's not popular in my family. Your boor hates his guts. I know. She could see it in Tamar's eyes. Feel it in the Force. It was a hate she reserved for nothing else. It was more than just hating what he'd done to the Mandos or her grandfather's legacy. For her he was the source of her exile, the reason her life had gone irrevocably off track. My boor and I, our other relatives, we mostly keep to ourselves nowadays, Nanette went on. Some mercenary work. Some bounty hunting. A lot like your boor, but our paths don't cross much. We lay low. Sometimes things get dirty. Marin sighed and switched her saber back to her right hand. It's all pretty different from Jedi school. Ninnit snorted softly. You ever use that thing in a fight? No. Sparring, yes. But never for real. Cautiously, she asked, have you ever been in a real fight? The other girl's expression went hard. She uncrossed her arms, gripped the sides of her stool, and leaned forward a little. This one time I was with my boor and a few of his vote. We got hired to rob this storehouse, planted on the outer rim. You haven't heard of it. I hadn't until we went there. We got past the perimeter guards. Get inside the facility. When we got to the package, we found he had a bunch of higher guards waiting. Big tough guys with lots of armor and guns. What, no mandas? So we got in a fight. My boar went ahead. I stayed back to cover him. Laser shots were flying everywhere. I heard people screaming. Marin thought on her simple sparring matches with Vitor, the terrifying chaos of the riot and Ravlin. Those sounded like nothing compared to this. Nanette went on, merciless. When they realized we had Besker, and their blasters weren't doing Asik against it, they started using Vibro Blades. I saw this big checker lunge at my boor. He was right behind him, with the big Vibro Blade up high, ready to stab through the neck. I knew what I had to do, so I took aim, and I shot. Took his Shabla head off. She snapped her fingers. Nothing but smoke and ash passed his neck. Marin breathed deep. She didn't know what to say or even feel. Nanette leaned back on the stood and said, That's what we do to survive, GD. It's not what I'm used to. You might have to get used to it. I thought Korax was supposed to be safe. Maybe, maybe not. She nodded at the laid out Besker. Better be prepared either way. On the ride out to Korax, Tamar sporadically checked the news nets for the latest from Imperial Space. No fresh attacks from the raiders, which was good. Head of State Veers was implementing new emergency security measures that included a full-scale planetary lockdown of Kaylee, drawing even more ships from the Third Fleet. He'd authorized creation of a new department aimed at rooting out suspected terrorists, separate from the armed forces or police and answerable directly to the executive power, which seemed to Tamar like a disaster waiting to happen. They had no clue who'd hired Archis and company to stage a false flag attack on the Chiss, but as Marin had pointed out, imps were the likely suspect. As Tamar understood, Veers had been the moth at Yagaminer, but he had an intel background before that. He might have been the type to hire mercs to start a war between the Chiss and the Raiders, it could easily have been the intel director himself, or some rogue officer acting on his own, with corporate backing. She could only hope Doran's contact gave them information that could point the way.
There was other news coming out of Imperial space, also not encouraging. She caught one bit where two talking heads argued back and forth over unconfirmed leaks claiming that, at the Battle of Kaylee, the Jedi had allowed the Grievous to flee the battle zone despite being nearby and having the opportunity to fire on it. One talking head claimed it might have been an unfortunate error in the heat of battle, the other cast aspersions that maybe the Jedi had allowed the Grievous to escape. A third blabbermouth joined in and claimed to have heard another leak that the order to let the Grievous run had come directly from Admiral Davik Fell and had been carried out by the Jedi Master in command of the closest ship, his brother Arlen. And the worst part was, she could almost believe it. Not the part about Davik. He'd always come off as the good soldier, ultra-loyal to the Empire, and willing to make the hard choices. But Arlen would let the ship flee, acting out of some instinct for mercy, or a flash of Jedi intuition. In fact, as she remembered his face, and shielded Force Aura after learning about what the Grievous had done, she did believe it. He'd listened to empathy or whispers from the Force, and held his fire, maybe even against Davek's orders, and because of that act of generosity, they'd all been dropped deep into Asik. Oh, Arlen, she sighed. Yusuf Sheb Shabuire. You ever called him that to his face? Dorn said from behind her. She jerked upright in the co-pilot's chair. Knock next time you come in? It's my ship. Dorn dropped into the pilot's seat. Wanted to run some checks. We're about 30 minutes out of Korax. Should get interesting soon. Right? What set you off? Just thoughts. How's Marin? You can't ask her yourself. I have. Her answers never get past three syllables, for if I'm lucky. Teenagers. Funny for him to say. Her cousin had been there to raise Nanette as a good tough Mando girl every step of the way. Dorn had been playing up the confused parent act since she'd come aboard, but she knew he and Nanette had a close bond, the kind she definitely didn't have with Marin. Seriously, Tamar said, what do you make of her? Dorn flipped a few switches, checked a few systems, and finally said, very Jedi. You're too cruel. Not saying that as a judgment. It's what she is. What her boor raised her to be. Tamar still felt judged. Boor meant father and mother both. What was I going to do? She was three years old when we decided it couldn't last. I couldn't do merc and bounty hunter work with the kids strapped on my back. She was safer with Arlen. It was the right choice for her. Sure. Dorn worked the console a little more. Tamar drummed her fingers on the armrest. How are the others? Craggle. Mecker. Giant. All hanging in there. Curious about you, mostly. They know about this mission. A little. They know you're with me. Marin, too. Tamar grunted. It had been years since she'd seen some of her cousins. It felt strange enough introducing Marin to two relatives she'd never met before. Throwing her into the middle of the whole Shabla clan would be too much. The simple fact was that the girl was a Jedi. Simple as, she'd never be a real Skarata, that was that, even if the rest of her clan might politely pretend otherwise so mother and daughter could save face. Normally Tamar could keep herself moving and pretend she wasn't living a pointless garbled mess of a life, but it was especially hard on this mission. Funny for Mando, for whom family was supposed to be everything. You probably shouldn't stew all the way to Korax, Dorn said. Better get you kit and get ready. Right? Tamar pushed out of her chair. I'll make sure the girls are suited up too. She checked on Marin and Nanette first. Dorn's kid was already inside her red and white biscargum and checking her weapons. Marin had no such suit to slip into, but Tamar helped her strap on a few extra plastic plates fitted for Nanette's torso. Marin threw one of her cousin's heavy sweaters over the armor, obscuring it, and a civilian jacket over that. According to Dorn, their set-down location was going to be cool enough for a teenage girl in bulky clothes to go around and not attract attention. Armored Mandos drew eyes wherever they went, which was why the plan was for Marin to go ahead through the spaceport first, acting as a scout and then a shadow to make sure nobody else was trailing Tamar, Dorn, and Nanette. When they sat down on the planet, things went like they were supposed to. The landing zone was a honeycomb of recessed pads walled off from each other. 
There was only one gate to get to each pad, but the security barrier didn't look very sturdy. Dorn passed the spaceport manager an extra bribe to keep harm's way safe, which also allowed Marin to sneak ahead unseen and begin exploring the streets. The port was two-thirds empty, and the town looked half a century past its prime. Snow flurries whirled through the air and stuck to white patches and building shadows and ditches and dusty, mostly unpaved streets. Everyone walked fast, head low against the wind, in a hurry to get someplace else. They all cleared out fast for the three marching mandas. Charming planet, Tamar set into the private line that connected her with Dorn and Ninit's helmets, plus the short-range earpiece Marin wore. Why are we meeting your friend here again? Krem Salvak runs a smithy back on Mandalore, her cousin explained. He's got a storehouse here. Some kind of special ore they mine in the mountain outside town. We're well outside of Mandalorian territory, the net said. It should be a safe place to meet. Hopefully, Tamar grunted. See anything, Marin? No tales except me, the girl said. Do you three know where you're going? I do, said Dorn. Industrial area. Coming up on our right. Keep following, but keep a safe distance. When we get to the location, stay a block away. We'll keep the channel open so you'll hear everything. Got it. Grim determination was strong in Marin's voice. She was overwhelmed and confused by all this but she'd soldier on and do what she had to. They kept calm silence for a while after that. Dorn led them down empty lanes between high-roofed warehouses. Many of the metal building sides were scarred by rust, others were dented, and a few buildings outright collapsed. Yet in the end, Dorn led them to one that looked intact and reasonably secure. Tamar could see a few holocam emplacements near the entrance and at the corners, which she assumed were in operation. Marin, she called, are you with us? I am. I think I can get on top of the building caddy corner to your warehouse. It's abandoned, but there's a ladder to the roof. Good. Get up there and stay low. Listen, but don't do anything unless we tell you to. Understood. Got it. Good luck. As Marin's line clicked off door and announced, Get ready, people. We're in. The side door to the warehouse creaked open on old rusted hinges. They found themselves looking back at a Mandalorian with battered gray armor and incongruous red highlights around the T-visor of his helmet. The Mando waved for them to enter. Doran went first, then Nanette. Tamar scanned the alleys around them before going in. Everything was deserted. When she stepped inside, she found they were under the broad roof of a massive storage chamber. Metals molded into sheets, and beams were stretched out across heavy racks and stacked four layers high. Didn't realize you had such a large operation, Dorn said on his helmet's external speakers. Not the sort of thing you brag about. Salvak reached up and removed his helmet, revealing a dark face with the light scar slanting over the bridge of a once broken nose. Don't want to have to spend more on security for this place than I have to. What do you use? Tamar asked, scanning the chamber. You can probably see automated turrets, some patrol droids. Nothing too expensive. Looks like a decent setup. Dorn was the first of them to take off his helmet. Nanette followed, and a little hesitantly, so did Tamar. She kept the audio feed running from her bike so Marin could listen into the conversation. But if her daughter had to alert her to something, she'd have to use the force. Salvak waved them toward a small room to the side of the main warehouse. It looked like a drab office you find on industrial sites galaxy-wide. Data cards and even hard paper volumes were piled on the small desk. Salvak went to an old cabinet and pulled out a bottle of something clear as water but surely alcoholic. Sharing something super strong with your guests was typical Mando hospitality. Salver fetched three small glasses from the same cabinet and asked, You're at a cat drinking too. Nanette opened her mouth but Dorn clamped his daughter's shoulder. Three's fine. Salvak put his shot glass on the desk. They put down their helmets. As he raised his glass, Salvak told Nanette, Sorry I didn't get anything for you, at last. Didn't know you were coming. Nanette simply nodded, bristling a little at not being treated like a full grown-up yet. The others tipped back and swallowed. It burned hard, even for a Mando drink. 
What the shab is this? Dorn coughed. Local delicacy, if you can call it that. Salvat grinned and shoved the bottle back in his cabinet. Okay, ready to get down to business? Very, said Tamar. She was no stranger to strong drink, but it felt like it was already rushing to her head. Salvak placed his hands on his hips. So I've got to ask, how did that lead to Broken Moon turn out? We've got information, Dorn said, guarded. The other man no chuckled. I, I get it. You're playing things close to the chest. Not that I blame you. What do you have for us? Asked Nanette. If you'd have us fly all the way to this hole, it's got to be something, added Tamar. Right you are, lass. Salvak reached into his desk, fished through the drawer, then tossed out a single data card. Dorn took it. What's it got? Audio copy of a conversation I had with the guy who was part of Ox, mission to the unknown regions. Did this guy know he was being recorded? Tamar's words slurred a little, surprising her. Fear fact, that drink had been strong. No, and he never will. Just like I never gave you this message. Understand? Very, said Dorn. For a second he wavered on his feet. He had to put a hand to the desk to steady himself. The drink was getting to him too. Wanna tell me what's on it? You're gonna wanna listen to it yourself. Salvak seems smooth and steady. But basically, he tells a very dramatic and probably accurate story about an attack on one of those raider hives. Dorn stared down at the data card, frowning. Tamar frowned too. Her vision swam a little. She steadied herself with a hand on Nenna's back. The girl said, I this that what archers went into the unknown regions for. Apparently. Didn't tell me who hired them, though. He didn't. Asked Tamar. Something wasn't right. Salvak had either got an info on another Mando mission they hadn't heard about. Dorn grunted, that ain't what happened. That wasn't what happened. That drink wasn't alcohol. Salvak had set them up. It all came to Tamar in an instant but in her adult state an instant was too long. Suddenly they were there, three fully armed and armored Mando warriors bursting through the office door. Dorn went for his gun, too slow. Salvak grabbed his arm twisted it, and threw him face first and hard onto the desktop. One of the newcomers slammed his shoulder plates into Tamar's chest, throwing her against the wall. Nanette hadn't been drugged so she moved faster, whipping out a Biscar short knife and going at two of the newcomers like she could slip it in their ribs. She was good but they were two big strong men, as she was just a teenage girl. One punched her in the stomach, bending her over, the other grabbed her wrists, twisted the knife from her hand, then pinned her struggling body against his broad armored chest. Chacker. Dorn snapped. Set us up. I'm sorry, Savak grunted and didn't let Dorn go. They didn't give me a choice. Don't be too hard on him, Skarada, someone new said. He was just being loyal to his mandolin. Tamar knew that voice. Even though they drugged her, even though she hadn't heard it in person in almost two shabla decades. Archa still had the same silver and green armor. It had picked up more pox and scars in all those years, but it was clearly the same set. At his shoulder was a shorter, stouter figure in violet armor. Galaset, probably. Jevern Shabla Archis, Dorn hissed. For Marin's benefit, Tamar realized. What brought you all the way out to this hole? Four buddies, too. I couldn't get more. Ox ignored him and tilted his visor toward Tamar. Been a long time, Darman Dejiti. Tamar remembered, Marin listening in on this conversation, bleeding confusion through the force. The lightsaber in the hidden compartment at her belt. Her captor had pinned her arms behind her back, but she didn't need hands to ignite or throw it. She'd never be a real Jedi, or anything close, but she'd picked up tricks she could do even with an adult mind. She reached out with the force, felt the button to her great grandmother's saber and pressed it down. A blue beam of light stabbed down from her hip, scraping against the Besker leg plate of the man behind her. It took him by surprise, his grip weakened. Tamar wrenched one arm free, grabbed her saber, and lunged forward. Her captor held tight to her other arm, holding her out of reach from arches, but she used the force to fling it, a pinwheel of deadly light, 
right at Hate's object. The Mandalor sidestepped. The saber skimmed across the shoulder of the Mando next to him, then tumbled into the storage chamber beyond. At the same time, Gallus had pivoted on his heel, raised his pistol, and popped off a single impeccable shot that caught the spinning lightsaber in midair and burst its metal body apart. The saber's wreckage spilled across the Duracrete floor. Pain of loss stabbed Tamar's heart, but Ninette was already moving. She managed to wrench partway free of her captor, swipe an arm low, and grab the Besker blade she dropped on the floor with an underhand grip. As her captor pulled her back up, she brought the blade with her and jabbed it hard into the man's thigh, slipping around his armor plate, digging deep into muscle and arteries. Bright red blood spurted out. Run! Doran shouted above the screams of the wounded Mando. Go, go, go. Nanette was a smart girl. She knew there was nothing she could do for her father, not here, not with five stronger commandos still able-bodied. Tamar gave her the only help she could, a shove with the force that knocked Alches and Galaset back. Nanette grabbed her knife with one hand and sprayed covering fire with her pistol and her other, and she sprinted for the exit. Nanette, go! Dorn shouted, and Tamar reached out to her daughter in the force. Telling Ninus escape fine, Nanette, protect Nanette, both of you get out of here if you can go, 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 go. Then something hard collided with the back of her head, and that was all. Marin felt her mother's thoughts stop suddenly, like her consciousness had been extinguished, but there was no pain with it, just a sudden halt. Her mother was still alive, she had to believe that, just like she needed to act, right now, to help Nanette. Relate audio and Tamar's four sensations had told her enough. She scrambled across the slanting, broken rooftop of the abandoned warehouse across from Salvox Place. There were still no Mandos outside and she'd seen none enter. Ox and his men must have been waiting inside from the beginning. The door burst open and Nanette sprinted out, armor on, no helmet. Laser blasts flashed through the doorway and a few panged off her besker not hurting her but throwing her off balance. Marin watched as two warriors burst out of the warehouse and ran after her. Marin didn't know what to do. She could ignite her lightsaber, jump down, try to take on both armored men at once, but even with surprise on her side, she'd probably just get herself killed. But she had to do something. She ran across the edge of the roof, keeping pace with the Mandas as they chased Nanette. The building she was on was falling apart. At the far end, the ceiling had caved in, leaving a weak and freestanding wall. That was it. She's used the force to move objects before, and to speed or slow her own movements. She never tried it on anything this big before, and never in a situation this desperate. It was all she could do. Just as the man Das reached the edge of the building, she crouched, grabbed the edge of the crumbling rooftop, and swung off it. She hurled herself feet first toward the freestanding chunk of wall. Her boots impacted, she pushed with all her body, with the force. The wall moved beneath her, tipping over, falling into the street. She wasn't sure what happened next. Smoke and dust filled the air, blinding her, choking her lungs. She sprawled across hard metal and then across dirt. She heard muffled swearing but she couldn't tell from which direction. Then a hand grabbed her arm and pulled her upright. Nanette said, thanks for the save. Let's move. They ran without looking back at the broken wall, the Mandos, the place where their parents were prisoners. Chapter 27 By the time Damien Cor got the chance to speak privately with now head of State Veers, he had so many questions piled up in his head he was afraid just opening his mouth would make them all spill out. Why he spent the past week guarding Admiral Hallis' body was a minor one compared to what Veers planned now and what he'd really known about the Kalish attack that had killed the previous head of state. Ascension seemed to have made Veers a more generous host. He had two glasses of Entralin wine ready the moment Damien walked into his office aboard Invincible. After Everest's death, he'd moved fast from Yaga Minor to Bastion, but he'd barely set foot on the capital surface instead turning the guest salon into his base of operations. Supreme Commander Hallis had spent more time dirtside, tackling tricky administrative duties after passing command of the First Fleet and his new superstar destroyer to his most senior vice-admiral. 
that Invincible itself had not moved to the border regions as promised was starting to raise eyebrows. But Veers had publicly insisted he wanted to keep it at the capital for now to reassure Bastion citizens after the terrifying Kalish attack. Likewise, he'd insisted that, despite being nominally civilian, the head of state should not cower in a bunker but instead be on the front lines of the battle to defend the empire from threats inside and out. Damien also wanted to ask how much of that Veers really believed, but the entrailing wine stoppered his tongue. You've done an excellent job watching over Hallis, Veers told him. Needless to say, you've been my best operative all around. I can't begin to count the number of Imperial lives you've saved. Thank you, sir, Damien said, but protecting Hallis was easy. He was never under threat. Of course. But naturally, we must ensure the safety of our supreme commander after what happened to poor Derrickin. Veer sipped his wine. So did Damien. They stared at each other across the desk. There was more than that, and they both knew Damien wanted to ask, despite his loyalty, despite all his professional training. Damien hadn't flinched at doing a lot of possibly objectionable things in the Empire service. The false flag attack on the Chiss hadn't caused a pang of conscience. They were aliens, he was human, and if their deaths helped by thousands of Imperial lives, which they had, then there was no question of correct action. Yet if Veers had any involvement with the attack over Bastion, even if he'd just been warned of it and let it happen, well, he wasn't sure how to feel about that. He never liked Avers much. Derrickin had been a respectable administrator but uninspiring. None of that mattered at the core. They'd been lifelong servants of the Empire, assassinated by aliens. He'd been as enraged as anyone by their murder. He wasn't comfortable with this kind of doubt, and though he could hide it from most people, Veers had known him long enough to see through every shield he could put up. But Veers, it seemed, wasn't up for that confrontation. Instead, he took another drink and said, Agent Cord, I'm afraid I'll have to pull you from your assignment protecting Hellas. Another mission? Not exactly, Veers sighed. I've been informed by a close alley that your past activities have attracted attention. He sat upright. Which activities, sir? The ones initiated at Broken Moon. He grasped his wine glass hard to keep it from shaking. And whose attention? My alley was unclear. But it seems the Jedi may be involved. Veers was looking at him hard. They both knew what happened to spies who became liabilities, and Damien bleated with uncommon panic. Sir, I've done nothing wrong. However, this this security leak happened. Veers lifted a hand. Don't worry, Agent Cord. I'm not getting rid of you permanently. Relief made him dizzy? Thank you, sir. What will you do? I'll send you on an away mission. Far away. To Bamora, specifically. If you leave now, you should be able to get there in five days. Now he was confused instead of scared. Bamora? Why there? When you arrive, there will be a lovely convention going on for members of the military industrial complex. Among them will be a certain Kuwaiti shipbuilding magnate whom you've already met. I'm supposed to stay with Retor of Qvolt. It was his idea, actually. We both agreed it was best to get you safely out of the way, for Nor. When this crisis passes, you can be retrieved. You're a valuable asset, Agent Court. I'd rather not lose you permanently. Damien knew how much easier it would be to shoot him here, and now. Veers was a good leader, the kind who valued his men. He felt ashamed for his suspicions a moment ago. Thank you, sir. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. But one request, if I may? Go ahead. My wife, sir. Valera. She's down on Bastion, and she's pregnant. You want to be secluded with her. If possible. Veers finished his wine glass. I'll talk to Retor and see what I can arrange. But you're still leaving no matter what. Thank you, sir. I want to. Veer's comlink buzzed. He plucked it from his uniform. He still wore a moth's olive greens and checked it. Emergency hail from Hallis. How interesting. Do you want me to leave, sir? No. I think I know what this is. But step to the side, please. Damien got to his feet and moved outside the viewing range of the hollow transmitter in the bulkhead. Veer stood up, straightened his uniform, and brought the comm unit to life. 
The half-sized image of the Supreme Commander appeared in front of him. Head of State, something important has just happened, Hallis said. The news nets haven't picked up on it yet, but it's only a matter of time. Then explain succinctly. Of course, we have reports of another alien rising at Tuyage Colony Worlds in the Carrion Sector. The same region as Kaylee, Damien thought. After Everest's assassination, the Third Fleet had landed a full-scale occupation force to subdue the planet. Though ANN and the other networks were reporting it as a mere police action, Damien had heard that the situation on the planet was turning into a large-scale ground war, with bands of Kalish fanatics waging guerrilla attacks on occupation forces in the name of the New Martyrs. By keeping news off the networks, Veers had clearly hoped to keep the alien insurrections from spreading, but that strategy had failed. The news seemed to wear Veers down. What damage have they done so far? The Imperial picket fleets over both planets have been destroyed. We've lost contact with all our security people on the ground. But nothing in the Yaga system itself. No. I've ordered all the fresh status reports stay classified. Good. Detail units from the Third Fleet to restore order on both planets. Send down full occupation forces like we did on Kaylee. An admiral. Place all other alien majority planets in that sector on lockdown. One star destroyer, at least in orbit over each. The third has already committed a quarter of his ground troops to Kaylee. This will draw them out then. Do whatever it takes to keep the carrion sector secure. And look at drawing ships from the first to help. I'll start right away. The second fleet could assist. Veer shook his head. We need to keep our presence in the Yaga system strong. We don't want the natives getting ideas. Yes, of course. I'll look at redistribution from the first. I'd like to keep Invincible at Bastion for now, Admiral. The situation in the Carrion Sector needs to be settled quietly, and I want our citizens to keep their attention elsewhere. Keeping the ship at the capital will assure them all as well. I was thinking the same thing. Excellent. Is there anything else? Not for the moment. I'll put the third into action immediately. The holo shut off. Veers exhaled deeply and sagged against his desk. It was a messy situation, a complication that could spiral out of control and inspire even more alien uprisings inside the Empire, but it looked as though they'd acted early enough to contain them. Damien knew the thought was presumptuous, but it seemed like Veers was taking it a little hard. Then the head of state breathed in deep, stood up straight and looked like a strong leader again. He told Damien, I knew it would come to this. I didn't expect it to happen quite so soon, but no matter. We'll just move up the timetable slightly. What do you mean? You know, Agent Corday, if I weren't putting you straight into lockdown when you leave this room, I wouldn't tell you a thing. He swallowed. Very prudent, sir. When we start smashing out insurrections by the subhumans, do you really think Admiral Fell is going to watch us wreck the legacy of his alien lover father? Do you think his family and the Jedi cult will? Half the Fourth Fleet got smashed by the raiders, and the Jedi are so few. Two cultists were enough to destroy everything Palpatine worked for. We can't forget that, even if everyone calls them heroes nowadays. And half the Fourth could still wreck the First or Second Fleet beyond repair. Sir, you're talking a civil war. Admiral Fell is a patriot. To the Empire his father made, not the one we're restoring. He's a dangerous element and we can't risk him running free. It was a situation that could get very messy. Veers was clearly hoped that by starting the confrontation, taking Fell and the Jedi by surprise, he could end it fast. For the good of us all, sir, I hope you know what you're doing. For the good of us all, I hope so too. When he'd called in favors and gathered as much information as he could, it became clear to Lucas Briggs that he had to make a choice, and he had to make it right now. He still didn't know the contents of those crates Malkin had shipped in from Yaga Minor, but his inquiry with a friend in personnel management from Infantry Division had yielded interesting results. Biographical summaries for the full roster for the 221st Infantry Regiment took a while to go through. Lucas wasn't able to copy the data from his workstation, so he stayed late in the office yet again, reading everything over. After a few hours, the picture became clear. 
a normal regiment had a healthy mix of soldiers. They'd be selected to mix a wide range of training, experience, and specialties to create a combat unit that was flexible and an atmosphere where older soldiers could learn from young ones. The 221st was different. Every soldier profile Lucas reviewed, and he looked through over a hundred summarized a veteran with combat experience fighting pirates, or, more commonly, in security settings. Even most of the low-ranking privates had been imported from local police forces. The profiles also listed specific unit history, and most of them seemed to have been drawn from a half-dozen other regiments all attached to the Yaga Minor Yards. Soldiers transferring from one of the Empire's twin pillars to the other wasn't odd at first glance, but that they'd been gathered from such a small selection of units was. He did further checking and saw that more than 50% of the soldiers in the 221st had been transferred into the regiment within the past four months. That was a staggering amount of personnel swapping in a short amount of time. The only thing comparable that he'd heard of had been gathering staff for Invincible, and that was the Empire's new flagship, not a security detail that wasn't even supposed to see action. There were only two ways to find out what the 221st was really here for. One was to ask Holmes Malkin. Lucas had barely talked to his old Sarge over the past week and had kept the conversation as superficial as possible. If Malkin hadn't let anything slip so far, even after all their nights out drinking, he probably wouldn't furnish much now. The second way was the one that had beckoned from the start. He needed to see what was inside those crates. There was no good way to handle that, given that it was his job to know what was in them already. If he requested a construction droid go in and cut off that unbreakable lock, he could claim they slipped past his notice thanks to a computer malfunction, but that would lead to systems checks that would out his lie. If he admitted what he'd done, and why he'd done it he's tank his own career and Malkin's too, even if his old Sarge had done nothing wrong and right now Lucas had no proof otherwise. His mind whirled around different bad options until he realized none of that mattered. He didn't have to go through proper channels to cut open those crates. There was another way. It was only on check-in that he learned the majority of the Jedi Knights who helped the Fourth in his recent battles had gone back to Bastion. About a half dozen still remained, including Davikfell's wife. She and the Admiral had moved their quarters off the Makati while it was repaired and Lucas took the admittedly brash step of finding their new place and getting there before the Yars chrono hit morning hours. At exactly 0530, the Admiral's security droids escorted him to the cabin entrance and buzzed for his attention. Lucas stood awkwardly, hands curled to Tin's fists at his side, and waited for the door to open. He hadn't seen Miragia Valter fell in a long time, but he recognized her instantly, the small build, the thick dark hair that fell into her face the coolly evaluating eyes. She was dressed in a white, vaguely antique-looking tunic that he recalled was typical of Jedi. She looked him up and down and asked, Can I help you? There was a further question in her eyes. He was familiar, but she couldn't place him. Thank you for seeing me, Jedi fell. I'm Major Lucas Briggs, Quartermaster Corp. Still the question. He added, I was on Voidwalker, Jedi fell. I see. Is there something I can do for you, Major? The Admiral's already left for the day. I was actually hoping to find you. There's something I was hoping you could help me with. Three minutes of explanation later, they were on their way. He left out the bit about Malkin and his own role in getting those crates smuggled aboard, going instead with the inexplicable computer error cover story. He realized halfway through that a Jedi might be able to sense he was lying but plowed on anyway. It was too late to turn back, and whatever she thought of him, Maragia seemed interested to open those crates too. She didn't throw on one of those monastic Jedi robes as she left, but the white tunic still drew an uncomfortable amount of attention, to say nothing of the lightsaber bobbing on her belt. She ignored the looks, and Lucas tried his best at the same. It was a long way from the habitat section to the storage chambers, but she didn't ask questions on the way. They needed the droid to guide them through the maze of crates to the right ones, but once they'd arrived Lucas explained how the locking mechanism permitted no entry from anyone except Colonel Malkin of the 221st. Maragia raised a brow. Do you know Malkin? Major Briggs. Damned Jedi saw through everything. No wonder people didn't trust them. 
he decided to skip the details and get to the core of it. He's a void walker. That was enough. It said a lot. After what they'd all been through 17 years ago, it engendered the strange, strong trust that had brought Marasia here. It had also, Lucas reflected, got these damned crates here as well. Since we can't open the crates ourselves, Lucas said, we have two options. One is to request a construction droid to cut it open with a laser saw. But I thought you might be quicker. She rested a palm on her lightsaber. Major, do you think the security of the Yars might be at risk? I wouldn't have come to you if I didn't. Without a word, she ignited the pure white blade. It flicked, flashed, and cut a perfect circle through the side of the crate. She raised her free hand, palm out, as though to beckon the section she'd cut. With the jerk it tore free of the rest of the crate, moved through the air by invisible grip, and sat down on the floor. Without acknowledging his stare, Mirasia shut off her saber and hooked it back on her belt. Do you have a glow lamp, Major? Ah, yes, I do. Lucas plucked it from his pocket and turned the light on. He stepped through the hole and into the cargo crate. She followed right behind him. He didn't know what he'd been expecting, but it wasn't this. There was some heavy-duty armament, including E-Web tripod guns and shoulder-mounted missile launchers plus riot control shields like Malkin had described. Most of the space was taken up by racks of stormtrooper armor, though it wasn't like the stormy whites Lucas had worn. When he shined his light across the chest plates and helmets, they had a copper-colored tint and a strange rainbow sheen, like he'd seen on rare metals he couldn't place. He ran his fingertips over the dome of a helmet. It was polished but a little rough to the touch. I've never seen armor like this, Lucas said. Never even heard of it. I've never seen the armor, but I know the material. Her voice was grim. Major, have you ever heard of cortosis or? Heard of? Never seen. Is very rare, very expensive, and very resistant to energy weapons. More than resistant. If a Jedi lightsaber strikes it, cortosis causes a feedback loop that short circuits the saber and disables it for up to a few minutes. I've never heard that before. It's not something we advertise. He turned his light on her. Are you saying this armor is to fight Jedi? Instead of answering, she said, let's check the other one. As they stepped out to repeat the process on the second cargo crate, Lucas flashed his light over the racks of Cortosis armor and did calculations in his head. As Mirasia cut a hole into the second crate, he announced, I think there were about 240 sets of armor in there. Definitely not enough for a full regiment. No, but if this crate has the same, it would be enough for a battalion. This time, Mirasia went through the hole first. Though once she got inside, she stopped in her tracks. Lucas shone his light over her shoulder, revealing a few more crated heavy weapons, a few more riot shields, and rows of racks for holding up stormy armor. Unlike the last crate, all these racks were empty. Lucas called their guy droid over and asked, can you tell me when the lock on this crate was last open? Or is that classified too? The droid hovered over to the locking mechanism and inserted a sensor probe into the device. His dull voice said, this lock was last open 4.65 standard hours ago. He spun around. Maragia was already behind him. They must have opened it up in the middle of the night, he said. Why didn't they take the rest? I don't know. Maybe they didn't think they'd need it. How many Jedi are in the yards right now? Seven including me. They wouldn't need 200 suits of Cortosis armor just for us. Her face drew tight in honest confusion, but it was instantly clear to Lucas. Maybe this wasn't clear to her and her husband, but in the eyes of most Imperial citizens they were one and the same, the young Admiral and his Jedi wife, dual face of the modern Empire. You dealt with one? You dealt with the other. You need to calm your husband, Lucas said. Right now. Watching Corrine Veer's sudden ascension had been terrifying enough. Then Davik had received the call from his brother. It was something he'd been dreading not even for what Arlen might say. His actions at Kaylee has exploded from a disagreement between brothers to a tipping point in Imperial history, and he didn't want to even begin to talk about that over the comm. What they talked about instead had been even worse. 
Arlen had explained, as succinctly as possible, what he and his ex-wife had gotten at that smuggler's nest they'd visited and attached a copy of the file to his data stream. He summarized it before giving Davik a chance to sit down and watch the recording but even knowing what to expect the sight had chilled him. As Arlen had said, there was no proof at all that the human meeting that Koreshchen Mandalorian was an Imperial agent. He put his fleet intel people searching for a Halcyon Blackmer but the name had surely been an alias. The holo recording was of poor quality, trying to match the voice print or facial structure to existing computer records of Imperial personnel would be hard, even ignoring the very limited access Davik had to ISB files. The only certain thing was that the Chiss ascendancy had been deceived and drawn into a war. He considered sending a copy of the message to his aunt Wen, but there was nothing to be gained by inconclusive evidence. They needed to find this man who called himself Blackmer, wherever he was, and get the truth from him. Arlen had promised he was on his way back to Imperial space, but he was coming from the exact opposite edge of the galaxy. In the meantime, his ex-wife would use her Mandalorian contacts to search further. When he'd asked where Marin was now Arlen, looking somewhere between embarrassed and regretful, admitted he'd left his daughter with the Mandalorians. Davik had judiciously refrained from comment. These revelations were just one thing he'd have to look into. Potentially more explosive was the information that had dragged him from his bunk at 0500 hours. When he joined Devlin Yeager in the Vice Admiral's office, they immediately started reviewing the snippets of information his Fourth Fleet intel people had picked up, mostly passed along unofficially by some counterparts in the Third. Davik already knew that the counterterrorism actions on Kaylee were spiraling into a full-scale ground war, but reports of widespread violence on two Yage colony worlds in the same sector, and a similarly harsh response from elements on the Third, took him by surprise. There's nothing on this from the news nets, Jaeger told him. They must be keeping a tight lockdown on information. System-wide jamming fields? Probably. If they crack down harder it could incite more Yage colonies. Maybe even Yaga Minor. What is Veers doing? He was their governor until last week. He knows those shipyards can't operate without Yage crew. If he's decided we can't trust them, then he's decided we can't trust any non-humans. They make up almost 50% of the Empire's population. 50% of our citizens. He's begging for a civil war. Jaeger coughed politely. Isn't that a little extreme? Also, the military is over 80% human. Senior officers, 95%. Yes, what not all 95% of them think hysterically cracking down on every non-human citizen is the right thing to do. Right, Devlin? Jaeger sighed. You know I agree with you. But if we let those colony planets secede, we'd... A buzzer sounded. Jaeger flicked on his intercom. Who is it? A visitor request to speak with Admiral Fell, sir. The voice of his Zabrak ate quavered nervously. What visitor, Lieutenant? Davik asked. A Colonel Malkin, sir. It took him a second to place the name. A Void Walker, once a stormtrooper, though not one attached the fourth. He would have remembered that. Send him in, Lieutenant. Davik pushed himself out of his chair. To Jaeger, he said, I assume this is important. I assume. He was on. Voidwalker, right? Razor Company. Jaeger got up too and walked with Davik to the door. They keep showing up everywhere, don't they? You know what they say? You can't keep a good man down. Davik unlocked the office door, letting it whip open. He found himself face to face with a big bearded man in a colonel's uniform. He looked like he had about 50 kilos and 10 years on Davik. Behind him, standing in rows, Filling the corridor leading to Jaeger's office were over two dozen stormtroopers wearing strange armor made not of white plasteel but some slightly rough, bronze-tinted substance. Davik had a very bad feeling about this. He forced himself to look at the Hulkin officer. Are you Colonel Malkin? Yes, sir. 221st Infantry Regiment. Admiral, I'm here to place you under arrest. On whose authority? Jaeger snapped. Malkin calmly held up a data pad. You'll see the signed authorization from Head of State Veers, along with a list of charges. Davik grabbed it and started skimming. 
The list was long and couched in legal jargon, but Malkin summarized it aloud. Admiral Fell, you are charged with treason against the Galactic Empire and complicity in the murders of Neela Avaris and Zach Derrickin. You are charged with aiding the insurgents during the Battle of Kaylee and assisting the Grievous in his murderous attack. You are charged with leaking critical military intelligence to the Jedi against specific orders by Supreme Commander Derrickin. You will stand on these charges for a military trial overseen by Supreme Commander Hallis and Head of State Veers. Do you understand these charges? He handed the data pad back to Malkin and said as firmly as he could, Is anyone else he's being tried? A warrant has been issued for Jedi Master Arlen Fell. Since he is said to be outside Imperial space at this time, they've also been issued for several other senior members of the Jedi Order. It was hard to keep the anger in now. My wife. My mother. That's correct. Are you arresting my sons too? Jaeger put a hand on his shoulder. Admiral. He shook it off. Colonel Malkin, what are your immediate orders? You're to be taken to Bastion to prepare for your trial. I'm also going to leave a division here at the command section. We have a few questions for Vice Admiral Jaeger. Before Jaeger could interject, Davik asked, who's to command the fourth? Vice Admiral Nevis, sir. The most senior one, Davak thought. Probably not part of the conspiracy, but someone whose loyalty they thought they could trust. He didn't know how much of this had been planned, whether Veers was stealing an opportunity to get rid of an opponent or whether the engineering had run deeper. Maybe everything the Grievous incident, the attack on the Chiss, even the damned raiders themselves had been part of the same long con. Or maybe it was a mix part pre-planned design, part opportunities grabbed when they passed. Either way, he'd been outplayed. In his short-sightedness, in his grief for his father, he'd allowed himself to be beaten by people bent on destroying what Jagged Fell had built. It took all his effort not to reach out and snap Colonel Malkin's neck. Instead, he held his hands out, waist high, and said with quiet rage, let's get it over with. Malkin stepped aside so two Stormies in bronze armor could snap stun cuffs on his wrists. Then they started marching, down the hallways, past the workstation so his crew could stare in shock at the Admiral with cuffs on his wrists. There were docking ports for shuttles and troop carriers near the yard's command section, but Malkin clearly had humiliation in mind. They marched him through the public promenade so as many as possible could see him and gawk. All the while he had two bronze armored troopers on either flank, two full rows behind and two ahead. He was getting really curious as to what that armor was, but there was no point in asking. When they finally got through the public spaces, they reached the main docking section. As expected, Malkin had a ship ready, a standard type stormtrooper transport with room for half a company. Two dozen more stormies, all in that bronze armor, were gathered around it, waiting for them. Malkin didn't slow down. He marched Davik and the rest of his men across the flight deck. Davik felt small relief at not seeing Mirasia here. Hopefully she finds some way to escape her pursuers, maybe to contact Bastion or Arlen and warn them. For him, though, there's be no escape once he stepped on that transport. His wide-open boarding hatch was like the mouth of a grave. As he stared at that dark portal, his eye caught something else, something small and dark falling, barely visible against the blackness of space seen through the hangar mouth. Then a globe of fire appeared from nowhere, swallowing the whole upper half of the landing craft. The thermal detonator's explosion was gone just as fast, but the cripple transported bellowed smoke and fire into the hangar. Then alarms started wailing and a wind rushed around them. The smoke from the transport furled in black curtains toward the hangar mouth and dissolved into space. The containment field around the hangar wasn't completely down. If a portal that size opened to the vacuum, they'd all be swept out in an instant. The intensity of the field could be modified, though, someone was weakening it, draining the chamber of his atmosphere without flushing them all into space. Before Davik knew it, Malkin grabbed him by the back of the neck and hauled him toward the portal through which they'd entered. Two Stormies were already there, banging on doors that wouldn't open. Get charges, Malkin shouted. Blow the damn thing. Before they did anything, the sound of laser fire filled the hangar. 
Davik saw Blue Stun Blast rain down and ducked low, out of Malkin's grip. The colonel tried to grab him but a body fell from nowhere, impacting his chest feet first and sending him skidding across the deck. A white lightsaber ignited, sharing off the rifle barrel of the two nearest stormtroopers. Muragia threw the men back with a burst of force energy, then bent low and grabbed Davik's arm. Ready? She called, and without waiting for an answer she leaped high into the air, dragging Davek with her. He was no Jedi. He wasn't used to being propelled up ten meters in half a second, and his stomach felt like it was slamming through his hips. Then he and Miragia both landed hard on a metal catwalk that spanned high over the flight deck. There were a few other Jedi there, batting back red laser fire from below as a few more Stormy's white armor. Blue stun blast fired down on Malkin's troops. Are you all right, sir? Called a man in Major's bars, vaguely familiar. Davik nodded, still dazed by it all, and watched as Miragia cut his stun cuffs apart with a flick of her lightsaber. Come on, she yelled. Fall back. Davik had enough sense left to push himself up his feet and run for the upper level exit. The Jedi, the Major, and the friendly stormtroopers followed, and when they'd escaped the Major sealed the doors tight and said, We're clear. Good, Maragia said. Pump out enough atmosphere to knock them out, not kill them. Already on it. Davik leaned against his wife. Great timing. Thank you. Thank Major Briggs. He warned me. They've left troops with Jaeger. You have to free him too. And... I already sent Knight September and Mulk with the company of Stormies. It's taken care of. No. You don't get it. This is all Veers, and he's just starting. He's going after the Jedi. He squeezed her arm so hard she winced. He's going after her sons. The cast around Viter's arm had been off for less than a day, and he'd already gotten restless. Part of that was because of the dream he'd had the night before. He hadn't remembered much except red lightsabers, figures in dark cloaks, and cold rain. But the sense of claustrophobic panic lingered after waking. He couldn't just sit around after a dream like that. Both the medical droids and the Jedi healer at the Bastion Academy had told him not to use his newly healed arm for anything strenuous. His grandmother had warned him too, and while he normally obeyed whatever Jaina told him, in this case he made an exception and found someone to practice sparring with. Another reason he was anxious was because of Marin. He'd heard nothing about his cousin since she went off with her parents to the far side of the galaxy. Since building their lightsabers together, they'd practiced dueling against each other more often than not, and sparring with someone new left him another kind of anxious. Kajin Alar was a year older than him. She was taller than Marin, with longer limbs and a longer reach. The way she moved her feet was unlike Marin's steps. She didn't have any of the tails in her eyes body language, the force that sometimes let Vitor predict what his cousin would do next. It was very aggravating to fight her but it was also a challenge. He tried to keep that second part in mind, especially as other young apprentices gathered to watch this practice lightsaber duel he really shouldn't have been doing in the first place. His little brother Roan was one of the first to show up. Their cousin Morgan appeared not long after. He was worried one of the adult trainers might come in and scold him and that was another aggravation that kept gnawing. After less than a half hour of dueling, Alar had beaten him four straight times. The 15-year-old had good control, even when she got beneath Vider's defenses and jabbed her glowing silver saber tip close to his chest or neck and never touched skin or clothing. After the fourth of her wins, she pulled her weapon back from the side of his neck and shut it down. Vitor needed the break too. He reached out with the force and called a water bottle to his hand, drank, and tried not to be obvious when he looked around and counted the audience. Almost a dozen apprentices, some younger than him, some older. His grandmother'd get word of this one pretty fast. Without reigniting her saber, Alar asked, Well, do you want to try one more time? Vitor tried a smug grin. Sure. I'm finally warmed up. Fine. Your punishment. She rolled her eyes and thumbed her saber back on. Vitor did the same, but as they took their initial dueling stances, the door behind them opened and two sets of boots clattered into the hall. Busted, he thought. Everyone, get up, Reckon Schultz said. 
Dare Sand was right behind him and added, gather your things and come with us. The apprentices looked around, confused, and started to rise from the benches. Sand added, hurry everyone, and lurched forward to grab his son Trace by the hand. What's going on? Asked Ron as he started for the door. We'll explain later, Schultz insisted. Come on, now. Vitor fell in along with his brother and Alar behind him. The herd of apprentices followed Schultz and Sind until they reached one of the gathering area. There were a bunch of those in the academy, and it registered to Vitor that this specific one was deep inside the pyramid, maybe the one furthest from the academy's outer walls. The space was packed with over 30 people. The hollow projector was on, but instead of the INN broadcast or sports game Vitor, was used to see in there was a three-dimensional projection of the academy's pyramid and the surrounding areas. Vitor and Ron followed close and dare sense wake and wedged their way to the middle of the crowd. Their grandmother was on one of the soft sofas, the only person in the group not standing, but like the rest of them she emanated nervous energy. Vitor looked at the hollow display again. It wasn't just of the pyramid. Red blocks surrounded the structure on all sides. A few more red marks circled in the air. Vitor was the son of an admiral, and he knew what representational tactical holos looked like. There was only one thing this could mean, though his mind beggared at the thought. The Jedi Academy was under siege. To confirm his dread, an insert holo popped up beside the tactical display, a feed from one of the Academy's exterior cams showing the mass of tanks and stormtroopers. It was hard to tell for the holo's blue tint. But those troopers looked like they were wearing different armor than usual. Instead of smooth whites, the plates had a rougher texture and a different color tone. Brown, perhaps. Is this everyone? Jaina asked Sende. The knight nodded. Except for the ones at the perimeter. That's good enough. The old woman looked over the group. Young knights, younger apprentices. She was the eldest person in the room by over 40 years. That alone would have been enough to command respect, but that all knew that Jaina Solo Fell had been part of this academy from the beginning. If it weren't for her, there'd be no Jedi in the Empire at all, and even before she'd invested over half her life in this place, she'd been a legendary master who'd won wars and slain Sith Lords. The rest of the Jedi saw her as that, for Rome and Vitor, she was that and more. When she spoke, she spoke plainly, the academy is under siege. An entire armored division deployed directly from Invincible. They've said nothing except that every Jedi is supposed to exit the Academy without weapons and surrender to their custody. We have to assume they're acting on orders from Veers. Roan looked at the ceiling, as though he could see Invincible hovering ominously above them, and Vitor realized with the chill that if Veers was moving against the Jedi on Bastion, he was surely doing something against their parents at Bobringi. Jaina went on, we will not surrender, but against that many tanks and stormtroopers, we can't fight either. This academy has defenses, Alar said. We have shields, we have guns. Not enough to beat what they've brought, Sin said. We never expected something like this. Maybe we should have, Jaina sighed, and Vitor could feel regrets roll off his grandmother. But we can't change things now. We can only do what we must to defend the Jedi Order on Bastion. Reckon. Schultz put a hand on the hilt of his saber. Yes, Master. You're going to come with me? We're going to talk with the General out there. Vitor wanted to bleed an objection, but Jaina looked around. I need volunteers. At least six more knights, please. You can't. Rome said. They kill you. Jaina's eyes hardened. Maybe but I'm betting they'll want us as hostages for now. Me, at least. It depends what they've done with my sons. Vitor had already figured that, but it seemed to strike other Jedi as a blow. Sin asked, Master, what about the children? Take them, Dare. You know the tunnels. Get them out from under the academy and escape into Rathlin. Hide if you have to. Escape on a ship if you can. We'll stall them as long as we can. No matter what they plan on doing with us. It was a bleak plan for a bleak situation. No one liked it. No one could think of anything better. A few knights stepped beside Schultz, volunteering to help by time. Once a half dozen brave knights stood together, ready for whatever Veers might have for them. 
Jaina dropped slowly off the sofa. Standing upright but still so small, she walked slowly to the six and stood beside them. Rome couldn't take it anymore. Grandma, you can't. Jaina's eyes darted to Sende. Get started. Take the apprentices. Everyone snapped into motion. Sende, still clutching his son's hand, led the apprentices through one door. The Jedi volunteers darted another way, toward the academy's main entrance, save Schultz himself, who lingered at the side of the room to watch Jaina and her grandsons. The hard look in the old woman's eyes softened, and she put one hand on Ron's shoulder, the other on Viter's. You have to go now, and I have to go out there and face the soldiers. They'll never buy a surrender if I'm not there, not for a second. They'll never buy it anyway if the apprentices are gone. Vitor pleaded. We need you to protect us, Roan added. A sad, sad smile creased her face. I'm an old woman. I'd only slow you down. No, you wouldn't. Vitor pulled her hand off his shoulder and clasped it with both hands. He tried to say more, but his voice caught in his throat. Water wavered his vision. Roan said, please, Grandma. We can't lose you, too. That made her flinch. She looked away, tried to screw her face into the cold, hard, stoic expression she'd kept on these weeks after losing her husband, but she couldn't keep the mask on. She took her hand off Roan's shoulder and wiped the tears off her face. Vitor was a stranger to grief, he knew that. He'd loved his grandfather, but he'd only known Jagged Fell for a fraction of the time Jaina had. She had lost so much more too, both brothers, her cousin, her aunt, all those dear friends. Just the thought of watching Rome or Marin die tore Vider's heart. He wasn't sure he'd want to live if they were gone. He realized that a part of her must have been ready to end it, to surrender, to go see all those who'd left long, long before her. But Rome was right. Vitor squeezed her hand in both of his. It felt so small, so frail. Please? Not you two. Then, softly from the edge of the room, Reckon Schultz said, Master, we can do this without you. She took a moment to compose herself, breathed deep, and said, Thank you, Reckon. May the force be with you, Master. And you? She reached out with her spare hand, took Rome's, and squeezed it. Come on. We've wasted too much time already. She was right, and she, she said, a woman in her 80s, even a great and powerful Jedi Master, did not move fast. As she guided them through the lifts and hallways that led under the Academy complex, she said, we never thought we'd need strong defenses. Maybe we should have, but at least we prepared an escape route. Where does this lead us? Asked Vitor. He wanted to walk faster. He wanted to run ahead, but he stayed beside his grandmother. To an industrial center on the outskirts of Ravlin. The land's owned by a private corporation. We had the tunnel installed 30 years ago. Does the company know about the tunnel? Its majority shareholder does, Jaina allowed a little smile. Vitor Ridge, your grandfather had good friends. At least Veers doesn't know about it, Ron said, though he sounded more hopeful than relieved. We'll escape safety. What we do then? I can't say. They kept going as fast as they could. Jaina grabbed her grandson's arms, and they helped keep her steady and move a little faster. He could tell she was reaching out with the force, telling Sen far ahead to wait for them. As they moved outside the basement chambers and hallways Vitor was familiar with, he asked, how can we be sure they won't find the tunnel and follow us? We can't. That's why we have to destroy the entrance once we're through. That means Jedi can't follow us either, said Rome. Jaina nodded grimly. They trudged on. They came upon the tunnel entrance suddenly, the turn of a corner, and they were there, at the mouth of a circular portal with a heavy hatch that swung out to the side. Kajin Alar was there, and when she saw the newcomers, she jumped in surprise and almost ignited her saber. Sith Spawn, you took long enough, she said. Then amended, sorry master. Blame the boys for dragging me along, Jaina said, though she let them hold her arms and shoulders and help her step over the high rim of the hatch. After they were through, Alar swung the hatch shut and locked it with a set of levers. A long, straight, dimly lit permacrete tunnel stretched before them until a slightly bent arc dipped out of view. 
The others went ahead, she said. They'll have to stop and take rest breaks. So if we keep going, we should catch up. I'll go as long as I can, Jana said. Do you have the detonator for the demolition charges? The apprentice tapped a small black cylinder on her belt. I was hoping not to use it, not yet. You'll have to. We Jana stopped and closed her eyes. For a moment she went slack and her grandsons held her up. When she regained her strength and opened her eyes, she looked at Alar. The moment we're in the safe zone, you need to detonate those charges and seal the entrance to this tunnel. Already? But. We're out of time, Jana said, very sadly. The killing started. In the end, they'd acted fast and prevented Malkin's coup attempt. The colonel and a whole company had been knocked out in the hangar bay, retrieved before waking, and locked in the shipyard's brig. On learning this, the company left to detain Vice Admiral Yeager had been convinced to surrender, and the remaining soldiers from the 221st Regiment had been rounded up before getting access to their weapons or Cortosis armor. The shipyards were still on red alert and security teams, all led by Captains Yeager could vouch for were on round-the-clock patrol. It seemed the insurrection had been put down, and amazingly enough it had been done without the loss of a single life on either side. That was a victory, but when Davik saw what was happening on Bastion, there was nothing that could comfort. Beneath his anger, a small part of him was surprised that Veers was letting the major news network's broadcast satellite images of the Jedi Academy encircled by a full armored division's worth of hoverdanks and walkers. Then the ANN reporter, an older human Davik didn't recognize, read word for word a release just put out by the head of state's office. This is not a decision taken lightly, the reporter read from his prompter. We are acting to put the Jedi Order on Bastion under direct control of the government and hold them accountable for their actions. Their masters will receive a fair and public trial in which they will be judged on the following charges, theft of vital military intelligence. Treason against the Galactic Empire and complicity in the murders of Neela Avaris and Zek Derrickin. Abetting the Kalish rebels and assisting the crew of the Grievous in this heinous attack. Our troops are waiting to accept the peaceful surrender of the Jedi so their guilt or innocence may be determined by Imperial law. If the Jedi are not willing to be judged for their actions, they will be taken as enemies of the state and dealt with as such. All who aid and abet the Jedi Order will also be considered enemies of the state. We regret that these actions had to be taken, but we are taking them for the good of the Empire and the safety of all its citizens. As soon as the reporter was done reading the press release and then brought on someone else, one of those talking heads Davak vaguely recalled, who immediately began comparing the supposed Jedi assassination of Neela Avaris with their attempt to depose Chancellor Palpatine a hundred some years ago. Something in the Jedi makeup, he suggested, was openly contemptuous of the laws of lesser beings. They were watching it all in Jaeger's office, and the Vice Admiral was the one who mercifully killed the audio. As soon as it was off, Major Briggs said, Admiral, I am so sorry for all of this. I should have suspected Malkin was up to something, but I trusted him. We understand, said Davek. He was your old sergeant. Briggs shook his head. He was a Voy Walker. I thought that was reason enough. Grim understanding passed between the people gathered in the room. Davik, Briggs, Maragia, Vice Admirals Jaeger and Renwer, Captain Korak. All Voy Walkers. That shared bond was almost 20 years old but it had been forged strong by fire. Perhaps too strong. As Davik looked around the room he knew he could trust these people. He had no choice but to trust them. Admiral Renwer said, what are you going to do? I have to go to Bastion. My he looked at Miragia. Our sons are there. My mother. Dozens more Jedi. They could surrender. The Jedi know what happens when an Imperial leader wants them quashed, Miragia said darkly. Every Anon knows. Are you going to take a fleet? Asked Briggs. If I show up in one ship, Veers will try to arrest me. We'll need as many ships as we can to hold off Invincible. Tactical reports show most of the first fleet is still spread out across the Braxton sector, Jaeger put in. Jumping fast, pull up a wide interdiction field, and you can buy yourself some time. Are we talking about fighting Veers? Rimmer looked around the group. 
putting aside whether we should, I don't think it's a battle we can win. Not with how damaged the fourth is. We've put four-star destroyers back in fighting condition already, Jaeger said. Before all this started, we were making fast progress on five more. How's the Makati? Asked Korak. At the current rate it would take two weeks to fix it up. We could speed things up. We need to move now, Davik said. I need every ship that's ready and captain we trust. Vice Admiral Jaeger, Bobringi needs you. Keep fixing ships. If a task force from another fleet comes, do not let it into the yards. Understood, sir. Vice Admiral Renwer, I need you to start prepping your ships immediately. Captain Korak, how fast can you scramble Nightwatch to full crew? Two hours if I sound red alert now. Do it. And Captain, I'll be putting my flag on your vessel. I'm honored, sir. Maragia, get the rest of your Jedi and their ships. Move to Nightwatch. You'll be with me. Major Briggs, he stopped. He barely knew anything about the man who just saved his life. A deputy chief quartermaster now. A stormtrooper with an extra medal for valor back then. Admiral, Briggs said, apologetic, my family is here. My wife and children. And my job. I understand. You're now deputy to Vice Admiral Jaeger. Get these yards running and fix the rest of the fourth as fast as possible. He nodded, firm, satisfied. Yes, sir. Admiral, Renwer said, how far do you plan to take this? He could see on her face how overwhelmed she was by it all. He wanted to show them the recording Arlen had sent, but it meant nothing in itself. Not unless Marin and Tamar fetched more proof. The Jedi are innocent of these charges. I can prove it if Veers gives me the chance. If he doesn't, I'll protect the Jedi from being slaughtered like they were a hundred years ago. We can't become the old Empire again. It's not just the Jedi, Miragia said. Veers is clamping down on non-humans all over the Empire, even once in the military. We can't stand back and let him do that, Korak said darkly. I won't. Renoir winced. We all know those soldiers deserve better. They are good soldiers, loyal soldiers. Our friends. His voice broke for the memory of poor Dunn. It's a disgrace. I won't serve an empire that does that to his own. Then we'll force Veers to stop this before it spirals out of control. Davik pounded fist against Paul. All of you, to your ships. Prepare for. Look, Briggs said, pointing to the muted and forgotten INN broadcast. The hollow image had dropped the commentators and now showed a high aerial view of the Jedi Academy. A pillar of dark smoke was rising from the base of the pyramid. It's already out of control, the Major whispered. Chapter 28 Events playing out on Bastion were drawing the attention of the whole galaxy, and Darth Krone was hardly out of place in stopping his normal routine to watch, even if he knew more of what lay behind the events than nearly anyone. According to Darth Wirelock, Sith agents had been placed in Ravlin, and were in position to hunt down and eliminate any Jedi Veer's soldiers failed to take. They'd been ordered to hide their presence from the Imperials whenever possible. The more ignorant Veer's was of the nature of his partnership, the less likely the Jedi would be to trace things back to the Sith. In the midst of that good news, Crone got a hail promising even more. He slipped away to his private office and opened the comm line to see Gavin Arch's masked face staring back at him. Well, he asked. Did your trap work? It did. We captured the two Skaradas who were looking into our mission. Was the woman with them? We have her? And Arlen fell. No sign of him. We've locked down their ship and are searching it now. No ship matching Fells is at this port. I don't think he's on the planet. Quite likely he was racing back to Bastion to save his sons. The question was whether he'd be bringing anything back from Broken Moon. Where do you have the Skaradas now? I've taken them back to my ship. I'll interrogate them and get everything they know. And kill them. That was the plan. Unless you want them? The woman can be useful. Keep her alive. The man he waved a hand, dismissive. You want a Skarada package for you? Yes. I don't care about her condition so long as she's still breathing when I get her. Alive she's a hostage we can use against Arlen Fell. Dead she's not. 
I understand, Ox grunted. It'll be done. Where and when do you want to rendezvous? He thought a moment. Events in Imperial space were still unpredictable. He wanted the Skirata woman alive for interrogation, as Alchus had promised her all those years back in Senex Juvex. Her escape had started the end of everything. He and Alchus both knew that. It was the only real time his Mandalorians had failed their service to the one Sith. Crone could contact Darth Wirelock and have her send an agent to meet Alchus. Some things, though, were best done yourself. Can you be at the last planet in the Exodine system in exactly 40 hours? Done. Then I will see you then, Mandalor. I expect to get what I'm promised this time. Alchus simply nodded. He knew what Crone was, what he was capable of, just as Crone knew Alchus. The Sith Lord closed the link, pondered a second, then brought up the latest news from Imperial Space to see how Veer's siege was going. Once they knew they were no longer being pursued, once they were close to safe, Marin and Nanette found an empty building in the spaceport to hide, catch their breath, and figure out what to do next. All they had between them was one pistol, a Besker knife, and a lightsaber. Their goal was simple but so difficult, rescue their parents and get the hell off this planet. The landing pit wasn't big, nor was it well guarded. With a pair of ragged, heavy cloaks thrown over them, no one spared either girl a second glance. They went back to harm's way first and were unsurprised to find one Mandalorian standing guard at the base of a landing ramp that must have been force open. Marin wasn't positive, but she thought she sensed more people inside the ship, surely ransacking it for useful information. Their copy of the recording from Sheriffith was aboard that ship and Alcha's people might have already found it. The only remaining copy was with her father, and she hoped he'd passed it on to her uncle by now. Hidden behind a pile of emptied equipment crates, Marin kept watch on harm's way while Nanette slipped back to find Ox ship. Marin didn't know what to look for, but her cousin did. After less than ten minutes the Mandalorian girl came back next to her and said, I found their ship. What about our parents? I found them too. Marin ducked beneath the crates and asked Nanette, Did you see them get taken inside? I did. Archis and Galicet went in, plus Salvak. Two more patrolling the outside of the landing pad. Can you get us past them? Desperation and need were plain on Nenet's face. Mandas might not have kept high opinions on Jedi, but with her father captured she needed something to believe in. I can try, Marin whispered. We need to get to the landing zone. Scout around. Right? Let's get going. Your ship. Nanette clasped her arm. Can't do anything about that now. We need our parents back. There was no arguing that. Marin followed her cousin through the dark and dirty corridors that connected the docking pads. When they passed the cracked open gate to an empty lading pad, Marin grabbed Nenet's arm and dragged her through the gap. We're going the wrong way, the Mandalorian girl scowled. What are you doing? Marin scanned the empty space and spotted a collection of storage crates piled high in the far corner. Come on, let's get up higher. Nanette took her meaning instantly. The girls tossed off their awkward robes and clambered up the crates, Marin first. When she reached the top one it was still a hop of more than two meters to the top of the wall surrounding the landing pit. Compared to knocking over part of a building, she thought, this would be easy. She drew on the force for just a moment as she kicked off from the top crate. Then she was in the air, and then her boot slammed on hard surface, and when she looked back Nanette was staring up at her and trying not to look impressed. Need a boost? Marin asked. Please? Jump. I'll lift you. She done with trick with Vitor enough times. Nanette had strong legs, and even with heavy armor on she was able to jump halfway to the edge of the roof. Marin grabbed with her mind and carried her the rest of the way. Nanette's gloved hands grabbed the edge, and she pulled herself up from there. The Mando girl stood up and scanned the landing zones. From here, atop the walls. They could move quickly from one landing pit to another. Marin asked, Do you know which way? Over there. Nanette pointed. Three berths over, should be. Let's go. And keep low. Nanette dropped into a running crouch, back low, torso almost parallel with the rooftop. 
blaster in one hand, and knife in the other. Marin followed behind her with lightsaber in hand. When they reached the rim of the right landing pit, they fell down onto their stomachs and scanned the area. Ulk's ship wasn't much bigger than Harm's Way, our Starlight Champion, but it looked newer, sleeker, with an oval shape and far rotating directional thrusters for fast takeoffs and landings. As Nanette had promised, two Mandos walked slow circles around the ship. There looked to be an entry ramp extending from the bottom of the ship, but at least one of the guards had it in visual range the whole time. Nanette explained that most Mando helmets had 360-degree sensors, so even with their backs turned they might still spot two girls trying to sneak aboard. There was no way of knowing what internal security Alja's ship might have too. I wonder why they haven't taken off yet, Marin whispered. Still got guys at harm's way searching the ship, Nanette reminded. They probably got people out looking for me, too. Tying up loose ends. How many do you think there are total? A ship that size could fit 30 commandos, but I don't think Archers brought that many. Counting him and Salvak, there were only six in the warehouse. Maybe two more to search our ship. Two more to guard. That few. I don't think Archers plans to advertise his side trip to Korax. He's going to want to end this quietly, probably so nobody can trace our parents' death to him. You're sure they're in there? I saw them dragged in with my shablies, Nanette hissed. Right? Marin breathed out and closed her own. She tried to sense her mother. Their connection had never been easy and natural like it had been with her father, but all it took was a little effort this time. She sensed anger and she sensed pain. She sensed a desire to hurt so raw and visceral as sent shudders through her body. All of that was coming from Tamar Skirata, without a doubt. You can't feel them, right? Asked Nanette. Marin nodded. We need to get in. But those guards. You think you can take one with your lightsaber? Marin swallowed. Nanette might have been a hard Mando warrior, a killer at 14, but she was not. She said honestly, I wouldn't count on it. Can you take out another guy in Besker with your knife and pistol? All before they call for help. Nanette scowled and shook her head. We need to get the shab inside somehow. Marin looked around and spotted at a medium-sized repulsor lift dolly hovering unused at the far side of the landing pit, near the gate. When she squinted, she could just barely make out the arrangement of the simple control panel. You see that cargo dolly? She whispered. Yeah. What do you think you can do with it? Distraction, maybe? She looked back at Ock's ship. From the look of it, it was designed for fast deployment in any environment so she wasn't surprised to spot the oval frame of a secondary airlock on the ship's dorsal side, near the aft. Can you get us over there? Nanette had the same idea. Unseen. That's what the dolly's for. Get ready? There was no time to second-guess whether she could do this. She could feel her mother inside that ship still. Pain and hate and anger are all ready to burst. She stared at the repulsor dolly, stared at its control panel reached with invisible hands across that distance until she could almost feel the hard grip of his control stick. She grabbed it with her mind and pushed it forward. The dolly jerked too, as fast as his low-grade repulsor lifts would allow, and careened without warning right into the lower security gate. It plowed through and kept going for two more seconds until it smashed into the corridor wall. The repulsors died and it came crashing down to the ground. The guards both went for it at the same time. Marin stood up and grabbed Nanette by the wrist. The two girls surged forward and jumped past the edge. The next blow was less a slap than a punch. The knuckles of Jevern Ox's half closed first slammed into Tamar's cheek and scraped across the front of her jaw, tearing the soft skin of her lower lip. Pain shot across half her face, erasing all other feelings. When she scraped her tongue across her mouth, she felt nothing but tasted fresh blood. Archer stepped away and began another slow loop around the two prisoners bound to their chairs in the empty storage chamber. Galaset and Salvat stood against the wall, faces unreadable behind their helmets, but Galaset had a long basket sword dangling from his belt. Once my men find your brat, we'll take off, Archer said. Shouldn't be long now. Just kill us and get it over with. Chacker, Dorn grunted. Why? 
Do you think I'm some kind of sadist, Skarada? Could have fooled me, Tamar tried to say, but between the residual effects of the drug and the half of her face still numb with pain it came out all slurred. You're one to talk, Darman Dejiti. I'll just wave a finger. You should have stuck to what you were doing, chasing bounties on Ossicla planets. Better yet, you should have stayed with the GD on Bastion. Then Veers could round you up with the rest. She lifted her head and tried to blink her eyes into focus. What? What happened? It's going on right now, actually. Lockdown of the Jedi Academy. Charges of treason leveled against Admiral Fell and your GD Syerica. Collusion with the Kalish. Accessories to the murder of Neela Avarice. You ever get sick of spewing gossip? Asked Dorn. Ox reared back and kicked him in the stomach. Dorn's chair was bolted down, otherwise he could have tipped over. They'd had their beskers stripped off before being strapped to these chairs, and there was nothing to stop the blow. Ox boots cracked ribs and pumped the air out of him. Dorn killed over as far as his bonds allowed, gasping for breath and retching from pain. You damn Skaratus. Ocha shook his head. Always Shabla trouble since the days of Palpatine. A refuge for Jishian clones and any other freaks you could dredge up. I would have been perfectly happy to ignore you, Barbs, but no, you never know your place, so you couldn't stop meddling in real Mando business. At least we don't sell ourselves to the Sith for 20 years. Tamar rasped. Ox froze. Slowly, he turned to look at her. When he spoke, his voice was as hard as his faceless mask. We're feared and respected today like we haven't been for centuries. I did that, Darmanda Jidi. Me? I've got a planet full of loyal men back home. They'll make sure Nabadik knows what happened to you. The rest of your Mirasik have Jidi clan might think I had a hand, but they'll never prove it. If they even try some blood vendetta, we will wipe them out, every single one. Autis looked at Galaset and held out his hand. The other warrior stepped forward without a word and placed the long basket sword in his palm. Dorn had picked up his head by now. He and Tamar both watched the mandalor step between them, holding the sword upright, as though measuring the weight of the blade. She couldn't glean much from him in the force she never could, but his intent felt even more hard and cold than before. It felt lethal. And she knew, dead knew, that at least one of them wasn't leaving this chamber alive. My men will be back from your ship soon, Asha said, almost conversationally. They've searched through your data files. Found a really interesting recording you must have picked up at Broken Moon. Stupid of us, using that base. Should have figured that little Twi'lek Dalica had more going on than some nice blue curves. But we'll deal with her later. The biscuit swiped out in a flash. Its point stopped inches from Tamar's eyes. A little longer reach a little less control, and she'd be dead. Very softly, she breathed, show off. Auk shifted the blade away. Its sharp edge rested on Dorn's shoulder. Tamar's cousin looked straight ahead, refusing to give Auk's the satisfaction of fear in his eyes. The mandalor turned his helmet back to her. Now you're going to tell me a few things. Or you'll watch him die? Don't tell me I'm lying, Darmanda Jidi. You know better? She did. She could sense his lethal intent in the Force, not just his willingness to kill Dorn, but his determination to do so. He killed her cousin whether she talked or not, but he wanted her alive, to suffer, to talk. And she felt something else too, something she hadn't expected to feel. She felt her daughter somehow, not far away. Marin was telling her to stay calm, stay strong, and get ready. First question, Ox said. How many more copies of that little recording are there? She had to stall. I don't know. By now there's got to be hundreds. I'll just pull the biscuit's tip from Dorn's neck, then jabbed the point into his right pectoral. Blood well to stain his dark suit and he bit his lip hard to keep from screaming. Don't be cute, I'll just warned. Let's try this. Who else went with you to Broken Moon? Don't say nobody. She could feel Marin telling her to hold on it. She was almost there. Tamar swallowed. Arlen fell. And let's assume Fell is on his way back to Imperial Space to save his dear Boer from the nasty stormtroopers. How long ago exactly did he leave Broken Moon? A rare hint of amusement crept into his voice. I'll give you a minute to think. 
I want to make sure you get it right. Marin knew her mother was on the opposite side of the doors. She could feel Tamar and feel Tamar press back. Auches was there too, and probably a couple other mandas. Nanette had just confirmed that her father had released that agonized scream a moment ago. For the man no girl, anger trumped fear. She moved smoothly and steadily to place direction charges at the corners to the door. She kept them in a pouch on her belt, for emergency she said, of which this clearly qualified. As soon as all four were secure she skirted back down the hall, dragging Marin with her. Far enough, Nanette said, and dug her heels into the deck. You sure? She hesitated. Can you block the blast with the force? I can try. Good enough. Got your saber? Marin switched it and tried to keep her hands from shaking. She reached out to her mother and tried to tell her they were coming now. Nanette raised the charge's small detonator so Marin could see it and thumbed the trigger. Marin raised a wall of resistance in the force. The charges blew the door inward but kicked a wave of hot air back down the hall. Marin softened it with best she could but smoke, and Ash followed, choking her and obscuring their vision. Nanette charged anyway? Marin ran right after her, gold saber bobbing ahead. Lasers lit up the smoke ahead. Marin summoned a wave of force energy to clear the air. She saw Tamar and Dorn bound in their chairs. She saw Nanette throwing herself at Salvok while Galaset scrambled to take cover behind Dorn and pulled his rifle off his back. And she saw Jevron Auchis, long blade basket sword in hand, next to her mother. He looked at her, looked down at Tamar. Then she felt a flash of rage from him, saw him lift his sword over the woman strapped helpless to the chair. Marin leaped. Galaset released a round of lasers in her direction that barely registered in time to duck low roll beneath them, and come up in the space between Tamar's chair and Auk's legs. She came up, swinging wildly. Her blade cut too close to block the fall of his sword. Instead it burned through his elbows like they were nothing, and kept going. Auk's body tipped forward and momentum carried the rest. Her gold blade slipped above his besker shoulder plates, beneath the bottom rim of his helmet, and cut neatly through his neck. Pieces of him clattered to the floor. Sword, hands, head. The Mandalore's body, slack and heavy, fell forward. She jumped away and let it fall hard and loud onto the deck. And for a moment everyone stopped and stared. Tamar moved first. Marin was more shocked than anyone. Her mother force plucked her lightsaber from her weak grip and flung it into her own hands. A flick of the wrist cut her arms from the chair back. With hands free, it was another too quick thrust to free her feet. By then, everyone had started moving except Marin, still shocked stiff by what she'd done. Tamar grabbed her daughter and, gently as possible, threw her to the far wall. Nanette had pinned Salvak to the ground and stuck her knife into his chest, but the older Mando fumbled for his pistol and fired to burst into the girl's stomach. Tamar called on the force again and pulled Nanette away. She spun toward Dorn, deflecting laser blasts from Galaset with her daughter's lightsaber. She wielded a Jedi weapon like a Mando, fast, fierce, fueled by anger instead of inner peace. When she got close enough she sheared off the barrel of Galaset's gun. The Karestian jumped back and reached for another weapon but Tamar jumped over Dorn's head and delivered a fast kick right into Galaset's helmet, snapping his neck back, but that wouldn't be enough. She came down behind Dorn's chair and dipped Marin's saber back, carefully cutting her cousin's hands free of his bonds. Galaset was coming up again, this time with another blaster. He got off two shots before Tamar was on him. She deflected his shots, got in close, and carefully cut his gun hand off at the wrist. The Karestian howled in pain but stood on his feet. Tamar was so tempted to run him through with Marin's saber but a small part of her spoke through the blood fever. If she could get him alive, she could use him. She used the force to pin him to the wall and wrench his helmet off. His brown, jowled alien face growled at her. Do it, Shabla Darmandajidi. He said, kill me. A blue stun blast sizzled over Tamara's shoulder and caught Gallison in the exposed face. He dropped. She turned around and saw Dorn, still bound by the ankles to his chair grasping a blaster pistol with both hands as he sprawled awkwardly across the floor. 
He didn't say anything. She didn't thank him. She moved quickly and cut his legs free. He immediately crawled to Nanette, who lay on the deck face up next to Salvak. She, at least, was breathing, but one of those close range blasts had slipped between her bescaplets. She smelled of scorched fabric and scorched flesh. We can't move her, Dorn said, voice shaken as he felt his daughter's pulse. Tamar spun on her daughter, now pressed against the side wall, staring at the body of the man she killed. Marin, she snapped. See if this ship has a medical bay. Now. The girl nodded and started for the door just as they heard feet pounding down the corridor. There was no time to hesitate. Tamar charged ahead first and Dorn was right behind her. Two more Mandos, probably the guards outside, had rushed into the ship on hearing the sound of battle. Tamar let adrenaline and anger carry her further. She batted back laser blasts from the surprise commandos until she got close enough to spear one through the stomach. He grunted and killed forward. The second popped off a shot that winged Tamar in the shoulder, forcing her back a step and sending pain through her left arm. Dorn was right behind her, and he scooped up Archer's basket on the way. He pushed past his cousin and fell on the remaining mando. Hard metal slipped through fabric and skin and organs, spilling blood and ending the brawl fast. Get to the cockpit, Tamar grimaced. See if we can take off. Dorn pressed ahead. Tamar didn't hear any more battle sounds, so she lurched after him. By the time she got to the cockpit, Dorn was already in the pilot's seat running hands over the controls, starting systems, warming up engines and weapons. Looks pretty standard for this model, Dorn commented. Probably not Auk's personal ship. I bet he didn't want to be noticed, Tamar wheezed. She spent close to 20 years hating that man. Now that he was gone the way he'd gone, she had no idea what to feel. None of this seemed real. Marin popped into the cockpit. I found a medical bay. Looks full service. Then let's get out of here, Dorn said, and kicked in the thrusters. They jumped into the air so fast Tamar and her daughter were nearly thrown into each other. What about your ship? Marin yelped. Archer still has people there. No choice. Then, Dorn gritted his teeth. I really like that ship too. Wait, what are you? Marin was thrown at a bulkhead again as Dorn swooped them low over the honeycomb structure of the landing pits. They could see harm's way resting where they'd left it, with two little forms scampering around it. They looked like toy figures in their armor as they pointed up at their Mandala ship in confusion. Tamar found the weapon controls. Guns were already hot. She aimed, stabbed the button, and sent a chain of five laser blasts that turned the landing pit and everything that ships people into a ball of flame. Tamar knew he'd been fond of harm's way, but Dorn didn't spare another glance at his ship's pyre. She spun them toward the sky and punched them away from the planet. They hadn't stopped bouncing through the atmosphere when he pushed out of the pilot seat, shoved Tamar down in his place, and went back for his daughter. They safely jumped to hyperspace by the time Marin finally started to get a grasp on everything. Nanette was hurt. She was in the medical bay, sedated and being looked over by her father and the onboard med droid, which had said she'd probably be okay. They had a prisoner aboard, one of Jevon Archer's most trusted lieutenants, the one they'd seen in the holo record Sheriff had given to them. They had the bodies of four more warriors, all dead. The fifth corpse belonged to the Mandalor himself. Marin had killed him without wanting to, without even trying. She simply jumped in to save her mother and swung her saber, desperate, unthinking. It has cleaved through flesh and bone with no effort at all. Murder shouldn't have been so easy. A couple hours after leaving Korax, Marin went to the medical bay and politely asked the droid if she could talk to Nanette. To her slight surprise, the droid had waved her forward. Marin's cousin was out of her armor, strapped to a bed with tubes in her arms and a white blanket up to her armpits, covering the place where she'd been shot. Her face was pale. She stared at the ceiling and breathed slowly, steadily. Marin stopped beside the bed. Hey. Nanette rolled her head to see her. Droy says I'll be okay. How do you feel? Like absolute Asik. But it's better than the alternative. Right? Um, 
I'm glad you'll be fine. She looked down at her hands, uncertain what else to say. Nanette said, my boor told me what you did. You killed Jevon Arches. Yeah. It, um, it just sort of happened. That's good. You did good. The Shibuya deserved it. All he's done. Yeah. I, um, she swallowed. Her mouth felt so dry. That time you told me about. When you were at that, um, safe house or whatever. When you killed that guy to save your dad, did you feel okay after that? Nanette smiled tiredly, sadly. That was a lie. What? Sorry. I was trying to make you think I had hard shivs. So it never happened. I froze up. My uncle Crackle, he took the shot. Saved my boor. Called myself a huge one for a long time after that. She dropped her eyes and added, I never killed anyone until today. They both stared down like they were lost in thought. Marin was still too stunned, too exhausted, to think anything clearly. She fumbled to say, are you okay? About what you did. She placed a hand on her side. Salvak almost killed me. Only fair I kill him, right? And Alchus, he'd have killed you. Without a doubt. Yeah, I get that. It's just, I don't know. She wanted to say I'm a Jedi. It's not supposed to be like this. But even in her head it sounded like the whine of a pathetic child. You probably need your rest. That's what the droid says. She reached out and grabbed Marin by the wrist. You know where to find me. Thanks, Marin smiled weakly and pulled away. She felt a little relief to slip out into the hallway. That disappeared when she saw her mother standing there. Arms crossed, five steps away and close enough to have heard everything. Neither of them moved nearer. Neither knew what to say. In the rush to escape Korax, they worked together, but once things had gone quiet, they'd avoided each other. Tamar had secured the prisoner and moved the bodies. Marin had taken stock of everything in this new ship. Now space and silence yawned between them. I've had a chance to look at the news nets, Tamar said. Things are happening on Bastion. Marin stiffened. What things? Head of State Veers has declared the Jedi outlaws. He's laid siege to the Academy. He's declared your uncle a criminal too, but it doesn't sound like he'd been arrested yet. I don't know anything about your cousins or grandmother. Our Arlen. I'm sorry. Marin stepped closer. Is it a war? They haven't started shooting yet, but it's probably only a matter of time. The whole galaxy had turned upside down. She hugged herself and still felt chilled. What do you do now? I don't know. Dorn and I are going to have a chat with Galison in a few minutes. Chat. Interrogation. Torture. It was all too much. She wanted to go back to the Jedi Academy, to her father and grandmother, to Vitor and Roan and her other friends, where everything was calm and safe and secure. But even that refuge was gone. She'd been expelled from it all before she knew it, cast into a life where there was only desperation and cruelty and killing. When she started trembling, Tamar's arms appeared around her. She lost strength in her legs and pitched forward. Her mother supported her. She reached up and placed a hand on the back of her head, stroked it, ran fingers through her hair. Tamar wrapped her other arm around her shoulders, squeezed her tight, and said, It's okay. Do what you have to. I'm not going anywhere. Soft words and firm embrace. After all this, Marin rested her face against her mother's chest and allowed herself to cry. Chapter 29 Vitor had no idea how long they spent marching through the tunnel. He heard his grandmother say that the industrial site into which they'd exit was located 14 kilometers from the Jedi Academy. He didn't know how fast he'd be able to cover that distance and normal speed, and they were definitely moving slower than that. His grandmother was the slowest one. They all knew it, but they all kept pace with the old master out of deference. They stopped from time to time, five minutes every hour, maybe, though he wasn't sure. He could feel Jaina drawing on force energy to keep herself moving. The invisible energy seeped from without into her body, energizing her muscles, and keeping air cycling through her lungs. During one break, Vitar dared ask her what was going back at the academy. She said she couldn't tell, 
only that people were dying. He chose to believe that and walked on in ignorance. When they finally reached the far end of the tunnel, there was another hatch like the one they left through. Dayersen opened it. He and Kaj and Alar waved for everyone to stay back and went through the portal, sabers lit, to scope out the surrounding area. They came back a few minutes later and waved the rest of them through. It was the inside of some vast storehouse, filled with rows and metal racks laden with industrial equipment Vitor couldn't recognize. There seemed to be no one around and Vitor couldn't sense anyone in the force besides the other Jedi. The awkward heard one old master, one adult knight, and fifteen apprentices of various ages exited through a side door and stepped outside. The cool wind felt like the breath of life. Even the still gray sky overhead was welcome after so long in the claustrophobic tunnels. Yet as soon as he registered the breeze, Vitor heard the sounds of multiple airspeeders not far away. Back in the building, Sin called, and the apprentices ducked for cover. Vitor lingered. He heard airspeeders and something more, very distant, a faint sound carried on current of wind. It was high-pitched and repetitive, like a wailing alarm. Then Dare Sin grabbed his arm and pulled him into the open door frame just as an airspeeder passed low over the industrial yard. Did they find us? Sin Sun Trace whispered. Not yet. His father hooked a pair of small macro binoculars off his belt and traced the speeders as they flew straight away. They are not turning around for another pass. Master, do you know which way we're facing? From the back of the group, safely inside the warehouse, Jaina said, I believe they were flying north, toward Ravelin. Sin's brows drew together. Why Ravelin? The academy is east of here. Something must be happening in the city, Rome said. Yeah, but what? Vitor looked at the older Sende, then his grandmother. The two adults shared looks of mutual confusion. Hey, hear that? Alar cupped one ear. You mean the alarms? Vitor whispered. You hear them too? I hear them, Morgan offered. Yes, but something else, getting louder. The paused. Vitor took one cautious step out under the sky, listened to the wind, the distant repeating wail, and something else, a constant drone that sounded like an animal scream. Then the pitch shifted down and he said, TIE fighters. Not sure where. Sin nudged him back under cover and motioned for him to stay. Then the knight crouched and jumped up, using the force to pull himself to the edge of the warehouse's high broad roof. Vitor heard his boot slam onto the metal above and waited another minute until Sin jumped back to the ground. I'm seeing ties and local police airspeeders over Ravlin, he reported. I'm not sure what's going on there. The Academy? Asked Dana. I see smoke. And ties flying circles. It would be too easy for all their thoughts to fall on the knights they've left behind to die. Vitor said, What do we do now? All eyes fell to Jaina. The old woman, standing next to Rome, hooked an arm around her grandsons and said, It's no good trying to run in this situation. We need to stay hidden, and we need to find out what else is going on. You're mean our parents, asked Rome, and the academy, and everything else. If there is a communication station in this complex, I don't know where to find it, send admit it. It's all right, said Jaina. I know the way, but most of you should stay behind. Stay safe. I'm coming with you, Grandma, Vitor said, and put a hand on his lightsaber. He expected his grandmother to refuse. He expected her to say he was too young. It was too risky. He'd best go back into that hidden tunnel and hide with the other kids until salvation came from above. But she gave him a simple up-down look and something serious came over her face, like she'd discovered something about him for the first time. The look made him uncomfortable, but he didn't shirk from it. All right, Jaina said. Well, stay close, Vitor. I want you by my side. In the end, Davek gathered the best fleet he could. Every fighting fit ship in the fourth was pulled from Bilbringi and sent hurling through hyperspace toward Bastion. He had 12 star destroyers in all, including the fleet carrier Nightwatch on which he put his flag, plus three times the number of smaller frigates, corvettes, and gunships. It was a good sized force, but Veers had the entire first fleet in the Braxton sector. The second fleet, 
best David could tell, was still at Yaga Minor, but Iveers decided to summon Admiral Grave to his side, as he very likely would. Then the battle would be over in a flash. Davek's only hope was to end this before it started. If he had to fight, it needed to be a short, small, contained battle. The two fast, two short hours en route to the capital were spent running systems checks, readying weapons and support craft, and doing everything possible to prepare for a battle every one of them prayed they wouldn't have to fight. They reverted to real space at the edge of Bastion's gravity well and continued to plunge downward toward the planet at full sublight speed. The two interdictor cruisers Davek had brought along immediately started warming their gravity wells generators, hoping to raise a wider interdiction field around the planet that would prevent surprise attacks from vessels in the first or second fleets that weren't presently close to the planet. What was waiting for them at Bastion was bad enough. Long and pale, then like an 18-kilometer sword, the Empire's newest super star destroyer sat directly atop the planet's northern pole. A few Predator-class destroyers, as well as Admiral Hallis legator class flagship Sentinel, were further out from the planet but immediately began falling toward it. Two more star destroyers, hefty Compeller-class ships, were lower in orbit, almost at the edge of the atmospheric shell, and much closer to Ravlin. The sprawling city that housed most of the Empire's government and bureaucratic apparatuses was currently swathed in clouds and fast slipping toward the planet's night side. It was impossible to get a visual lock on the Jedi Academy or anything going on in the city, but the fine-tuned sensor package aboard Nightwatch could pick to infrared emissions well beyond what the metropolis normally produced. In the midst of frantic preparations, Davek had watching the ANN broadcast for updates. Two hours before arrival, the network had been cut off entirely. One by one, the smaller news networks had also gone silent. The last one to shut down had been an often overlooked independent station. It had reported that large scale riots had broken out in Ravlin and Bastion's other major cities. Hollow footage from the center of Ravlin confirmed what Davik wouldn't have normally believed thousands, if not millions, had taken to the streets in support of the Jedi Order. The last images shown before his signal died it had been the sky over the protesters swarming with TIE fighters. Not police airspeeders but military craft. The next 45 minutes until the fleet arrival had been painfully tense. Davek had hoped to learn more about what was happening on the ground when they hit orbit but cloud cover and a jamming feel from Invincible left his and his fleet blind and ignorant just when they needed information. Veer's response was fast but not reckless. He'd hoped to arrest Davik quickly and quietly. A firefight over Bastion was exactly what he'd been trying to avoid. The two destroyers nearest to Ravlin began deploying fighters, a healthy mix of TIE-X interceptors and TIE demolishers for anti-capital ship combat. A dozen gunships and frigates, quicker than the big destroyers, raced to intercept Davik's fleet. They had no chance of taking down his 12-star destroyers. Instead of opening fire, they approached Davik's formation and settled themselves into it, as if daring the newcomers to shoot. Davik wasn't ready for that yet. On Nightwatch's bridge he could see the tactical holo, Admiral Hallis Sentinel would be here in less than 20 minutes, and Invincible was slowly, steadily moving from his perch over Bastion's polar cap. It was still seven minutes away. As per the battle plan he'd hastily assembled on the way here, Nightwatch was at the tip of the attacking wedge. Hundreds of TIE fighters and dozens of landing craft, all loaded with loyal stormtroopers, were ready to launch on his word. At the rear of the formation, Vice Admiral Renwar held back with two more destroyers in addition to her Tempest. If Sentinel came in guns blazing, they'd take the brunt of the attack. Davik was still praying it wouldn't come to that. Captain, he asked, can we hail Invincible? Doing it now, Korak said from the comm station where he hovered over the shoulder of an anxious lieutenant. Korak was keeping his cool much better that the young Ensign Davik remembered from Voidwalker, but one hand still hung at his side, a fist that clenched tight, loosened and tightened again in repetition. Davik's whole body twitched with energy, but he tried to keep his voice steady when the calm lieutenant gave him the signal to talk. This is Admiral Davik Fell, commander of the Imperial Fourth Fleet. I need to speak with Corin Veers at once. The other man's hollow image sprung into existence. 
With the same steady tone and haughty lilt, Veer said, this is the legally elected head of state, Mr. Fell. I'd remind you whose title is valid here. I reject your unlawful attempt to remove me from my position. I am still commander of the fourth as appointed by Supreme Commander Derrickin. You reject Halla's authority? Veers was trying to draw him into technicalities, waste his time. The two closest destroyers were already deploying fighter screens. If Davik was going to send ships down to the planet, they'd have to fight their way through. I've come to stop your illegal action against the Jedi Order and against those Imperial citizens who support it. I have only done what is my duty by law as part of the emergency powers granted to me by the Constitution your father helped draw. The Jedi are treasonous agents, just as you are, and they are being taken into custody so they may stand trial under Imperial law. Do you respect that law or don't you? Mr. Fell. If you're respecting that law, lower the jamming field. Let me see the Jedi Academy. Let me talk to the Jedi. I will do nothing to compromise the security of this law enforcement operation in progress. If you would only wait to see. Davak snapped his fingers and the lieutenant killed the transmission. Korak said, Sir, we don't have much more time. I'm aware, Captain. Sir. What if it is just a police action? What if the Jedi have a surrender and are being taken into custody? He knew they'd never surrender. Every Jedi he'd known, from his mother on down, clung to the memory of the Order's near extermination under Palpatine. And when they defended his mother would be right at the heart of it, even at 83 years old. Very likely, she was already dead, but he hoped he'd arrived in time to save his sons. He glanced at the tactical holo, the first wave of picket ships loyal to Veers had settled themselves among his destroyers. They held their fire now, the moment he launched fighters and landing craft they'd attack. Invincibly and Sentinel lurched ever closer. The first wave of hostile TIE-X fighters were only minutes away. His heart raced as he took out his comlink and thumped it on. Maragia, do you copy? Standing by, she said, crisp, succinct, so military even now. She was in the cockpit of her TIE fighter, waiting to launch along with a half-dozen and over 400 other pilots. We can't get any sensor readings from Ravlin. We have no idea what's going on at the Academy. Please, can you sense anything? One moment, she said, and killed the connection. She dropped into the forest to seek out far-off presence of the people below she knew and loved. Her friends, her mother-in-law, her nephew, her sons. They could be captive or dead or fighting for their lives, and Davek had no way to know. Not until his wife spoke again. When the attack came, it came from nowhere. Vitor sensed no danger at all, and the only warning was a shout from his grandmother two seconds before the first black cloaked figure jumped to block the alley mouth in front of them. Even then, Vitor couldn't believe what was happening until a blood red saber blade extended from the Sith's fist and as he stared at those red blades, felt the alley walls constrict him and the rain patter on his head, he realized he should have seen this coming. He dreamed of it this very morning. Send was fast. His lightsaber snapped and hissed to life. Flecks of light rain sizzled against his blade as he held it in a horizontal blocking position and stepped between the Sith and those he'd brought with him, Vitor, Jaina, Kajan Aller, and his son Trees. Vitor heard the slap of more boots on pavement and spun around. A second Sith had dropped in behind them, strapping them in the narrow space between two high warehouses. Alar grabbed her lightsaber and ignited it. Vitor fumbled with his weapon. By the time it was lit, the Sith were already on them. He could see little of their faces, only the black robes and heavy hoods, flashes of jawline underlit by sizzling red. Sin blocked the first two blows from his attacker, then swiped out offensively. Trees lurched for his father, even though the boy was too young to have made a lightsaber. Jaina grabbed him with the force and pulled him to her. Alar struggled against the rain a fast, heavy blow. Vitor leaped to help, ducked underneath a broad horizontal swipe by the Sith and struck at his knees. The Sith jumped back two steps and Alar used the opening to press the attack. Vitor could feel the fear bleeding off the older apprentice but desperation made her reckless. Her attacks were fast and uncontrolled, the opposite of how she sparred with him just a few eternal hours before. 
Fitor sprung forward to help. In this narrow space there was little room to move around, and the Sith was beaten back a few paces more. Their sabers clashed and crisscrossed and carved straight scars into the walls of the warehouses around them. Then Vitor heard and screamed felt agony in the force. He spun around on instinct. The Sith had scored a blow across Sin's torso, causing the knight to bend over at the waist in pain, saber arm dangling at his side. Tree screamed but Jaina held him tight. The Sith lunged again. A blade of red light speared out through Sen's back. When it withdrew, his body collapsed, dead in the quickening rain. The Sith who'd killed Sen dashed for Jaina. Instinct took over. Vitor rushed for his grandmother. After one leaping stride, he knew he'd be too late. Nothing could stand in the way of the red blade now bearing down on her. Then one wing of her bulky brown cloak furled back. Her arm shot up, faster than he'd seen it before and a blue blade of light caught the Sith's right before it fell. The Sith froze, stunned, Vitor slid across the rain-slick pavement, slowing only a little as he held his blade out long in front of him, hoping to spear the Sith through the chest while it was distracted. But the Sith jumped back, just barely avoiding his blade. Vitor wanted to press the attack, but he heard a scream, spun around, and saw Alar, running back toward them, stumbled and clutched the place where the second Sith's blade had cut deep and hot into her side. She stumbled, Vitor watched as his grandmother without even a gesture, picked the apprentice off her feet and pulled her close. Then they all stood together, backs to the warehouse wall, three trainees and one master. Dare Sen's lightsaber blazed in his son's hand, either Trees or Jaina had called it there, Vitor didn't know which. The old woman was smaller than any of the trainees, and he instinctively moved to shield Jaina's body with his own. The Sith, one on either side of them, hesitated for just a second. They stepped closer as one, then stopped just outside striking range. Vitor didn't understand. He could sense their evil intent in the Force and wondered if they were calling for help. Then, as one, they raised their free hands and sent out two waves of sizzling Force lightning. Trees hefted his father's lightsaber but could do nothing to stop the energy that wrapped around his blade and crackled all over his body. Alar, already wounded, only lasted a few seconds more before dropping her saber and collapsing to her knees in agony. Vitor barely lasted longer. Paint burst on him from both sides, overwhelming his petty defenses, his senses, everything. He barely managed to hold onto his saber but lost the strength to lift it. He opened his mouth to scream but couldn't hear anything for the pain boiling in his mind. It felt like his skull would burst. Then he fell beside the other two apprentices. The cold wet stones were a weird relief. He landed on his side and rode onto his back, looked up and saw the lightning converge on his grandmother from both directions. Jaina had shut off her lightsaber. She let the lightning come and when it did it didn't touch her, it sparked and crackled in the air as though she'd raised an energy shield around herself. Through his pain and disbelief Vitor realized she'd done just that. When he blinked his eyes to focus he saw her face, eyes closed and restful, as though in quiet meditation. Then the lightning dancing over her shield shot back out at those who produced it. Vitor was too weak to stand but he wrenched his body and arced his neck, Skull rolling on the hard ground until he could see one sit frozen in place, body set aglow, by jolts of his own dark sight energy. He heard a lightsaber and looked back at his grandmother. Jaina had her weapon in both hands. With amazing speed the old woman lifted it up and blocked the second Sith's blow. By then the first had recovered was on her too, and Vitor was certain not even Jaina Solo fell could withstand that. But he was wrong. He knew, intellectually that they'd once called his grandmother the Sword of the Jedi. That she'd been the Order's best duelist and most resolute fighter. That she'd slain a U.S. Henvong Warmaster three times her size and too many Sith to count. To him, though, she'd always been a tiny white-haired old woman, a stern but loving mentor whose further deeds were only legend. To move that fast, Jaina had to be drawn on the Force, using her own frail body as a marionette moved by the universe's invisible flow. She blocked one red lightsaber, then another, then went back to her enemy, slipping her blade beneath his attack and poking the blue tip of her own into his gut. Then she spun, bent at the waist and ducked under the second Sith strike. 
She popped up on her heels to come up right in front of her attacker and wedged her saber into his torso. Then she tore up, splitting through neck and head, and just as fast she withdrew, turned around, stopped an awkward wild strike by the remaining Sith. Then she cut low and horizontal, taking it right above the hips and slicing the body in two. When the fight was over, she immediately sagged against the wall, a puppet with cut strings. Fighting the pain that still sparked through his body, Vitor rolled onto his stomach, pressed hands against the pavement, and pushed himself to his knees. He crawled on them to his grandmother, who was now sinking to the ground, too weak to stand. Grandma, he shouted. Are you okay? Grandma. She he crawled close and put his hands on her shoulders Alar gasped behind him, Master, that was syncretable. The old woman's smile was slight, satisfied. Knew I still had it in me. Grandma. Vitor shouted again. He couldn't help himself. He cupped her face with one hand and shook her head lightly. I'll be fine, Jaina muttered, faint against the increasingly hard pounding of the rain. Just need to recharge. Vitor heard a new sound. He only recognized it for what it was when he looked back and saw Tree Sin collapsed on top of his father's body. The boy's body wrenched as he sobbed. Vitor knew there was nothing he could do for the younger apprentice, as much as he wished there was. Is it over? Alar said as she sat upright and groped for her lightsaber, still clutching her side wound with her other hand. As soon as she asked if Vitor felt a spike of dread, his grandmother's eyes, tried a second to go, popped open, and she said, No, we need to get back, as fast as we can. He started, are they? Yes. Jaina reached up and squeezed his hand. More Sith. They're after the others. Wrapped in the airtight silence of her cockpit, that tight familiar space, Marasia found it easy to touch the force and reach down toward the planet below. She felt what she'd expected and hoped not to find, panic, pain, death. Jedi fighting Imperial stormtroopers, both sides horrified that it had come to this but desperate to survive. She reached further. She needed to find her family. She found her mother-in-law first. Jaina Solo fell, was an old woman now, with a forced presence that was unmistakable but usually subdued. The Jaina that Mirajia felt was a flare of energy, unrestrained. She felt other presences mixing with it, dark, angry, intent, somehow very cold. In the years since becoming a Jedi, Marasia had heard so much about the Sith but she'd never felt one until now. She never felt it, but the dark side was unmistakable. Then the flare died down, and for a second Marasia was afraid Jaina had died. But the Sith presences she felt were gone, those two at least. The dark side still lingered down there. More Sith remained. Marasia clung to the fainter presence Jaina continued to project. For just a second, the two women's thoughts touched across the void. Marasia's hand, resting in the lap of her black flight suit, contracted involuntarily. She felt a warm, familiar grip that wasn't there. Vider. Then she felt his presence in the forest too, far away, but distinct. She felt Rhone too, somewhere else, possibly, and just as terrified, but still alive. There was no telling for how long. When she could no longer feel Vider's hand, she lifted her own and flicked on the calm. Our sons are in danger, Marasia said. Your mother too? It shouldn't have relieved him like it did. They're alive. You're sure? Yes. Other Jedi are dying, Davik. They're being killed. Stormtroopers. More. I felt Sith. The word made his chest tightened. He knew what Sith had done in Senex Juvex all those years ago. He'd half suspected the Sith were behind the Wild Raiders' attacks. Somehow, stupidly, he never expected them to be working with Veers. The man's evil had always been more obvious and more banal. He should have known better. Palpatine himself had been a Sith, and of course his kind wouldn't leave the Empire alone. Understood, Davek said. Stand by to launch. The second the flicked off the Com Korak, hovering at his shoulder this whole time, said, Admiral, are you sure about this? The Jedi are being killed down there. Davek waved a hand at the planet below. 
other citizens almost certainly are too. If we launch ties and landing craft, Veer's men will shoot them down. They'll try. We'll defend our people. Korak reached out, grabbed his shoulder. Sir, we're talking about Imperial soldiers selling each other. People are already dying. But this he struggled for words. They were at the brink of something no one could wrap his mind around. Do you want to live in the kind of empire Veers is making? He told Korak. This isn't just about my family. We have to choose what empire we want, right now. He realized the truth as he said it. For 88 years the empire had muddled on without his emperor, struggling for a direction with no one able to provide something absolute. His father had tried, he'd lived and died trying but the state he'd sought to make was still an empire with an emperor, a crippled and questioning shadow of what it had once been. There was only one way out, and only one answer to that question. He saw it clearly, felt revelations off a weight, and knew what had to be done. He marched over the comm station and asked for a broadcast to all ships. When the lieutenant gave him the signal, he raised his voice. All ships, prepare to launch TIE fighters and landing craft on my order. Captains, keep your shields at full and prepare targeting solutions on the nearest hostile ship. All TIE fighters are to be weapons free at launch. He knew the honorable, moral thing would be to not fire unless fired on, but waiting for the first shot could cause crucial seconds and crucial lives. The hostile TIE fighters were within firing range of Davek's fleet, but the bigger destroyers were a few minutes out of range. In that short time Davik could cripple or destroy all the hostile pickets before they did much damage. Then the comm officer frowned and said, Admiral, we're getting a hail from Tempest, top priority. If Rimmer wanted him now it had to be urgent. He told the other ships to stand by to attack then signaled the comm officer to chance Frex. When the new line clicked on he said, Farl, make it fast. For a drawn out second there was no reply. Then she spoke, voice heavy, and with her first sigh and breath he knew what she'd say. Admiral Fell, I cannot countenance this action. Farrell, we can't. Corinne Veers is the elected head of state. I won't fire on Imperials acting under orders from the legal government. Listen. Sir, I can't let you start a war. The war's already started. People are dying on Bastion. Jedi, not our soldiers. Both. And those Jedi are born Imperials. They're patriots. Damn it, we don't have time to argue. I'm sorry, sir. Her voice trembled just a little. If you launch assault teams, my ships will have no choice but to fire on yours. He looked at the holo. Ren Wars 3 destroyers were edging closer, out of the rear position he'd assigned them. In less than two minutes, they'd be within firing range of Davek's main line. Five minutes after that, Invincible would be ready to bring down everything it had. Davek snapped his fingers. The comm lieutenant killed the transmission, and Davek spun on Korak. Get to tactical. Tell all ships Tempest and his flankers are now hostile targets. His jaw dropped. But Renwer. Do it, Captain. Have Maelstrom and Conqueror turn around and prepare to engage her ships. Come. Get me a line to all ships except Renwar's. The lieutenant's hands shook as he worked the console. Korak hurried for the tactical station. Turning two destroyers to brawl with Renwar's three was all he'd be able to manage. Once Sentinel got close to the battle, their ships and their crews might be forfeit. Assuming they chose to fight for him. Assuming anyone did. He trusted Renwar implicitly because she was a void walker, the same reason Major Briggs had trusted his old sergeant. Malkin had clearly been loyal to Veers from the start. Renwar had just broken under the weight of her conscience. They were different but the same, friends turned enemies in a broken empire. There would be a lot more of that soon. He glanced out the viewport at the planet below, at the drift of clouds that obscured his mother, his sons, the city where he'd grown up. All loyal ships, this admiral fell, he began. You have your orders from a minute ago. Every word still stands. All fighters and landers away. All ships he took a breath, then stepped over the edge. Open fire and he watched from the front of the bridge as hundreds of ties and assault shuttles began to gush out toward the planet below. The deck shuddered softly beneath his feet as distant guns thundered to life. 
faraway explosion sparked the first fires of an empire at war with itself. Chapter 30 It was an arrangement none of them were comfortable with. Not the Jedi, not the Sith, not the Alliance soldiers who'd been dragged into a situation they hadn't expected and could never understand. The vermin troops and the Jedi didn't object to the agreement reached between Darth Avank and Grandmaster Lobaka, at least not when the Sith could hear. For the same reasons Darth Terrid waited until they had a small scrap of privacy to make his opinions known. For the agreement, they would take the Alliance troop transport in Jade Shadow, fly over to the ruins, and deploy there. The Erath shuttle the Sith had taken would remain on the field where it was. On the list of objectionable things about this mission that was low on the list, Darth Kika's intruder remained high above, orbiting at the exact opposite side of the planet as the Alliance warship and Sarissa Lore was aboard. The girl had objected to staying back at first, but Evang had insisted that one of the Jedi might recognize her as the late Princess of Hapes, at which point her use to the Sith would be ended. Evang had agreed to go with the team aboard Jade Shadow. He'd be the only Sith on that ship. Terran and Keegan would go aboard the Alliance transport along with the full platoon of armed soldiers and the Jedi Grandmaster. Darth Kikit was the most deadly fighter in the one Sith, but even with Terra's help he could never handle so much on his own. Before they split Terra drew Avank aside with an insistent nudge in the force. They stepped away from both ships and stood among waist-high grass. The sun beat hard on their black cloaks, drawing sweat to both their faces, and salt-tinted wind brought no relief. Say your piece quickly, Darth Terra. The Keshari didn't bother hiding his annoyance. We shouldn't show delay or dissension in front of the Jedi. You've put us in a position of weakness. We were in that position the moment the Alliance cruiser dropped over our heads. Before that, against Abeleth we'll never have the advantage. We cannot trust the Jedi. Of course not. They'll be expecting betrayal from us as well. By splitting us up you've made us even weaker. Avant gave a tired sigh the same sigh he made long ago when frustrated with his young chess apprentice. It made Terry feel condescended to. The Jedi will feel slightly more comfortable with us dividing. They'll think it won't be safe for us to turn on them and they'll be right. Darth Terry, you are to work with the Jedi and all things until we properly eliminated Abeleth. From what I've heard that's next to impossible. If Luke Skywalker and Lord Krake could barely end her what hope do we have? You've seen the old Duro's female. He thought a moment. Yes. She is carrying something on her back in a sealed, rectangular case. I am nearly certain her name is Ahali Sarak, and she is one of ten quest knights Luke Skywalker sent to find a force-imbued weapon he believed would kill Abella forever. If that is Sarak, then she's almost certainly brought her weapon. I've never heard of these quest knights. You're not privy to all the ones Sith know about the Jedi. Avang said flatly. She'll be with you aboard the troop transport. Keep close. Watch her. Protect her and keep her safe from Abella and her followers. Tell Kikit this also. If she's the only one who can kill Abella, why are y'all going on the other ship? Because my team will aim to scout and gather information rather than kill Abella. I know more about that abomination than either of you. Besides, I didn't want to put you together with your former friends. Terry scowled. Did the girl tell you? Sarissa told us nothing. I know who you were, Darth Terrett. I know who they are, both of them. Whatever accounts you have to settle, you can do it later. Right now you need to be separate and focused on Abeleth. Avank's reasons were all dispassionate and practical. Terry knew he'd made the right choices, but they still felt wrong. All his life he'd been told that being a Sith meant using the Force to break your chains, dominate your enemy and in doing so dominate the universe and wrest your will from it. What Evank was ordering them to do went against every tenet of his indoctrination. It was something the Jedi would do. I know what you're thinking, Darth Terrid, Evank warned. There will be time to settle with the Jedi after she is dead. A Beleth can be a weapon. We can use her against the Jedi. My people tried that once and lost everything. No, we work with the Jedi now. By all means, don't risk your life to save one of theirs. Let them and the vermin soldiers take the brunt of her attacks. But do not hurt or hinder them until Abeleth is eliminated. This is not just my order. 
This is the will of Darth Crate. Do you understand? I understand, he said, and I will obey. He didn't bother to hide his bitterness and anger in the Force. Avank wouldn't respect him if he did. As it was, the Keshari gave him a short nod, turned, and marched through the grass toward Jade's shadow. Neither Jodrum nor Jade were outside and visible. Tarot was glad for that and he knew Evank was right about one thing at least. He couldn't afford to be distracted by either of them now. He turned from that familiar ship and started toward the Alliance Troop Hauler, where a dozen armed soldiers and Darth Kikid were waiting. Jay's shadow and the larger Alliance transport flew in low over the ruined towers. Jade was back in the co-pilot seat and Kemmer at the helm. Flat fields of green tall grass, interspersed with copses of gnarled trees, passed beneath. The half-sunken towers grew large in front of them. They seemed to be molded out of some smooth silver material Jade didn't recognize. Unlike Durastil Place, there seemed to be no joints or wells that marked their construction, and despite the salty air, there was no sign of rust. Age was visible by the vines and mosses that climbed high from bases half-sunk into the swamp. Several structures were already partially submerged in the ocean that must have been gradually encroached on these ruins for centuries, maybe millennia. Even with the sights in front of them, it was hard not to glance behind them at the black-robed and armed Sith Lord standing beside Jodrum at the back of the cockpit. Darth Avank was watching the same sights they were, and as Kemmer brought them close to one slanting tower, he said, These designs are not racket. After a second's awkward silence, Jodrum asked, You sure about that? Very. The Sith have experience with racket and technology. You're going to have to tell us all about this experience once this is over. You can try to pry out secrets from my mind, Jedi, but I'll kill you before you succeed. You can't take everyone on this ship. Enough, Jay said firmly. Darth Avank snorted. I took no offense. Your husband is trying to assure himself we haven't broken him. Before Jodrum could argue or do something worse, Jade sent him a wordless message, not criffing now. He got it loud and clear and with effort forced his attention back out the viewport. So if it's not Rakata, who do you think made these things? Avank hummed thoughtfully. Do you not think it's strange, this world existing so far detached from other systems in the galaxy? There are other stray star clusters out there, Kimmer said. Yes. But a single star, alone, with only a single planet. That seems unlikely. But not impossible, said Jodrum. No, only very suspect. The same way as, for example, the Corellian system. You think Celestials made all this? Jade asked. Perhaps. What is a Celestial? A name we give for whoever engineered great stellar feats before any modern sentient race walked the stars. There was more to the Celestials than just that, Jade knew. According to what her father and grandfather has told her, Abeleth was a Celestial, or at least a mortal sentient who tried to acquire their powers. In doing so, she'd become as endless as them, but also a monster, mindlessly groping to reclaim the family she'd lost. If this world really was a Celestial construct, then it made all the more sense that Abeleth be here. After all her possessed mortal bodies had been destroyed 50 years ago, perhaps this was where her soul, or whatever one called her force-based essence, recovered after being beaten by Luke and Darth Krayt in whatever shadow realm they fought it. 50 years was a long time for humans, but to her it was nothing. For millennia she knew, Abeleth had been imprisoned by the Celestials in a jungle world hidden in the Mall. Something similar in this world may have caused her to rematerialize here. Kimmer said, Sensors are picking up more shuttles. Erath ships, Evank muttered as he leaned over Jay's shoulder for a better look. Jodrum shouldered him back, which the Sith Lord took with a condescending smile. Jay saw them too, though. While much of these ancient ruins were being swallowed by the sea, parts further back emerged from the grass and tangled brush. In addition to high towers, there were some large silver discs of the same material that sat atop the swamp. Blocky Erath's shuttle sat atop them, but no figure seemed to be moving under the sun. Life signs? asked Jodrum. The Nautilus checked her sensors. Nothing in the ships. Look, Jay pointed, you can see portals in the center of the discs. They probably lead underground. 
just where I wanted to go, Jadra muttered. I'm getting signals from one more ship further out, Kimmer said. Let me pull back and take a look. Jay's shadow rose higher above the ruins, and while Jay commanded Colonel Horn's troop carrier to tell him about what they found, Kimmer took them out further from the ocean, away from the ruins, and over more tangled swampland. Why would a shuttle land out here? Jodram asked. I don't know, but sensors are picking up familiar metallic compounds. Wait a minute, I think I found it. As Jade's shadow lowered over the swamp and Jade looked around, I don't see anything. There. Avank stabbed a finger forward. Jade followed it and saw the glint of metal peeking through a patch of gnarled trees. Then she noticed what seemed to be a straight slice through the forest, partially overtaken by new growth. I think this thing has been here for a little while, Jade muttered. I think so too, said Kimmer as she brought them low over what looked to be crashed ship. The design was the same as the Erath shuttles they'd just seen but this one appeared to have been here significantly longer. We should investigate, Avank said. We? Jodrum put a hand on his lightsaber. Yes, we. I'm going out and you can send however many Jedi you want to watch over my shoulder. He's right, Jay said, rising from her seat. We'll go. And put the ship into a hover right over the crash site so we can drop down. Reluctantly, Jodrum nodded assent. When they went down to Jay Shadow's cargo bay, he lowered the landing ramp. Hot air swirled up into the hold. Avank went down the ramp first, black cloak whipping behind him, and jumped casually off the edge. He fell ten meters straight down and landed boots first on the back of the ship. Jade and Jodrum went down after him and used the force to soften their fall. Behind them came the healer Ranto and Nek Cherik, a Shistaven wolfman whose temperament was less fierce than his looks. The Sith Lord didn't act bothered to be outnumbered four to one. He climbed the back of the ship, ignited his lightsaber, and cut a hole through the roof of the cockpit. He dropped down before the Jedi could reach him, but when Jade looked down through the hole he seemed to have clipped his lightsaber back onto his belt. While Ranto and Cherik stayed outside, Jade and Jodrum dropped into the hole to join Avank in the cramped space. The Keshari Sith had already moved over to the aft hole. The cockpit itself seemed empty. As a crash site, Jade had expected to find bodies inside, still strapped to their seats and long decayed. The air of the cockpit was hot and stale but there was no death reek. There was no death, no bodies anywhere. She followed Avank into the hole. A few stray belongings, unfamiliar for their Erath design, were strewn on benches. Avance walked over back to the airlock portal on the ship's port flank and checked it. They likely exited through here, he called. I'm sure they tried to make their way for the ruins after that. That's where they would have found Abelith. How long has this thing been here? Asked Jodrum as he stepped out of the cockpit. It's hard to tell, admitted Avonk. I suspect plants grow fast in this climate. I can't make a guess, said Jade. Say, two to three years. That's when Abella took over the Arath. Jodrum asked, so what do you think? This is some kind of scout ship. If that's the case, maybe they crashed here. Then sent a distress signal, called more of their people to pick them up. And this is how Abella reached the Arath homeworld, said Avonk. They say she took over two Arath bodies, one male one female. Do you they were from this ship? Those bodies must be very powerful in the force for her to sustain her so long, Avank said. Jay didn't like the Sith being so knowledgeable, even if they'd gotten his facts the same way the Jedi had. More likely she killed most of the crash survivors, possessed one body, then occupied it long enough to get to the Erath world, where she found better hosts. I imagine she crashed this ship herself as well. The how of Abelith's return was falling into awful place, but Jay didn't know how it would help them defeat her. Her Night Queen body must have been somewhere on this planet and Jade only hoped she wasn't strong enough to begin possessing more. For all they knew, she'd already begun. Okay, Jay said, let's get back to the ruins. If we're going to find her, it'll be there. It was easy enough to set Jade's shadow down on the same disc-shaped platform the Erath shuttles had taken. They commanded Colonel Horn's ship before setting down, and told him the rest, 
and the colonel had reported that they found another collection of landing discs and had just set down. Like Jade Shadow, they'd met no resistance. That didn't fill Jodron with confidence. Between Abeleth, Tarrant, and this infuriatingly confident Darth Vonk, there was nothing he liked about this mission. Even Jade, whose presence he'd normally treasure, shouldn't have been here. When they landed everyone but Aang Kimmer disembarked the shadow, Darth Avank was first down the landing ramp, though the fierce-looking Nev Cherik shadowed right behind him, lightsaber already drawn. As he and Jade left the ship, Jodrum sidled close and asked in a low voice, hoping the Sith wouldn't hear, what happened to Nat and Cole? Did you leave them on Fangrang? She shook her head. Asus, Alana will take care of them? That made Jodrum feel a tiny bit better. If their sons had to grow up without blood parents, at least Alana would make sure they grow up as good, strong Jedi Knights. Stop that, Jade warned through their force bond. Sorry, he muttered. I wish you'd stay back at the ship with Anne. Ranto says I'm fine. He didn't feel fine, not after what he'd gone through while imprisoned, but he felt good enough to fight if he had to. After all that had happened, there was no way he'd let Jade walk into these ruins in search of Abloff, especially with this suspiciously well-behaved Sith among them. At least Darth Terran was with the other group. It was the only mercy this mission allowed. We'll both get through this. Together, Jade whispered. Do you really believe that? She touched him through the force, with the bond they'd had since they were children. That bond had been the constant of both their lives seeing them through loss and gain. Through it he felt her sincerity, and liked so much that was hers it became his own without his even willing it. Darth Avank kept his lightsaber on his belt as he walked down the steps, into the ancient ruin. Nek Cherik was right behind him, blue saber burning, while Ellen Ranto turned on a glow lamp and cast it ahead. They didn't need it for long. The landing disks had been raised above the natural growth that was swallowing these ruins but beneath it the structures became tangled with high grass and brush. Gnarled vines and sheets of moss climbed the walls of what seemed to be a collection of tunnels joined by low arch gates. Daylight fell through half-collapsed roofs. They stepped lightly through the undergrowth and scattered rubble. Remember, we're having a look around, Jay told them. If we think she's close we call the Grand Master and he'll bring his team. Ranto checked his comlink. Signal still working. I'm in communication with my people as well, Darth Avank said without checking the comm. Communication with the forest then? Another brag. Does anyone feel anything? Jade asked as they started to spread out among the crumbled arches. I feel kind of terrified, muttered a young human knight. Crace, Jodrum recalled. What no? No Abeleth. What does she feel like? Asked Ranto. If she doesn't want you to feel her, you won't, Avank said. But when she does, Alana called in a tentacle of need, Jodrum supplied. You fought that thing when it possessed Master Sar, Cherik said. What did it feel like then? Nothing. Master Sar's body was like a puppet. A belleth was this, energy animating it, but it didn't feel like anything I can describe. Great, Cray sighed. So what do we do now? Where do we go? Should we split up into teams? Ranto suggested. Jay shook her head. We stay together for now. You don't have to be concerned on my account, Avang said. So civil. Jodron wanted to smack him. I wasn't concerned about you, Jay said coldly. Just a bellif. Avance nodded, as though her answer were satisfactory. Jodron tore his thoughts off the Sith and stayed close to his wife. Only Cherik and two more knights had their sabers alive. Avance was taking slow steps and he moved among the broken arches, head high, always looking in every direction. These ruins could go take days to cover on foot, even if they split up. Still, they pressed onward. After almost an hour of searching they found a place where the ground had crumbled away, leaving a great pit big enough to drop a TIE fighter into. Though sunlight fell into the pit, it didn't seem to illuminate anything inside. There was only darkness. I don't like the look of this, Crace muttered. Neither do I, said Jodrum. We need to keep investigating other places. Mark this spot for later. I'll call the other team and give them an update, Ranto suggested. 
Do that, Jay said. I think we should. Suddenly a chorus of screams filled the air. Bodies fell from the tunnel's crumbling rooftops, through the sunlit gaps, and into the ground strewn with rubble and brush. They popped to their feet almost instantly, warriors in dark bodysuits, with black hair like billowing clouds, and bulging multifaceted eyes like insects. They held curved sabers in either hand and, still screaming, flung themselves at the Jedi. Jodrum acted on instinct. When one lunged at his wife, he stepped between them and swung his saber in a horizontal sweep. It took the Erath through the midsection and dropped the body to the grass in two halves. As Jay's back bumped against his two more came at them from either side. They shifted, minds and bodies acting as one. Jodrum struck out with his saber again and sheared through both the Erath swords. It made no attempt to stop and kept coming, aiming the stumps of his blades for the Jedi's stomach. He shifted his blade and took the alien right through the chest. Only then did it go limp. Jade, for her part, didn't even ignite her saber. She trained with it, could use it as well as anyone else. But like their long dead master Mjalu, she did anything to avoid the blade. Her natural force power, the kind Jodrum could only envy, did the rest. She picked her attacker up with the strength of her mind and held him two meters in the air, under a shaft of sunlight. She plucked the swords from his hands and tossed them into the great black pit. Then she pushed the body up through the hole in the roof and hurled it out of sight. The other Jedi did their best to fight the Irad non-lethally, but in the end Jodrum had to kill another, Cherik two more, and Krace three. More Irath were disarmed, and the Jedi had to break their limbs to stop them from attacking. Darth Avank had no moral qualms. He cut the heads of three Irath with his lightsaber blasted two more with force lightning and hurled a third, screaming, into the deep pit. After a silence of almost five full seconds, they heard the crunch of impact far below. Is everyone okay? Jay called. One wounded, Ranto reported, hands over the blood-stained thigh of a Notorian knight struggling to stand. You Jedi are fools, Avank said, sneering down at one of the crippled Erath. You risk your own lives because you're afraid to kill vermin. None of our people were killed, Jay said, and any death is a tragedy. The tragedy is that you've willingly blinded yourself to the Force's true potential. Avank's red saber buzzed inches from the Aerith's frightened face. These creatures are just puppets for Abeleth. Don't kill it, Jodrum stepped forward, saber still ignited. You expect to learn something from it. These Erath are Abeleth's victims just like anyone else. Avank shrugged and shut off his saber. There's no reason for us to fight at the moment. Jodrum didn't shut off his. I'm so glad we agree. That's enough, Jay said. We need to keep moving. Ellen, call Lobaka. Tell him what happened. As the advice got out as Kanjay stepped up to the fallen Erath, she, Jodrum, and Avank all looked down at the prone form. Even with broken legs, it lashed out at the Force users hovering around it. It's not possessed by a Belleth, Jay said. Not like Master Sar was. I can't feel his mind. It's frantic, scared. But still a shred of his soul remains, Avank shook his head in disgust. It would be a mercy to kill it. You know I'm right. Once we get rid of a Belleth, we'll decide what can be done for her minions. Not now. The Sith gave her a look Jodrum didn't like. It was too approving. You take charge of a situation well. Yet I've been told you've shown no desire to lead the Jedi Order, like your father and grandfather. Why is that? Told by whom? Jodrum asked. His lightsaber still buzzed in his hand. Common knowledge? He shrugged. Why else would you have spent most of the past decade raising your sons in an irrelevant farming planet? Jay stared at him hard. We'll go over all that once we've taken care of Abeleth. And a lot of other things, too. I look forward to it. Avank glanced at Jodrum's blade. Is there really a need for that now? No, I guess not. Jodrum admitted and shut it off. His wife was correct, as usual. They needed to calm their heads and focus on the task ahead. If they did encounter Abeleth herself in these overgrown catacombs, they needed to face her as one. Even then, they'd probably struggle to hold her off until backup arrived with the Marath dagger. 
and to do that they'd have to rely not on Darth Avang Sith's savagery but on the immense, innate power Jade held within herself. Power you'll never know, a voice said. It said what he'd long known but it was not his own. He glanced at Jade. She didn't seem to have sent it, but it had spoken inside his mind the same way they'd spoken to each other's thoughts since their apprentice years. He opened his mouth to ask her about it, but the air filled with screams again. Four more Erath fanatics fell from the ceiling. One of them, maybe the one Jade had thrown away, didn't even have blades. That one lunged straight for Jodrum's wife, and he was there to intercept. He slowed it with the force, giving him enough time to ignite a saber. Then he swept low, cutting the creature's legs off at the knees. The others went right for Jade and Avonk. The Sith Lord fired lightning from one hand and ignited a saber. Jade, with a flash of reluctance, ignited her own violet weapon. One savage Erath charged her and she raised one hand to repel it. Then the crippled one at her feet reached out and grabbed both her legs. She kicked back, tried to kick free, but the creature held firm. Jodrum lurched for them but Avank was already there. He flicked his lightsaber in a vertical strike and cleaved the Erath through the chest. His dead hands released Jade instantly. She stumbled back, so close to the crumbling edge of the pit. Jodrum tried to grab her with the force but the Erath, already in midair, collided with her, feet against chest. The alien screamed but Jade didn't make a sound as she toppled back and fell into the black. Jodrum threw himself to the edge of the pit. By the time he fell on his rim he saw nothing besides black. He reached out to sense his wife and found her, but so distant he couldn't reach her. He heard the crunch of another body hitting the ground far below, but only once. Are you hurt? He sent down to his wife. I'm okay. Her mind touched his back. Stay there. I'll come help you. No. I'll be all right. I won't leave you. You're not. I can't sense Lobaka's team. They're not far from where I am. Just go, Jodrum. She is still alive, Darth Avank observed. Jodrum rolled onto his back and looked up at the Sith. Sense it? Can you? Yes, actually. In any case, I knew Luke Skywalker's granddaughter could never die so easily. He pushed himself to his feet. I'll be sure to relay the compliment once we find her. Jodrum, please, Jay spoke to his mind. Just keep going. I can't handle myself. You're communicating with your wife, Avang said. Do you know what we are saying? Jodrum scowled at him. No, but I can imagine. She says we're going ahead to search for Abelith. She'll meet up with Lobaka's team. That's exactly what I suppose. Great. Now shut up for a while. Avank inclined his head and gave a wordless smile. Jodrum wanted to snap his saber back on and use it right now, but Jay soothed his mind. Don't let him rattle you. Just keep your mind on a bellet and keep moving. I know, he sent back. I love you. I love you too. See you soon. Then their mental link, slightly strained across this distance, softly broke. Jodrum put a hand on his lightsaber hilt looked Avank in the eye, and said, let's get moving. Again, the Sith Lord nodded. Beneath the landing pads, the ruins became choked with vines and overgrowth. Going deeper, the sunlight was swallowed up, and they wandered through dark tunnels linked by low arches, always stretching out with the force and finding nothing. Despite that, Abelith was here. Darth Terran knew it. They all did. On Lobaka's orders, they split up the group into three. There were so many Alliance troopers with them there was more than enough manpower. Keekit went with one group, Terrid another. The Grand Master stayed with the Barabel, surely to fight against him if needed. It was a battle Terrid would have liked to see but instead he was sent into deeper, lower tunnels, accompanied mostly by a full squadron of Alliance commandos. They let him lead the way, rifles always raised, ready to shoot him before anything else. Terra didn't blame them and didn't give them cause to fire. He pressed ahead, using his saber to clear away the dried roots that increasingly broke through cracks in the arched tunnel ceiling. As they marched through the interminable ruins, Darth Avang's mind reached out to Terra's. He spoke not with a voice but with a cascade of images, impressions, 
The Chiss suddenly knew that Jade Skywalker had been separated from the rest of the search party from Jade Shadow. She was alone but going to meet Lobaka. With that knowledge came a warning, do not try to kill her. Tarrant had intended nothing of the kind. As they crawled deeper into these tunnels, his worries about his two former friends had been stripped away. A ballot was here, she was close, he knew it without knowing how, and that mattered more than Jade and Jodrum ever could. That Avank felt it necessary to remind him was both distracting and insulting. What's wrong, Sith? A voice said behind him. Terry turned and looked into the glare of the frontmost commando's rifle mounted glow lamp. Nothing's wrong, he said. Then keep moving, Sith. He had a harsh bark, but he was terrified. They all were. Those commandos were a beacon of fear. They'd been brought along on an ostensible mercy mission in uncharted space, only to be thrown as fodder to a horror their minds could never comprehend. Terran almost pitted the vermin. He began stepping forward again, using his lightsaber to cleave through more dried, tangled roots. The glow lamps shining past his shoulder revealed the path ahead more dark tunnels, and low arches. It seemed like they would go on forever. Then he heard the first scream. The soldiers with the glow lamps spun around and tear it followed their light. He saw nothing but the carved up tunnel through which they'd come but heard another scream, quickly silenced, and saw another soldier collapse. Then another scream, and another, and bodies fell like dominoes. Terrett hefted his lightsaber to defend but he still couldn't see what was attacking. A few soldiers, panicked, fired shots into the dark that only scorched the tunnel walls. Terry watched one body after another twist and fall. Head snapped hard to one side or another. Armor crunched as though under an invisible fist, collapsing inward and imploding bodies. One after another, they fell. And when the last trooper died, she was on him. Black hair trailed her like a cloak of night as she jumped over the bodies and landed feet first on his chest throwing him back. The Sith summoned his anger immediately and threw out a blaze of force lightning. The current jumped around Abelith's body, effortlessly deflected. A hand shot up and grabbed him by the throat. His body was lifted from his feet and thrust hard against the thick roots behind him. They stabbed into his back as he shifted the lightsaber in his free hand to cleave off her arm. Instead, her second hand shot up and held his lightsaber between them she lifted her head throwing back night black hair so he could see her face. The lightsaber's glow cast the rainbow sheen of her face in a sickly red. Where there should have been the bulbous multifaceted eyes common to Erath, there were only two scorched black pits. He stared at those black pits until he thought he saw, somehow, a twinkle of starlight at their very depths. His smile stretched wide, revealing rows of tiny black teeth. He waited for her hand to squeeze and crush his throat but it did not. Do it, which he choked. Do it. The smile stayed wide, her lips did not move. A whisper in his head, soft and feminine, said, it's been some time since I looked into a Sith's eyes. Strangely, despite his situation, he felt gratified. Staring at death, staring at the abyss of her scorched blind eyes, he realized why. All these years he'd never truly known what he was. Never a normal Chiss, never a normal Jedi. For so long he'd never known if he was really a Sith either, or if the things he'd been as a child had corrupted him from the way of true strength. But the Night Queen's eyes saw truth. He was a Sith in the end. He wished he could have been more. He should have been more. Always he stood apart, always trying to be more than those around him. To die here, pathetically throat crushed or soul sucked away by this abomination didn't fill him with fear or sadness. It made him rage. Do it, he rasped. Blue lightning sparked from his body, from his hands, his arms, shoulders, from the skin on his face and his sweat matted hair. His entire body began to burn with the dark side from within. Rage came so easily, the most natural emotion he'd ever known. You are not afraid. Abeleth asked. No, it was a statement. Lightning joined his body to hers. It sparked, danced, but did nothing to harm her. Suddenly she dropped him. He fell to the ground, his lightsaber rolled across the dirt in one hand went instinctively to his raw throat but rage did not go away. 
He tried to call the saber to his hand but it stayed exactly where it was, unresponsive. He looked up at the Night Queen and saw her standing over him, a single finger pointed at his saber, casually locking it in place. Do you want my body? Which? Terry gasped. Is that it? She bent close, as though examining his face with the scorched ruin of her eyes. There are more of your kind here. I can feel them. Sith and Jedi. Is that what you want? You want me to lead you to Jedi? She nodded, and that smile seemed to grow impossible whiter. Abelif was letting him shamelessly barter for his life, but it didn't feel that way. This was what he told Evank they should have done from the start. No more hiding, no more sulking. To a true Sith, everything was a tool. Even a Belith could be a weapon against the Jedi. But she knew how he felt. Of course she did. That's why she gave him this offer in the first place. She might yet kill him or take his body. Either of those things was likely. But if he could have a short span more of life and another chance to wreak some damage as a Sith should he could only take it. I'll get you your Jedi, Darth Terry growled and somehow that smile got even whiter. Jade wasn't sure how long she spent wandering through the dark. She'd brought a glow lamp along and used it to shine her way through the low, dark tunnels, many of which she had to creep through at a crouch. No more Erath appeared to stop her and she kept on reaching out with the Force, distantly sensing Jodrum with the rest of his team and also feeling Lobaka with his own group not far away. How far away she couldn't tell. But Lobaka was aware of her, and she did her best to trace the path through the convoluted darkness to his location. When the constricted tunnels finally fell away and she found a clear that took her by surprise. A single beam of light fell from the darkness above, through a cracked hole in the 10 meter high ceiling dome, though she knew they were far deep underground, and there was no way the sun should have been able to reach them. Light landed on a shallow pool. In this breezeless cavern, it was mirror still. As she stepped close she caught a whiff of some sulfur smell and wondered if this water might be seeped up from some spring deeper within the planet. When she reached the rim of the pool she noticed that, rather than a natural welling of water, it seemed to be set within an artificial basin. After wandering for so long on the hot surface of this planet she was 30, but she had no desire to drink. She crouched on her knees and leaned closer. She saw her own reflection with a faint silver sheen. She reached out, haltingly, to touch, but held her fingertips a few centimeters above the water. Instead, she withdrew her hand, grasped the rim firm, and bent a little closer. Softly, she blew on its surface. The water rippled, and so did her reflection. When the water stilled, her image had changed. She saw herself as an older woman, by perhaps 10 or 20 years, with light streaks in her hair and heavier lines in her face. She reached out and touched her cheek, but it felt smooth and familiar without the creases and jowls she was seeing. Then she understood. Her father had told her about a grotto and a shallow pool on Abeloth's home planet in the mall. On this world they found a place called the Pool of Knowledge, and in its waters Ben, Luke, and Jason Solo before them had seen visions of the future. This world was far, far from the mall. Her father had told her it was a jungle not a swamp, and he'd made no mention of colossal ruined towers of alien design. This was not the same planet, but it was similar. She suspected Darth Evank was right. Whoever the Celestials had been, this was another planet they deeply left their mark on. Whatever force power they'd used, echoes remained on both worlds. Likely that was why Abelith's essence, crippled after his fight with her grandfather and Darth Krait, had rematerialized here on the far side of the galaxy. She blew on the pool's surface again. Ripples played across it and suddenly her face was gone. Instead, Jade saw a vision of her cousin Alana. She wore a white gown and was seated on a white throne. Around her beings from dozens of special, gathered like old friends and looking admiringly at the red-haired woman. Jade looked more closely and saw two figures in Jedi robes on either side of Alana. One was Jodrum, the other was her. She looked her current age in this vision. So did Jodrum and Alana. It was, she realized, the same vision her grandfather had seen almost 50 years ago. The lost tribe of the Sith, Darth Avang's people, had seen this vision too, 
and launched a hunt for their so-called Jedi Queen that had nearly claimed Alana's life. Jade understood this vision wasn't meant to be literal. There was no real throne. It was a metaphor for the state of the galaxy. She'd heard Alana ponder whether this vision, the one her father Jason had done hideous things and died to bring about was fulfilled when she'd taken her leadership position in the Galactic Alliance. Jade wanted to think so, it meant that, even after Alana had stepped down after 12 years on the job, the peace she preserved had been protected. This was still a galaxy at peace, and from this vision before her, Jade and Jodrum were its protectors. A familiar mind touched hers. She stayed where she was, kneeling over the pool, gazing at this vision of a galaxy, at peace, and reached back to touch it. She told Lobaka to hasten to her. She told him there was something he needed to see. As they went deeper into those dark places beneath the surface of the planet, whispers kept playing in Jodrum's mind, so faint he could barely make out their message. He was sure he was the only one hearing them, which was bad enough. But if it wasn't Jade speaking to him like she usually did, there was only one option, and that was worst of all. Run, Jedi, a bell of whispered to him sometimes. Fear me, she said at others. Mostly she said nothing at all. They continued pressing into the dark to the sound of their own footsteps, and lightsabers cutting their way through the tangle of roots and growths that clogged these tunnels. Darth Avank led the way never showing hesitation when they came to a branch in the path. None of them could sense a bell at the head, but the Sith insisted he felt something, very faint and distant, but still present. Jodrum didn't want to trust him, but as the others would feel nothing at all, they let him guide them deeper down. Perhaps the Sith was better attuned to Abeloth's dark side presence. Perhaps he was after something else, though Jodrum had no idea what as the only two Sith on the planet were securely watched by Lobaka's team of Jedi, and he knew he'd have felt it in the Force as something major had happened to them. As Avank announced he saw what looked like an open space ahead, Abeloth whispered, louder than before, Turn, and run, Jedi. You know you desire it. Shut the cark up, he whispered aloud. Nek Cherik, right ahead of him, stopped and looked back. Jodrum shook his head, urging the Shistivan and Jedi on. You are weak, Abeleth continued in his mind. You will never be as strong as your wife. You will never be a Skywalker. You will always fail those you love. It took all Jodrum's strength not to bark aloud again. Somehow she knew exactly how to hurt him. She touched on his deepest insecurities, the ones he tried to hide even from Jade all these years. If a Skywalker couldn't kill me, what do you think you can do? She said. You are nothing. You will live and die having done nothing but add your weak admixture to the Skywalker blood. Be satisfied with that and go. She was right. His family had never produced great Jedi. His father, to be sure, was a loyal one, but never the most powerful. His grandmother had fumbled her way to knighthood late in life. His aunt had failed to become one at all. He weakened the Skywalker line, not strengthened it, and he had no chance of killing Abeleth himself. But because she was telling him this, he couldn't turn back. Giving in, doing what Abeleth wanted of him, would be the worst failure of all. Darth Avank led them into a circular chamber with a low dome ceiling. Even before Jodrum slipped inside he heard hacking coughs from the Jedi head. When the stench of death assaulted his nostrils he pressed his nose into his sleeve and tried to stifle it. The chamber was strewn with skeletons, humanoid, probably Erath. They were mostly piled around the edges, leaving the center floor clean, but there must have been two dozen of them. A shaft of sunlight fell through a hole at the top of the dome, leaving a white circle in the middle while soft ambient light displayed the tattered clothing and scraps of decaying flesh that clung to white bone. What is this? Alan Ranto said, voice muffled by his palm. The crew from the crash shuttle, possibly, Avank looked closer. His face was scrunched for the stench, but unlike the Jedi, he didn't deign to cover it. Though these look like fresher kills. Is this what you felt in the Force? asked Jodrum. For once, Avank looked unsure of what to say, and Jodrum knew something was really wrong. His hand went to his lightsaber, too late. Something flew out of the dark tunnel mouth on the far side of the chamber, 
a blur of black that landed right in front of Ranto. As it did a red lightsaber blaze to life, and Jodrum's first thought was Sith. Then, as the light beamed spear through the stunned Avas's chest, Jodrum understood. As the Jedi's body collapsed, a Belleth spun around, a whirl of red and black, and cut through a second Jedi before she had the chance to fumble her lightsaber to life. Jodrum just couldn't understand where she got in a saber of her own. Darth Avanx seemed as shocked as the Jedi. He flipped his lightsaber on but danced away from Abeleth, keeping his back face in the chamber wall. Abeleth skipped back from the dead body into the light beam in the center of the room. She stopped just long enough for Jodrum to take in this form. He saw the long black curtain of her hair, the sickly pallor of her face, the wide mouth filed with sharp teeth, and the gouged out scorched black holes where her eyes should have been. The Queen of Night attacked. Neck Cherik, a little better prepared than the others, caught the first few lightning strikes of her saber. Krace ran forward to take her from the side, but she lashed out with an arm. Ghostly tentacles stretched out from her finger and stabbed the young man through the chest, tearing bloody whole. Cherik snarled, bearing sharp canines, and lunged. He landed right on her, spearing his blade through her chest, but her own red saber cut through him. Both bodies sprawled on the ground. She kicked Cherik aside and sprung up as though she'd taken no wounds at all. It was like Master Sar all over again. They'd have to cleave apart this whole body to kill her. In his panic, Jodrum fumbled to call out with the force to Jade, to Lobaka, to anyone, and ask them to help. They were all far away except one presence, half familiar, one he couldn't think to name, not when Abeleth was bearing down on him. He deflected her first attack, ducked, and rolled out of the way. Cherik, mortally wounded, struggled to his knees and hurled his saber at Abeloth. She pivoted to block its will of light, but the weapon jerked from his coursement flight and flew into Darth Avanx's open palm. Jodrum had his opening. He slashed out, cutting Abeloth across the waist, but not deeply enough to sever torso from hips. Her body lurched and stumbled. Severed muscles and tendons caused her to call of the force to stay upright. Avank had his opening and charged. His sabers, blue and red, came down on Abeleth in a flurry. Even wounded her body moved like lightning, red sword flashing back and forth to block both attacks. At the same time Jodrum tried to attack again, but an invisible hand picked him up and threw him hard against the far wall. Pain shot from his back through the rest of his body. He struggled to stand. It was Darth Avank versus Abeleth now. One on one, all the other Jedi were dead. Jodrum pushed back his pain, grabbed his saber, and lurched to join the fight. Avank moved with speed and grace, even though Abeleth kept blocking one blade, he slipped the other beneath her defenses. First, he jabbed her in the upper torso, next, he sliced through her upper leg, severing muscle, buckling her body beneath his continued two saber attacks. Jodrum found his opening. He jumped in from the side and with one careful sweep severed Abeloth's saber-bearing arm at the wrist. The hand and his weapon went tumbling away. His contribution to the fight took Avank by surprise. Before Jodrum could make another thrust as Abeloth's exposed body a ghostly tentacle grabbed him by the throat and hurled him again. This time he landed head first against the wall. He dropped to into a heap of skeletons but barely felt it. Consciousness wavered. The world darkened. He drew on the force to stay awake but struggled to push himself out of the bones. The world around him was blurry, but he could make out two dark forms, Avank wielding two sabers, Abeleth with none. The Sith swept with both blades at once but Abeleth nimbly dodged. As Avank raised high for another dual strike another saber, discarded on the floor, flashed to life. Jodrum tried to open his mouth, tried to warn the Sith, but there was no time. A red disc of light spun through the air, taking both Avank's arms off and just barely missing his head. His arms and sabers tumbled to the ground. Avank stared at the stubs of his arms in shock. Then two ghostly tentacles grabbed him, lifted him high, and threw him hard against the ceiling. Jodrum heard one hard crunch, then another as the Sith Lord's body hit the ground. The Queen of Night wavered on her feet for a moment. Then, slowly, awkwardly, she turned and began lurching toward Jodrum. He did everything he could to push himself upright, 
to get to his feet, to call a weapon, but his entire body cried out in pain, and the force was the only thing keeping him from passing out. You hurt me, Abella said in his mind, clear and loud, no more whisper. You did better than I thought you would. He opened his mouth for some reply, but his strength gave out. He pitched forward on his knees, barely catching the fall with palms scraping over the rough floor. You are still weak. You understand that, don't you? With effort, he lifted his head. She looked over him, obscuring all light. But you will serve a purpose. My purpose? Rejoice, Jedi. Worship me. You will serve me far better than you could ever serve the Jedi. Her ghostly tentacles wrapped around him and stood him upright, almost gently. Through his pain and confusion, realization dawned. The smile on her eyeless face spread wider. Rejoice, she said, and her wide mouth moved with the words. You will live forever as part of me. Jade was still crouched over the pool of knowledge, waiting for Lobaka to find her, when she felt disquiet. Jedi were dying. She didn't know who or how, but somewhere, they were dying. She reached out to Jodrum and tried to speak to his mind, but she found only frenzied panic. She jumped to her feet and grabbed her saber, but realized there was no place to run to, no way of knowing where to go. So she stood there, helpless and agonized, waiting for the pain of Jodrum's death, dreading even more than that whatever agony it would inflict on her two sons, not just growing as a Jedi, small cold whose talents would be ruined before they'd had a chance to blossom. Her greatest fear as a mother was about to become real. And then it was over. The fighting and dying was done. She hadn't felt anything from Jodrum. She reached out to him now and felt nothing. Nothing at all. She didn't understand. She'd always been able to feel Jodrum since they trained together as children. She'd held certain all her life she'd feel his death as awfully and vividly as she'd felt her mother's. If a bellet had killed him, she'd have surely known. Flickering light caught her eyes, and she looked down at the pool. Though she hadn't blown on it, ripples ran across the water, disrupting the image of Alana on the throne of balance. Before the water settled, a series of images flashed before her. She saw Alana now in dark robes, surrounded by hooded acolytes, her face darkened by a savage gleam unnatural on her cousin. Then she saw the throne crack down the middle, the chamber empty except for a single man with messy blonde hair wearing a battered bronze chestplate and black trousers. He was sprawled lazily across the broken throne and wore a smug grin. She'd never seen him before, but she felt, impossibly, like she knew him. Then the water settled. The image resolved into one of an intact throne and more hooded acolytes. Seated on it was a man in rough, organic looking armor and a mask that covered his face save a tattooed lower jaw. When I was placid blue, the other red gold of a Sith. Instead of Jade and Jodrum guarding the throne, there were beings she didn't recognize. A Twi'lek woman whose body was covered in savage black and red tribal markings. An alien male with chalk white skin and gold eyes. A humanoid female with red skin and black hair pull up in a top knot. They were circled around the dark man, his loyal protectors. She wanted the image to turn back to show Alana and White ruling over a galaxy at peace, but the vision refused to change. She didn't understand anything except one fact. Before her eyes, the fate of the galaxy had changed forever. 